Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals uh, for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Mr. President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question is that committees be authorised to meet during the sittings of the Senate today. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, customs amendment, India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022 and four related bills, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. I was really hoping the clerk would read all of those bills uh, out rather than uh, the take the easy way out, which is so unusual for, uh, for the clerk. I'm sure there's something terribly unparliamentary about me reflecting upon the clerk, Deputy President. Um, well, seriously, it is with enormous pleasure that, uh, that I rise, Deputy President, to speak on these bills and to indicate uh, the opposition's strong and passionate support for these bills. Uh, these bills represent uh, the bookend, if you like, uh, on the coalition's strong, aggressive and effective expansion of Australia's trade ties around the world. That our period in government was marked by success from its earliest days to its latest days in expanding the network of trade agreements that Australia has with the world, and in doing so, creating a stronger, more open economy, one where the wealth of Australia, the record low unemployment Australia was enjoying when we left office, and the opportunities for Australians were clearly enhanced by the trade network that we built. In relation to these bills that touch on the Australia-UK trade agreement and the India-Australia Economic Cooperation Agreement, I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Dan Tehan uh, as Minister for Trade uh, in the final years of our time in government, who concluded negotiations for these, bill, for these agreements. Uh, they're agreements that I have uh, some personal satisfaction in seeing come to the fore as well, Deputy President, having launched the negotiations for the Australia-UK FTA uh, and overseen those uh, through many of the negotiating rounds, as indeed uh, I pursued in many different forums, discussions, options for how we may pursue agreement with India and was delighted to see Dan able to execute uh, one of those. As I said, these are the bookend of a very adventurous and comprehensive range of agreements. Uh, the agreements struck uh, with the North Asian major economies, Japan, the Republic of Korea, uh, and China in the early days of the coalition government. Uh, the agreements then struck uh, with Indonesia, Peru, Hong Kong, as well as regional agreements, PESA Plus, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement and the Comprehensive and, and Progressive 
uh, agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. All of these creating a far stronger and more vibrant network of agreements to enable Australian businesses to succeed in the world. These bills together implement Australia's tariff obligations in particular. And whilst free trade agreements in the modern era encompass many different aspects, it is essential to remember that the core test of whether a trade agreement is a good trade agreement is whether or not it liberalises the movement of goods and services, investment and people. Yeah. Goods and services flows being the absolute core element. And as the new government seeks to conclude the negotiations on the Australia-European Union trade agreement, I underscore that point, that the liberalisation of trade and movement in goods and services, as well as investment in peoples, is the core test for success of that agreement. We wish the government well in concluding that agreement, and we want to make sure that it's an agreement uh, that is ambitious in all of those elements. Together, the agreements that, uh, that will uh, be enabled by this legislation put more Australian exports in front of some one and a half billion consumers around the world, across India and the United Kingdom, and increase Australian exports covered by FTAs to more than 80 per cent. Let me just pause on that point, Deputy President. When the coalition came to office in 2013, 27 per cent of Australia's exports enjoyed preferential market access around the world under free trade agreements. Once these agreements come into place, more than 80 per cent of Australia's exports to the world will enjoy preferential access. That is a seismic shift in relation to the advantage Australia has trading with international partners relative to other countries. These agreements demonstrate the ambition and capacity that we had to make a marked change. It was set out in our 2013 election policy and delivered upon successively by government throughout our term in office. Australia's FTA with the United Kingdom, as negotiated and legislated here, is the most comprehensive and ambitious free trade agreement that Australia has with any nation other than New Zealand. On entry into force, tariffs on over 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to the UK will be eliminated, valued at around $9.2 billion. Under the agreement, Australia will also eliminate almost all tariffs on goods originating from the UK, with a small number set to see tariff elimination over five years. Australia's interim trade agreement with India strengthens our economic engagement with what is recognised as the world's fastest growing economy, the greatest opportunity for Australia to diversify our trade network. Our aim in negotiating this agreement is to lift India into Australia's top three export markets by 2025. Deputy President, there are five bills before us, two covering the preferential tariff obligations under the trade agreement with the UK and three covering our preferential tariff obligations under the India agreement and a side letter relating to questions of double taxation. These bills, once passed, execute the legislative coverage required for Australia to advance ratification. What we see are changes that, uh, that provide in relation to the Australia-UK FTA uh, for rule of origin thresholds, enabling the application of agreed preferential tariff rates to customs duties. Uh, the bill implements the negotiated outcomes on rules of origin outlined in Chapter 4 and Annexes 4A and 4B of the UK FTA. The rules of origin specify which goods are eligible for preferential tariff treatment. Uh, this includes goods that are wholly obtained or produced in the UK uh, or in the UK and Australia enabling integrated supply chains and value chains across our markets. Product-specific rules outlined in Annex 4B of the agreement determine the circumstances in which goods imported from the UK, which have components or inputs from a third party, are still eligible. The amendments under Part 1 define UK originating goods and will introduce a new Division 1P in the Customs Act to cover for the origin arrangements. The bill seeks to eliminate almost all tariffs on UK goods on entry into force. Only a small number of items will be phased out over five years. 
It ensures that an excise equivalent rate of customs duty applies to imports as is convention of alcohol, tobacco and petroleum to ensure parity with products produced domestically. In response to the UK's application of a safeguard tariff on Australian steel, the bill also introduces a safeguard provision that has the effect of maintaining the customs duty rate that applied prior to the commencement of the agreement, while ever the UK has a comparable safeguard tariff rate in place on any Australian good. The UK's trade agreement with Australia was the very first trade agreement it reached following its exit from the European Union. The significance and scale of it should not be underestimated. We welcome the fact it's had wide applause from a range of industry groups, the National Farmers Federation, Seafood Industry Australia, Australian Meat Industry Council, Sheep Producers Australia, Austral Alcohol Beverages Australia, the Law Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Business Council, the Group of Eight Universities, amongst many others. We, of course, already enjoy a special and strong relationship with the United Kingdom, with deep-rooted business and people-to-people -people connections and very, very strong investment ties. It will only make Australian exports to the UK cheaper once this trade agreement comes into force, creating yet more opportunities for businesses, for workers, for young people. It delivers a wide range of other trade and market access opportunities for exporters. Farmers and producers will have improved access to more than 65 million UK consumers, consumers who value safe, sustainably produced food and beverages with the strong provenance that Australia offers. Around $43 million in customs duties will be removed from Australian wine when the agreement enters into force. Australian wine is already uh, amongst the most consumed in the UK. Uh, from recollection, Deputy President, I think one in every five glasses consumed in the UK is a drop of fine Australian wine, uh, and this will only serve to make it more competitive and more profitable for Australian winemakers. For beef, the tariff-free quota of 35,000 tonnes at entry into force grows to 110,000 tonnes. For sheep meat, the tariff-free quota of 25,000 tonnes grows to 75,000 tonnes per annum. For sugar, the tariff-free quota of 80,000 tonnes grows to 220,000 tonnes. Australian households and businesses will also save an estimated $200 million a year as tariffs on UK goods are almost universally eliminated on entry into force. Professionals from Australia will have the same access to the UK's jobs market as their European competitors, um, uh, providing Australian job seekers uh, with fantastic opportunity to diversify their experience. Young Australians will have more time to travel to the UK for a working holiday and be able to stay longer, with eligibility to participate in working holiday opportunities raised from 30 to 35 years of age. Australian businesses will have the guaranteed right to bid for a greater variety of UK government contracts in a procurement market worth an estimated half a trillion dollars. And UK businesses will be more encouraged to invest in Australia thanks to best practice investment rules, including encouraged to set up regional headquarters in Australia to leverage that expansive network of free trade agreements that I spoke about at the beginning. Under the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, we again see significant benefits there. Uh, of course, important steps in relation to the treatment of income uh, through uh, the definition of royalties uh, under the Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement uh, and how the amendments to that will bring the tax treatment of Indian residents into line with Australia's approach. Uh, but this is also a boundless opportunity in terms of India. Uh, in 2020, uh, our, uh, which indeed uh, I led the last major trade delegation uh, to India, uh, our two-way trade was valued at $24.3 billion, Australia's seventh largest trading partner at that time. The aspirations of this agreement will seek to take that even further. Tariffs will be eliminated on more than 85 per cent of Australian goods exports to India, uh, rising to almost 91 per cent over 10 years. Australian households and businesses will also benefit with 96 per cent of Indian goods imports entering Australia duty-free on entry into force. Sheep meat tariffs of 30 per cent will be eliminated on entry into force, providing a boost for Australian exports that already command nearly 20 per cent of India's sheep meat market. Wool will have the current 2.5 per cent tariff eliminated on entry into force. Tariffs on Australian wine will be reduced. Tariffs of up to 30 per cent 
on products such as avocados, onions, broad kidney and adzuki beans, cherries, shelled pistachios, macadamias, blueberries, raspberries, you name it, will be eliminated over seven years. And tariffs on almonds, a key export item into India, along with lentils, oranges, mandarins, pears and others, uh, will also be reduced. The resources sector will benefit from the elimination of tariffs on entry into force for coal, alumina, metallic ores, including manganese, copper and nickel, and critical minerals. LNG tariffs will be bound at 0 per cent on entry into force, and tariffs on pharmaceutical products and certain medical devices will also be eliminated. Australian service suppliers in 31 sectors and subsectors uh, will be guaranteed to receive the best treatment accorded by India uh, to any future free trade agreement partner, including across higher education, business services, uh, tourism, travel and a range of other sectors. There will be new access for young Indians to participate in working holidays in Australia, helping to strengthen our tourism market as well. This interim deal, likewise, has been welcomed by a range of industry sectors from the NFF, Australian Grape and Wine, Wool Producers, Minerals Council, Australian Pear and Apple Limited, Aki and many others. Deputy President, passage of these bills will enable Australian officials to move swiftly uh, towards ensuring full implementation of these agreements. Uh, we urge the government to do all possible in their diplomatic efforts to ensure that the United Kingdom and India move as expeditiously as possible to equally meet their processes required to achieve entry into force. And because the sooner these agreements take effect, the sooner the benefits are realised for Australian businesses and businesses in the United Kingdom and India. The sooner that occurs, uh, the earlier all of the gains that accrue over the seven to ten year period of implementation uh, will accrue to businesses in Australia, the UK and India. So we urge the government to make sure in all of their dialogue it is a priority to get these agreements done quickly. It's why we support their passage through the parliament promptly uh, and look forward to seeing this final legacy item of the coalition's trade policy deliver great benefits for Australia into the future. Senator Cox. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the five bills relating to both the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement and the Australian-UK Free Trade Agreement. Both of these agreements mark significant milestones in Australia's trade landscape. India has a unique approach to trade, one formed following decades of forced trade and colonial rule. As a First Nations woman whose land was colonised and subjected to forced rules and policies, I sympathise with this on a personal level, and I understand why India is keen to protect its own after so many years of exploitation. On the other hand, the UK is finding its feet in trade, particularly post-Brexit. A major highlight of both of these agreements is a lack of investor state dispute settlement clauses, or ISDS as it's called. These clauses allow companies to sue governments for changing their regulatory frameworks that are more often than not in the public interest to recoup their losses they claim occurred because of these changes. To put it in context, the only time such clause has been used against Australia is by a big tobacco company, Philip Morris, which attempted to uh, sue the Australian government following the implementation of our plain packaging laws. The Greens welcome this change of the government's policy regarding ISDS uh, clauses and look forward to the continuation of this policy in sub sub substantive uh, agreements and the removal of existing ISDS clauses. These trade agreements will bring benefits, but there are significant issues with both agreements that must be highlighted. Firstly, both agreements are bilateral. There is a growing trend of bilateral trade agreements as opposed to plurilateral agreements leading to an increasingly fragmented trade landscape. Big business may be able to navigate the complexities and the growing number of trade agreements, but many small and medium enterprises really struggle at doing so and most often miss out on the benefits that these trade agreements bring. This means that big business and industry are often the ones benefiting from the international trade agreements. In the Indian interim agreement, notably, they do not contain provisions relating to labour rights, environmental standards or, in fact, gender equality. 
The UK trade uh, agreement does not include provisions, but are weak and less enforceable than other chapters. And in terms of gender equality provisions, they remain merely aspirational. There are statements from all parties addressing forced labour and modern slavery, but in fact no real commitments. This agreement reaffirms mutual commitment to climate action and in fact our Paris Agreement, but there are no specific emissions reduction targets mentioned in these agreements. The Greens are concerned about the removal of market testing requirements in the UK agreement that ensure temporary workers are filling genuine labour market shortages. This isn't the only issue relating to workers in the UK agreement, and this agreement removes working holiday visa requirements, which have previously required workers to undertake the 88 days of farm work to, in fact, instead extend their visas. Rural communities often rely on this work to fill seasonal labour shortages. The removal of this provision has the potential to make an already stressed workforce worse. Temporary workers are some of the most vulnerable to exploitation, and the Greens want to acknowledge this. But the solution is not to stop people doing regional work incentives altogether. Workers' rights should be strengthened with greater enforcement provisions. Often the, money that goes, uh, often the money that workers earn during their farm stay is spent in local communities, small regional communities that have been hit, hard hit by COVID. Some members of the crossbench in the other place have raised this, which I also want to acknowledge here today. In the India Agreement, the lack of labour rights is a significant concern. The Greens recognise the benefits Australia has reaped from contributions made by temporary migrant workers. However, as I stated before, the temporary migrant worker visa system leaves workers extremely vulnerable to job insecurity and weaker workplace protections. These must be addressed in a comprehensive agreement. Neither of these agreements contain an Indigenous inclusion chapter. And in fact, there is no trade agreement in Australia that they have signed to date that contains an Indigenous inclusion chapter. An Indigenous inclusion chapter would enable First Nations businesses to access the benefits of these trade agreements. This is a choice made by our government to exclude First Nations people, where our friends across the ditch in New Zealand have negotiated multiple treaties with inclusion chapters. So we know it's possible to achieve this with our trade partners, if only our government would ask. First Nations businesses are growing rapidly and are looking for new market opportunities. So it's in fact a no-brainer to include them in these trade agreements. And this would be a game changer for First Nations businesses all over this country. Indigenous inclusion chapters have the potential to unlock significant capital, create jobs and offer careers on country. The Indigenous Network for Investment, Trade and Exports have been campaigning on this issue for some time and I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge their work in this space, especially Darren Godwell. As they have stated, an inclusion trade clause or ITC in the free trade agreement would take steps to ensure all segments of society can access opportunities that flow from a free trade agreement. First Nations businesses have consistently been left out of trade agreements for the last 230 years to our detriment. The government must take a proactive approach to righting this wrong and ensuring that First Nations businesses have the same access and support for trade agreements. The UK agree agreement does, does contain some provisions for First Nations businesses, which is a significant outcome. This includes reciprocal arrangements which will ensure royalties are paid to Australian artists where their work is resold in the UK, which of which is the highest proportion of eligible resales occurring among Indigenous artists wholesalers. The UK also commits to recognising the importance of genetic resources, traditional knowledge and cultural expression. This includes a commitment for both parties to make efforts to work with the World Intellectual Property Organisation with respect to the protection of traditional knowledge. The Greens would like to note 
that while these are all welcome additions, most of these provisions are limited to art only. First Nations people have far more to contribute to the GDP of Australia than just art. The, strong, the Greens strongly believe that any trade agreement that Australia agrees to participate in must contain enforceable and comprehensive provisions to protect economic, social and environmental rights, both within Australia but also within those countries we trade with, as well as supporting First Nations businesses who have consistently been left out of our trade agreements. Finally, the Greens continue to express deep concern about the lack of transparency from public scrutiny involved with the current procedure for making trade agreements. Negotiations are secretive and the text of agreements is only released after it has been signed, with in fact no opportunity for trade unions and the broader civil society to have genuine input into these negotiations. Ultimately, it was ratified with very little public scrutiny. The Greens are very disappointed that the text of the agreements was not released to the community before it was finalised because our communities in Australia in fact deserve better. It is essential that proposed agreements be tabled in Parliament and open for wider public consultation prior to their signing in order to ensure consistency with domestic democratic policy making principles and practice. We maintain that the social, environmental and economic impacts of trade agreements must be independently examined and presented to the parliament prior to the commencement of these negotiations and also as part of the final agreement. One of the recommendations of the J. Scott report into this agreement was that the Australian government implements the recommendations of report 193. It says that strengthening the trade agreement and treaty making processes in Australia, particularly in relation to greater consultation and transparency, and in providing independent modelling and an analysis of trade agreements. The Greens wish to strongly echo this and call on the government to amend its treaty making process to allow for greater transparency and consultation to ensure that. It does not just benefit specific sectors of our economy, but in fact has input, again, from civil society, unions, human rights groups, First Nations groups, environmental groups that are genuinely taken into account and reflected within our trade agreements. This government must ensure that trade agreements are inclusive and, in fact, not exclusive. They must benefit many, not just a few, and the Greens will continue to fight for this. The Greens have circulated a second reading amendment which relates to the three bills implementing the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. This amendment is co-sponsored by my colleague Senator Steele John and seeks to highlight the human rights abuses in India and the recommendations made by the United Nations Human Rights Council's Universal Periodic uh, Preview. I move the amendment in my name on sheet 1747 and continue to advocate that human rights are non-negotiable and in negotiating uh, uh, trade agreements, Australia has a responsibility to ensure that human rights are upheld by all parties that we may trade with. We hope that this is a, a common sense statement that the Senate agrees with and that all members of this place will vote to show their support for human rights and for the Australian government to ensure those we trade with also uphold these. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks very much. I am um, very pleased to be able to rise to speak on the enabling legislation for these two agreements. And indeed, the Albanese government is pursuing an ambitious and purposeful approach uh, to trade policy and a trade liberalisation. Uh, Minister Farrell, in particular, has worked very hard to secure passage of both the India and the United Kingdom agreements through the parliamentary processes to enable entry into force as soon as possible. And this enabling legislation being worked through today is the final part of that picture. Uh, and I have to say I have two responses really to listening to Shadow Minister Birmingham's outline of the coalition's response to, to the bill. Firstly, of course, I'm pleased to hear that the opposition will be voting for the bill. 
uh, that's a good thing. It would be pretty inconsistent if they didn't. But mostly I'm overwhelmed by the hypocrisy of the position. In here talking about bipartisanship on trade policy, but their commitment to bipartisanship on trade policy is paper thin. I was astonished to read an article by Rosie Lewis in The Australian on September the 16th, 2022, uh, that entitled Labor Dragging Its Feet on Trade Deals, says Dan Tian. Uh, the, the previous government signed off on these agreements with no plan to get them through the parliament, pulled up stumps, pulled up stumps, and then started complaining about the slowness of the parliamentary process. Well, I suppose that's okay. I suppose that's politics business as usual for this lot. But what really matters is when they do it in a way that undermines the national interest. In that article, in that article, in India, in India, the former trade minister, Dan Tian, said it says the coalition has accused the Albanese government of dragging its feet on ratifying free trade agreements with Britain and India. Goes on to say opposition immigration spokesman Dan Tian, a former trade minister who recently returned from the Australian India leadership dialogue in New Delhi, said no one there could understand why Australia had not implemented the agreement. No plan to work this through the parliament. No urgency from the previous government uh, getting these agreements through the parliament, but then, then wants to whinge in New Delhi and undermine the confidence of our partners in whether or not the deal is going to get done. What a disgrace. What a disgrace. Order, he McGrath. went on to say the Australia-India Economic Cooperation Agreement is signed and ready to go. The only hold-up is the new Labor government dragging its feet he wrote in The Australian. Now, Labor is in power and a free trade deal that will eliminate tariffs on 85 per cent of Australian goods exports to India, valued at more than $12.6 billion a year, is gathering dust. Every day that goes by costs our exporters millions of dollars. It is the same for the UK FTA, signed but gathering dust. I mean, what hypocrisy, what dishonesty, utter partisanship. No capacity to see the national interest. Very happy to come in here and wring their hands, wring their hands and carry on about bipartisanship. But the moment they go, go over to New Delhi, the moment that they're in Mumbai, they're over there undermining the confidence of customers, undermining the confidence of overseas governments that these deals are going to work their way through the parliament. And why? To score a few little points in the Oz. To play Senator to their McGrath, conservative order. base and pretend, and pretend that somehow, that somehow the new government isn't going to be as focused on these issues as it should be. I mean, what underhand, weak politics! What an illustration of how craven this new opposition is! What an illustration of their incapacity to be able to focus on what's in the interests of Australian exporters, what's in the interest of national interest, because if you get between them and a few column inches in the Oz, I mean, you've got to be careful, because there is nothing they won't say and nothing they won't do in their own partisan political interest. And I tell you what, if this is going to be the character of Mr Dutton and Mr Tian and this new opposition, I know that the first few years of opposition are difficult, and there's nothing more of an empty vessel than a new opposition making policy. I've seen it. I've been on the wrong side of it. I understand it. You know, Plato said empty vessels make the most noise. Well, he was right. He was right. But what you can't do, what you can't do, is damage the national interest when you do it. What you can't do is undermine our exporters and undermine our firms. And what you can't do is rat out the Australian interest overseas when you're over there, when you're over there on the public purse, supposed to be making a contribution in the national interest. 
Now, rather than an orgy of self-congratulation on the Labor side, I listened to Shadow Minister Birmingham congratulating himself. Well, this is a very good development, and delivering these agreements through the parliament this side of Christmas does mean significant progress on tariff reduction and significant progress for exporters and importers. It's a good thing to get it through. But there is more work to be done. You know, we're ready to commence the second wave, the more substantial wave of negotiations with uh, India over the more substantial round of bargaining that needs to occur to establish the second wave India agreement. And I, I, I know that Minister Farrell is really looking forward to leading those discussions and he's been in constant communication with his Indian counterparts, particularly Minister Piyush Goyal, who will be leading those negotiations on the Indian side. We've got to progress negotiations for the Australia-EU free trade agreement. We've got to work, not do the ribbon cutting that the other side always did, ribbon cutting and then nick off, work to deliver on both this agreement and the UK FTA to make sure it delivers on the promise uh, that it's promised. And there's a series of other very significant bilateral, plurilateral and multilateral challenges uh, for the Australian government that we're going to work through. And what we're not going to do is engage in an orgy of self-congratulation. And what we're not going to do is play hyper-partisan politics. We're just going to do it in the national interest. We're going to do it carefully and methodically in the interests of Australian businesses and workers for a more purposeful and less political approach to trade policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Cadell. Uh, I rise today. I was going to speak about this is a good day for Team Australia on getting these things through. But in the parlance of uh, World Cup football in which we find ourselves, this may be a, a tap-in goal for Minister Ayres and Minister Farrell, but the hard work was done by the midfield of uh, Mr, uh, Minister Tian of the previous government and the back of Simon Birmingham in the back. Lots of work going through, lots of time getting here. And what do we find? The other, those opposite may not like gas power, but they like gas lighting, like talking about different ways that this, this is all their work. Well, this was completed somewhere around in February, not enough time to get it to parliament. We've had problems getting through the Joint Standing Committee on treaties to bring it here. We've had problems getting it registered here. But today it is here, and this is a good day for Australia. These bills together implement Australia's tariff obligations under the Australian Economic Kingdom Free Trade Agreement and the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. Together, this agreement puts more Australian exports in front of over 1.5 billion consumers and increases Australian exports covered by free trade agreements to over 80 per cent of Australian exports. This is more money in the pockets of Australians and Australian businesses. Together, they demonstrate the ambition and capacity of a determined and capable coalition government to provide Australian exporters with more market opportunities and grow their business. The Australian free trade agreement with the UK is the most comprehensive and ambitious free trade agreement that Australia has with any other country than those across the ditch in New Zealand. On entry into force, tariffs of over 99 per cent of Australian goods to the UK will be eliminated. That comes at a value of $9.2 billion. Also under this agreement, Australia will eliminate almost all the tariffs on goods originating from the UK, with a small number to see tariff elimination over five years. My Welsh wife will be glad that PG tips will come in, property will come in cheaper under this arrangement. This interim trade agreement with India also strengthens our economic engagement with the world's fastest growing economy and what could be soon the world's largest populous country. There are five bills before us, two covering our preferential tariff obligations under the trade agreement with the UK and three covering our preferential tariff obligations with India agreement and a side letter dealing with double taxation. These bills, once passed, execute the legislative coverage required for Australia to advance ratification. 
We hope on this side that enough work has been in place with the UK and with India to be ratified in their places so we get the benefit of indexation if they are ratified prior to the year. Uh, rules of origin are also covered in this bill. And uh, which goods are eligible for preferential tariff treatment? This includes goods that are wholly obtained or produced within the United Kingdom or in the United Kingdom and Australia. Product specific rules, PSRs, are outlined in the Annex 4B of the agreement and they will determine the circumstances in which goods imported from the United Kingdom, which have components or inputs from a third party, are still eligible. The UK trade agreement with Australia must be noted. It is the very first trade agreement that the UK has reached following its exit from the EU. This is how important that relationship is to them and it shows how important it is to us. The previous government stood ready to act quickly and put this in place and it is paid off here. We're tapping in the goal but it is a win for Australia. In Australia, this agreement has been widely applauded by a range of groups especially in rural Australia, and I include National Farmers Federation, the Seafood Industry Australia, and for those who can go down to the seafood barbecue at the end of the year celebrating that industry, the Australian Meat Industry Council, the Sheep Producers Council, the Alcoholic Beverages Council of Australia, the Law Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce, the Business Council of Australia and the Group of Eight. We've already had strong and special relationship with this with the UK in business, and this FTA will only strengthen it. Also, it will make Australian exports to the UK cheaper, create no, uh, new opportunities for workers, young people and businesses. Farmers and producers will have improved access to 65 million UK consumers who value safe, sustainable produced products and beverages with a strong reputation that Australia holds. Around 43 million in annual customs duties will be removed from Australian wine when it enters the agreement. For beef, a tariff-free quota of 35,000 tonnes at entry will be forced to expand to 110,000 tonnes in year 10. Tariff on, on meat will be eliminated after 10 years. We will see how we go with the new Trade Minister negotiating with the EU if we can get tariff elimination at the end of that deal. Australia has never ended at FTA deal where tariff elimination isn't at the end. This is the test whether it happens now. For sheep meat, a tariff-free quota of 25,000 tonnes at entry will force to expand to $75,000 in year 10. Tariffs on sheep meat will be eliminated after 10 years as well. I met with the UK Agricultural Minister about 12 months ago and we were at the point where the debate was, this is how these things get people in the gallery. Is the weight bone in, bone out? That is the level of negotiations that go into these things. I'm glad it's been resolved. And for sugar, for north coast of New South Wales and Queensland, a tariff-free quote of 80,000 tonnes at entry into force will expand to 220,000 tonnes in year eight. Again, sugar tariffs eliminated in, year, uh, in eight years. That means, again, the, with, we'll be looking at Labor, how they go with the EU. So this is a fantastic arrangement with the UK. It will also give our young people more opportunity in the UK and it will drive our growth uh, and our reputation better. If we now turn to India, the Australian Economic and Cooperation and Trade Agreement, we'll see all of these come through. The Treasury Laws Amendments amend the International Tax Agreements Act 1953 to stop Australian taxation of certain payments or credits made to Indian residents who are providing technical services remotely to Australian businesses and customers. Well, that's been a problem with the India-Australian arrangement, how we treat that, and that is fixed under this. Australian trade agreement with India does open a new growth for Australian exporters. With 1.4, 1.5 billion people, a growing middle class, growing disposable income, India is the economic powerhouse that can drive us to diversify our dependency on China trade can diversify our markets and can look for value-added goods probably more than any other place in the world. In 2020, India was Australia's seventh largest trading partner, with two-way trade valued at $24.3 billion. Under this agreement, 
Tariffs will be eliminated on more than 85 per cent of Australian goods to export to India, all rising to almost 91 per cent, valued at $13.4 billion in 10 years. And Australian households will benefit with cheaper goods here, with 96 per cent of Indian goods imports entering Australia duty-free duty on entry into force. Once again, Australian service suppliers in 31 sectors and subsectors will be guaranteed to receive the best treatment accorded by India to any future free trade agreement partner, including higher education and adult education, business services, medical, dental, architectural, urban planning, research and development. Anything that comes in future, they will match under this agreement. And they are the value-add services that drives our service-led economy. There will be also access for young Indians to participate in working holidays in Australia, a thousand places per year in Australia's work and holiday program. And the length of stay for an Indian student with a bachelor's degree with first class honours will be extended from two to three years post study in any STEM or ICT se sectors. And again, third party endorsement of this. The National Farmers Federation, the Australian Grape and Wine, Wool Producers, Minerals Council of Australia, Australian Pear and Apple Limited, and the Australian Ch Commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It has been the coalition's ambitions, and I now know the Labor, Party, Labor government's ambitions, for these agreements to complete their ratification by 30 November, so we can get that benefit of the double tariff cut on 1 January 2023. It is a good thing that they are here. It is not overly partisan. Let's neither of us try and claim the absolute win because this is a win for the Australian people, the Australian businesses and Australia's economy that will be reaping the benefits of for, much, uh, for many years. Now, as we go forward, we hope these bills go through very quickly, very successfully, and we'll be supporting them. And uh, I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I see that once again we have a so-called free trade agreement in front of the Senate. Each time a free trade agreement is advanced, we hear speeches extolling the virtues of free trade, telling us how much this will help everyday Australians. Free trade lowers, lowers tariff barriers, making it easier for our farmers to sell their produce, so we're told. We're told that so-called free trade gives market access for our manufactured goods, <coughs> software and such like. Australia has free trade agreements with New Zealand, Singapore, United States, Thailand, Chile, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Peru, Indonesia, Mexico and Vietnam through the CPTPP, Brunei, Jerusalem and Cambodia through the RCEP, and now India and the UK. After all these free trade agreements bringing all this increased prosperity, Australia should be rolling in it. But according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics measure of household income and wealth, since 2010, everyday Australian households have seen a reduction in their annual income of 1.2 per cent. Not an increase, a reduction. This is not serving Australia. Everyday Australian households have seen a reduction in their wealth of 1.6 per cent. Australia is not rolling in newfound wealth. Australia has gone backwards, and Australians are going backwards. This is not serving Australia. It should be remembered that in this period our mineral exports have boomed, absolutely boomed. From that alone, every Australian should be thousands of dollars better off. But we're not. So what's gone wrong? It's simple. Nations do not sign free to trade agreements unless they consider they will gain more than they lose. And that, of course, is not possible. A pie can only be sliced in so many ways. There's no evidence free trade agreements will grow the pie so that each slice of the pie is larger. While growing the pie is the promise, the outcome is smaller slices of the same size pie. This so-called free trade agreement, like the previous agreements, will not make our lives better. It will not serve Australians. It will make it easier for large corporations to move capital around the world, chasing the lowest wage, the most flexible labour arrangements, 
including labour hire contracts that One Nation is still waiting for Labor to do something about after we dragging them to our attention, their attention to it for the last three years. They still won't touch it. International capital will move money around, chasing the lowest tax rates and the highest profits. This is where some of the negative outcomes from these so-called free trade agreements lay. Free trade agreements are a race to the bottom, a race to the lowest wages, the lowest taxation, the least corporate regulation and the most efficient enterprise. When proponents of free trade agreement though, talk about business efficiency, they never mean small and medium businesses or family businesses. Efficiency is a code word for large corporations becoming larger and sending small businesses broke to eliminate competition. That is not serving the people of Australia. That is not serving Australia. One Nation supports fair trade, not so-called free trade. Fair trade can occur between nations with similar wages and environmental regulations. These are the two big costs that decide how fairly one country can compete with another. The UK Free Trade Agreement is more likely to provide a fair outcome for Australia than any other of these so-called agreements with countries like China that treat environment legislation as a joke and who pay their workers unfairly low wages. The fact that a Labor Party, the fact that a party called the Labor Party promotes these agreements belies their new iteration as the party of global capital and environmental rent seekers. One Nation is now the party of the workers because we serve the people. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation serving the people of Australia. Oh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Van. Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, good to see you. Oh. <laughs> I, I did think the rev up was continuing longer. Well, Senator ma Van. Maybe have... mine might put you to sleep if, uh, if Malcolm's didn't. Uh, and I must admit, I, I don't agree with uh, much of, or anything of what my good friend said, because I do welcome the government's move to introduce the tranche bills that is before us today. I'm especially pleased that they have finally introduced the Customs Amendment, Australia United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement Implementation Bill, and its partner, Tariff Australia United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement Implementation Bill. However, quite simply, the introduction of this bill should have been done months ago. Perhaps if the government had gone to the effort of appointing a High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, they might have heard from that person how urgent and important it, that this is done. But alas, we still don't have a High Commissioner, and after over six months of being in government, we are only now just seeing this bill entered into the Senate. It was, after all, on the 15th of June last year that Prime Ministers Morrison and Johnson announced that they had reached an agreement on the core principles of that free trade agreement. It was the coalition government who did all the heavy lifting and delivered on an ambitious agenda to get this free trade agreement done. Fundamentally, the former coalition government understood the importance of free trade and delivering better trade and market access. When we arrived in government in 2013, only 27 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was covered by free trade agreements. And when we left government earlier this year, that figure was 75 per cent of all two-way trade. Now, it's important to note that this is the first free trade agreement that the UK the UK has reached following its exit from the EU and highlights the incredible work done by the then Trade Minister, Dan Tan, who negotiated this deal while we were in government. The Australia United Free Trade Agreement is the gold standard across all trade agreements of its kind. Australia's free trade agreement with the UK is the most comprehensive and ambitious free trade agreement that Australia has other than our one with New Zealand. The United Kingdom is one of our most important partners in the world. 
Our nations share a closely aligned strategic outlook, and we cooperate across a wide range of foreign policy, defence, security, intelligence, trade and economic issues. When this agreement comes into force, tariffs on over 99 per cent of Australian goods exported to the UK will be eliminated, valued at around $9.2 billion. Under the agreement, Australia will also eliminate almost all tariffs on goods originating from the UK, with a small number to see tariff elimination over five years. Australia and UK are both trading nations that share a commitment to liberalised free trade, which is underpinned by our shared heritage and values. We already have a strong and special relationship rooted uh, deeply in business and people-to-people -people connections. A free trade agreement will only strengthen this further. In Australia, as my good friend Senator Cadell said, it has been widely applauded by a range of different business groups. It will make Australian exports to the United Kingdom cheaper, create new opportunities for workers, young people and businesses. Importantly, the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement delivers a wider range of trade and market access opportunities for exporters. In what can now be seen as a giant win for our farmers and producers, they will now have improved access to more than 65 million UK consumers who value safe, sustainably produced food and beverages, with the strong provenance that Australia offers. Around $43 million in annual customs duties will be re removed from Australian wine when the agreement enters into force, which will help those who have been subject to uh, illegal trade sanctions by the Chinese Communist Party. This free trade agreement will save Australian households and businesses around $200 million a year, with, with tariffs on almost all UK goods being eliminated on entry into force. At a time when we are having a cost of living crisis, this should have been a priority. Yet, unfortunately, we have seen this government drop the ball when it comes to the cost of living crisis that Australians are facing. And instead, they are spending more time looking at entrenching and enhancing their, unions mate, their union mates' power. Because of the Coalition's work under this free trade agreement, Professionals will have the same access to the United Kingdom's lucrative jobs market as their European competitors, except obviously for the Republic of Ireland. This means Australian job seekers can compete on an equal footing with EU nationals in the UK for the first time in more than 40 years, at a time when employers across Australia are crying out that they are understaffed and need more workers to keep up with demand and keep their businesses alive. This agreement will make it easier for more British people to come and work here, and they'll be able to do so for longer than their traditional 80-day stay at a farm. And they can also help fill critically understaffed industries such as hospitality, aged and childcare. It is for this reason the Albanese government needs to stop dithering and start doing. Our Victorian businesses cannot wait one more year for the next sitting fortnight to hash out the finer details of this agreement. They need cheaper imports and more staff for this Christmas season coming up. Or, and I say this with some deep sorrow, some Victorian businesses may not survive to see their next Christmas. Australian businesses will also have the guaranteed right to bid for a greater variety of UK government contracts in a procurement market estimated to be worth half a trillion dollars annually. Australia and the UK have a strong and enduring investment relationship that reflects the deep ties between our countries and our shared traditions of good governance and robust legal systems. UK businesses will be encouraged to invest in Australia thanks to best practice investment rules, including to set up regional headquarters in Australia to leverage our network of free trade agreements. In 2020, the UK was the second largest source of foreign investment in Australia. 
totalling $738 billion, and the third largest source of foreign direct investment of $123 billion. By bringing in new businesses with connections in different markets, foreign investment from the UK can create more export opportunities for Australian business. Increased UK investment would also encourage competition and increased innovation by bringing new technologies and services to the Australian market, promoting productivity, employment and wages growth. Given the considerable benefits and opportunities this agreement will bring to both Australia and the UK, it is really absurd that it took the government this long to get it in front of the Senate. As an open trading nation, our future prosperity depends on Australian businesses continuing to be competitive, to be innovative and to be successful in new markets. Trade agreements help create opportunities for business and people to grow and succeed. This creates more jobs and more skilled people to fill those jobs. It is important to remember that the Coalition managed to negotiate this free trade agreement all during the COVID-19 pandemic time, a time when we are experiencing the most difficult conditions that any of us had ever experienced, a time when those opposite kept on yelling out across the chamber that we only had two jobs to do. Unbelievable, really, now, isn't it? So the Labor Party really has no excuse on why it has taken them this long to bring the bill before us. Clearly, this government hasn't yet figured out how to walk and chew gum at the same time. When it comes to the, the Group D in India Australia Economic Cooperation and, and Trade Agreement, the Customs Amendment and Customs Tariff Amendment bills, they will have similar effects to the customs bills covering the UK agreement. Both implement Australia's rules of origin and preferential tariff rate obligations in the trade agreement with India. This agreement with India opens up a new era of growth for Australian exporters and the co coalition should be congratulated for our hard work in getting these across the line. In 2020, India was Australia's seventh largest trading partner with two-way trade valued at $24.3 billion. India is also an important friend and ally in the region who we have been working with deeply through our Quad partnership. Under this agreement, tariffs will be eliminated on more than 85 per cent of Australian goods exported to India, rising to almost 91 per cent, which is valued at $13.4 billion over 10 years. Countless Australian sectors will benefit from this agreement, helping our producers gain greater access to a more diversified range of markets. It has been the Coalition's ambition for these agreements to complete their, dom their domestic ratification processes by 30 November so that exporters can get the benefit of a double tariff cut on 1 January 2023. And, as I said, we have been completely bipartisan in supporting the government on these bills. However, why this government has been so haphazard and slow in their implementation of these agreements is absolutely baffling and shows that they have little or no idea on how to govern. We obviously support these bills and therefore call on the government to stop the delay. Let's get these agreements implemented as quickly as possible so Australian exporters can start to reap the benefit of the coalition's hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Brockman. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I, re I too rise to make a brief contribution on this package of bills. Uh, as I've said in this place on a number of occasions, Australia is a trading nation, and my home state of Western Australia is a trading state. Uh, Western Australia exports something like 90 per cent plus of its wheat, its large, largest agricultural commodity. Obviously, we are the single most significant exporter of iron ore, a uh, significant exporter of gas uh, into the international market. Western Australia, in particular, uh, relies on trade and on agreements between nations to make trade flows work. 
and that is why it is um, my pleasure to rise and speak on these bills. And I, I'm, I'm very happy to say these are bills that are aimed at liberalising trade uh, flows between Australia and the UK on the one hand and Australia and India on the other. Both very important markets to my home state of WA. Uh, obviously, in terms of trade, things like uh, gold, agricultural commodities, uh, significant uh, exports to the UK. We receive the largest number of overseas visitors uh, from the UK, uh, from any uh, nation in Europe. Uh, so, and we're beginning to see, thankfully, the return of uh, locally the, the backpackers, the uh, working holiday visa makers, uh, back to Western Australia from a variety of nations, including the UK. And that's really good to see because they're such an important part of uh, the workforce, particularly in many rural and regional areas. Uh, so, in congratulating the former Minister Tian and uh, former Minister Birmingham for their work on these trade agreements, I, I do wish to sound a word of warning. Because, as always has been the case, the Monica Free Trade Agreement is perhaps the free is a little bit questionable at times. Often they're trade agreements, and they're trade agreements that seek to control and limit. Yes, they put in place tariff reductions, but they can also uh, be seen, particularly when they're being uh, negotiated uh, perhaps without the commitment to liberal free trade that the coalition has, that they can actually end up being regulatory agreements. And that is something that I would urge those who are now in the government seats to be very cautious of as they move forward with future trade agreements. Uh, in particular, we see in trade agreements being negotiated by the European a desire to impose European regulations on other jurisdictions. And if we allow trade agreements to go down that path, then we will weaken our economy. We will undermine the very nature of trade and trade agreements and the benefits they give to the international community. And we will impose costs from an overseas jurisdiction on Australian producers. And in particular, the area where this will hit hardest is the, you know, the area closest to my heart, and I, I freely admit this, it, it's in the agricultural sector. Because uh, th there, are, there are many ways that you can impose uh, regulation via trade agreements on exports that don't involve tariffs. There are many ways. And we're seeing that now in some of the reaction to the uh, the negotiations and the agreements signed between Europe and, and New Zealand in terms of their agricultural producers and how it is impacting upon them. So uh, the devil is always in the detail in trade agreements. And the reason why I can congratulate Senator Birmingham and uh, former Minister Tian is that I know they had a commitment to liberal trade agreements. They had an agreement to open and fair and free trade uh, 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 as a way of increasing the wealth of Australia. Uh, will that remain the case or will we get bogged down in labour force examinations, uh, export of various rules around methane or carbon in trade agreements? various restrictions on chemicals that aren't needed in higher rainfall jurisdictions like Europe, uh, but which are needed in low rainfall areas, particularly, say, in my home state of WA, where a chemical like glyphosate is essential to a no-till no, no farming, uh, which, locks, which locks moisture into the soil and stops erosion. If we lose access to those very important chemicals with no replacement, then we will also decimate the agricultural production in this country and we will also no longer be able to feed millions of people around the world. Uh, Australia as a trading nation is not just exporting food for the fun of it. We are exporting food because there are people out there that need food. And 
if we go down the path where our trade agreements enable other jurisdictions to dictate how our farmers, our businesses operate in this country, then that will be a sad day indeed for Australia. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, uh, I rise um, to uh, speak on this uh, bill and provide the uh, summing up uh, for the, uh, the government and um, make it clear that the government is uh, very committed to seeking entry into force of the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement as soon as possible to enable the many benefits to uh, be realised. The Joint Standing Committee on Treaties scrutinised both agreements and recommended that binding, binding treaty action be taken to implement these two uh, fine agreements. I wish to express my sincere thanks to all the members of the committee for preparing uh, a valuable report, and special thanks go to uh, the Chair Mr Josh uh, Wilson. The uh, United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement uh, includes ambitious outcomes to benefit uh, both Australia and the United Kingdom. And these include eliminating tariffs on over 99 per cent of Australian goods uh, exported to the United, King, uh, United Kingdom, valued at about $9.2 billion. Enhancing pathways for workers and young people to work in both countries and supporting the free movement of data to enhance growth in the digital economy. The Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement secures Australia's access to the fastest growing Indian market, um, a market of 1.4 billion people, and provides a solid basis to negotiate a further comprehensive economic cooperation uh, agreement. The agreement will deliver many benefits to Australian producers and service suppliers. Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, these include eliminating tariffs on 90 per cent of Australia's uh, current goods and exports to India by value and locking in access to many sectors in Australia's third largest services export market. A trade agreement with India will give Australian exporters a competitive advantage in the Indian market and opportunities for the very important trade diversification. I note that some senators on the crossbench have raised specific concerns in relation to the two trade agreements, including the negotiating process. The speech I delivered on the 14th of November at the RMIT APEC Study Centre in Melbourne outlines the government's approach to trade and investment policy. The government is committed to ensuring transparency in trade negotiations and seeks to balance, firstly, the need for, conf for confidentiality during the negotiations, the respective roles, and secondly, the respective roles of the executive and parliament, and finally, an interest uh, um, of a range of uh, stakeholders. To enhance uh, stakeholder engagement, the government has established the Trade 2040 Task Force. Uh, this task force will ensure that traditionally marginalised voices are amp amplified, including those of First Nations and women. Finally, the government's approach to trade recognises that Australia's economic resilience depends on an open global trade relations underpinned by uh, robust rules. More trade, not less, is a key, uh, a key part of how we build the economic future we want in Australia, with secure, high-paying jobs and an open, internationally competitive economy powered by clean energy. Trade agreements with India and the United Kingdom will assist Australia to reach its full economic potential. And I'd like to thank my fellow senators, including Senator Birmingham, for supporting the legislation that will ratify these important trade agreements. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question uh, before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senators Cox and Steele John be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? I, I didn't hear two voices. A division is required. Bring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senators Cox and Steele John be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Uh, I appoint Senator Cadell uh, for the ayes. The noes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appoint Senator. Ah, McKim, hello, for the eyes, and uh, Senator Cadell for the nose. Hello. 
Five. How are you? Senator Thorpe, we're nearly there with the counting. Uh, the result of the division is ayes 14, noes 31. Uh, the matter is resolved in the negative. And uh, senators are invited to resume their seats or leave the chamber. Uh, the question uh, before the chair now is that the bills uh, now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it and I call the clerk. Customs Amendment India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022 and four related bills. No amendments have been circulated. Uh, does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I call the minister. I so move. Uh, the question uh, before the chair is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Customs Amendment India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022 and four related bills. Government Business Orders of the Day number two Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022 in committee. Thank you, Clark. So we're now in the committee stage in relation to the family assistance legislation. So I am sitting down there. Thank you. No one is. Okay. Uh, so the committee is considering the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022, uh, and the amendment moved by Senator Roberts. Uh, so the question uh, before us is that part two of Schedule 4 stand as printed. Uh, if no one is seeking to speak to that, I'm putting that question. Uh, so those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. 
I think the eyes have it. Is a division required? I only heard one voice there. Is a division required? A division's required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that part two of schedule four stand as printed. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. Uh, and I appoint Senator Ciccone for the eyes. Uh, and is it Senator Roberts for the nose? Ciccone Senator Paul. Roberts. Hello. Hello. For the chair.
vision is eyes 45, nose 3. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, it now being 1.30, the committee reports progress. The committee reports progress and will be proceeding to two-minute statements, so I'd ask senators who are not participating in that to leave the chamber. And I'm getting ready to call Senator Dean Smith. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. Our communities are well supported by great charities and great not-for-profit organisations. And this morning in the Senate, I just want to call out one of those that I'm particularly fond of, that I enjoy supporting in my home community of Western Australia. And that, of course, is Grandparents Rearing Grandchildren, a wonderful organisation that, since 1998, following a simple advertisement in the community newspaper, has been providing much needed respite and support for those grandparents in our community who have the full-time caring responsibility of their grandchildren. And in particular, I want to congratulate Alan Hoffman, who's been re elected as the new president, uh, Diane Franklin, who's been elected as the vice president, Jan McGilvray as the treasurer, and to Philip Etherington as the secretary. For a number of years, this Senate has given careful consideration to the interests and concerns and welfare of grandparents rearing grandchildren across our country. I'm delighted that grandparents rearing grandchildren in Western Australia continues to be a very, very strong organisation that provides much needed care and support, social exercises, community involvement for those many, many grandparents across our country that are now having to face the responsibility of rearing their grandchildren 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And can I also applaud the Country Women's Association of Western Australia, who is joining with grandparents rearing grandchildren in WA to support the great work that they do in providing much needed support to those grandparents who are providing care for their grandchildren in regional and remote Western Australia. This is a great initiative. It's one that I'm very, very pleased to support. And finally, and finally, as I launch today my annual Christmas appeal, I'm delighted that the grandparents rearing grandchildren will again be the beneficiary of that, as with the Salvation Thank Army you, in Belga. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. I rise in the Senate today to deliver an important, powerful message from young Queenslander Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie has written a speech in her own words as part of the Raise Your Voice Australia initiative. And she says, my name is Stephanie. I'm 17 years old, living in the electorate of Dixon and attending a Catholic all-girls school in Brisbane. In the past few years, monumental steps have been made towards dismantling rape culture through education. However, as a young woman witnessing my friends' experiences, I believe that this government needs to not only focus on education but also reinventing the system supposed to help victims of rape and sexual assault. It is beyond words of frustration, disgust and sorrow I felt when three of my female friends, with no connection to one another, confided to me that they had been raped or sexually assaulted. I had to watch helplessly as two of them went through the cold and uncaring legal processes and, in the same week, both made attempts on their lives. The fear women and trans non-binary people face from true and horrific stories we hear all the time is indescribable. It is ongoing and influences every decision we make when we leave the house or have people over. The least we can ask for is assurance that when we try to attain justice, we will be treated compassionately, be always entitled to a support person, regardless of whether they are secondary witness or not, and to have access to subsidised mental health services. For the sake of my friends, myself, my little sister, my classmates, my co-workers and for every young person in Australia who has experienced or has to live in the fear of sexual assault, a compassionate justice system should be an absolute priority for this government. Well, can I say thank you, Stephanie, for your words. Thank you for letting me read your words into the Senate today. We hear your call and we will ensure that victims of sexual assault do have justice. Senator Rice. 
Thanks, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Today I have the privilege of participating in the Youth Voice in Parliament campaign, which asked Australians under 21 or under to write a speech on what our new parliament should accomplish for their local MP, for their local MP to read. I am delighted to share the statement of 15-year-old Newport resident, resident Phoebe Gowan. Hello, my name is Phoebe, and I am a 15-year-old from the electorate of Gellibrand. I am writing to address the increasing gambling rates in Australia. Around 6.5 million people in Australia above 18 are regular gamblers. Since there are over 20 million people above 18 in all of Australia, it is not hard to see that this is an outrageous number. And still, you allow so many gambling ads on social media and TV. Still, you put more effort into getting rid of other products bad for humans' health while completely ignoring the horrifying gambling rates. For example, more effort is put into abolishing smoking in Australia. However, gambling is just as bad for us in indirect ways. Homelessness, bankruptcy and so many more consequences can branch from gambling addictions. I believe that we need to ban gambling ads online to not only show how gamblers can live without the bright lights of casinos, but also to prevent young people from falling into the trap of having faith in slim chances. Ignoring the ever-increasing signs will greatly affect Australia. Please get rid of gambling ads to help our country get past this hurdle and progress forward. So thank you, Phoebe, for giving me the opportunity to share your statement. And I can assure you that as Greens, we are listening. We also agree with you that gambling, and particularly online gambling ads, are massively damaging, and there needs to be much more action taken to address them. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today, Transplant Australia unveiled a new global symbol for organ and tissue donation called the Gift of Life Baton. As a senator for Western Australia, it was wonderful to meet with Transplant Australia to discuss the upcoming World Transplant Games to be held in Perth in April next year, where competitors from 50 nations will compete in 17 sports, and all of them will be winners before they get to Perth. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on Australia's rate of organ and tissue donations. Between 2019 and 2021, there was a, 30, a 23 per cent decrease in donations. Now, while most of us, and I'm sure everybody in this chamber, would agree and support the concept of organ and tissue donations, only around a third of Australians have registered as donors. So that's why Transplant Australia are now working to re-engage the public on, or on organ donation and have the conversation with us all. Today in Australia, just under 2,000 are waiting for desperately needed and desperately desired life-saving organ transplants. Now, these Australians come from all walks of life, and in fact, tomorrow it could be any of us here in this place who need an organ transplantation. It's not something we like to think about or talk about, but if you haven't already, can I encourage everybody, uh, if you wish to be a donor, to let your family know and to have that conversation with them now, because if the worst happens, it takes away one uh, b burden from them to have to decide on your behalf. You can learn more about it uh, through the Transplant Australia website, and it is so easy to save lives. You can register as a donor on your Medicare app. I know it only takes about five minutes to do. I have, and we all should. Thank you. Senator Poley. I rise to speak about Caesar Panwala and his family. Caesar is a local resident of Launceston and recently faced deportation due to a visa issue he was facing. Unfortunately, the Colombian-born Invermay, father of two, was facing deportation back to Colombia. Mr Panwala's children have lived their whole lives in Australia and were well settled at school and have immersed themselves in the culture and values of our country. His his 14-year-old daughter, Maria, is an avid soccer player with the Northern Rangers and has dreams of being the next Sam Kerr. It has been a very long road for the family. Caesar and Claudia Penwala have been seeking permanent residency for a long time, so the family was very shocked when they were told that they were about to be deported. 
To secure permanent residency, CESA needed his employer to submit the appropriate documentation as part of the regional sponsored migration scheme visa. This did not occur, and time had passed. And unfortunately, the consequence for CESA found himself uh, was the situation that they had experienced since 2019 of being very stressed, uncertain of their future, and on the 17th of November were due to leave the country. But what happened? We got elected. And what are we doing now? We are cleaning up the mess left behind by Scott Morrison and his government for failing to act on behalf of this family. So it has been left to the new Minister for Immigration, the Honourable Andrew Giles, who has been providing assistance to the family. And the good news is they've been able to return to Tasmania and stay uh, in Tasmania. They're on a bridging visa E with a work waiver, and the next skills visa that they will apply for will do an assessment on Caesar's skills. And the good news is it looks much better outlook for those families. But it was a it was a, a terrible situation to have the previous government unable Thank to you, resolve the families. Senator Polly, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting De Deputy President. I hear a lot about Aussie manufacturing, that they can't compete with China, how we can't compete with cheaper Asian labour. We don't have cars in Australia anymore. We've gutted critical industries. When the pandemic came, we realised we didn't even have basic health equipment that we needed here. Our days of making things seem to be well and truly gone, but are they? There are amazing businesses coming up with new ways of doing things every day. Harbro Engineering in Sprayton, Tasmania, is just one of them. I went to visit them recently and saw the parts that they are making for mining, military and aerospace. They work with the latest high-tech steel alloys coming out of Europe. There's this one part they're making, and if you get it overseas, it comes in five parts, right? Not Harbro. Harbro can make it in one piece, one unit. How great is that? Harbro has also invested in 3D printing technology, which means less waste. Traditional metal, metal milling means cutting parts out of a block and having to gather the offcuts for recycling. With 3D printing, you can only use the metal you need. Zero waste. Better for the planet. It's innovation, it's manufacturing, and it's happening right here in the heart of Tassie. You'd think the state or federal governments would be tripping over themselves trying to give businesses like these a leg up, such as grants. We want investment in local manufacturing. Governments say they want that too. But for whatever reason, Harbour is just one of many out there that can't seem to get a whiff of government support. And for the life of me, I cannot see why. We need to be investing in local manufacturing. It leads to investing in Australian jobs, and it means that we're not relying on other countries in a time of crisis. Businesses like Harbour need our help to reach their full potential. And if we're serious about Australian manufacturing, then these guys are the guys that we need back in the game. This is how we will make Australia make again. And while I'm on it, does anyone out there that want a job in Tasmania on the northwest coast? Harbour is looking for you. Call Thank them. you, Senator Lambie. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise today as part of the Youth Voice to Parliament of the initiative by Raise Our Voice. And today I will speak in this chamber for 11-year-old Jacob Tabui, a Year 6 student at Sacred Heart School in Cabramatta. I spoke earlier today with uh, Jacob and his teacher, Miss Gonzalez. And when asked what Australia's new parliament should accomplish, Jacob prepared the following speech. I firmly believe that the new Australian government should assist the people of Australia by lowering taxes. Taxes aren't helping. They are way too high and don't motivate people to work. Good afternoon. My name is Jacob, and I don't technically live in Fowler, but my school is located there. I strongly believe that growth in taxes will not help the economy in any way. Taxes can have many varieties of charges. Taxes are charged more when you work more. So the more you spend all your effort working just to survive, the more you will get taxed. Citizens are working hours, more hours, just to be taxed four or five per cent more of their income from working, and this can be higher the more you work. In about 15 years, I would like to start work, and I wouldn't be motivated to put in the time and effort it takes to work just for the government to take their percentage out of your income. People who don't have a decent income from work shouldn't be charged tax at all. I hope this message spreads and taxes should be lowered immediately because it does not help the economy with anything. Instead, it tells citizens that their hard-earned money is being taken. 
I really hope the new Australian government can help lower taxes for all the people of this great nation. Thank you. So to Jacob, thank you for your effort. Good luck with your studies, and I wish you a happy future. Senator Stirl. Well, thank you, Madam Mackin, Deputy President. I just want to let the Senate know that back in 2015, I started the campaign uh, bring UFC to Perth now. And I was very happy to work on that. I went to all the UFC pubs because of my love of UFC. We had a government that would not have the UFC in, in, in WA. We got 2,000 signatures. Imagine walking around all the pubs on UFC fight nights getting signatures to bring the UFC to Perth. And I'm so pleased to say that UFC 284 is coming to Perth, the RAC Arena, February the 12th, 2023. And guess what? We're going to have Alexander Volkanovsky fighting at a higher, a higher weight. And let's get behind Alexander Australia, who's one of ours. But I want to say this. I want to pass on my sincere best wishes to my very dear friend, Peter Klosko. Now, Peter is the UFC Vice President of Australia and New Zealand. I met Peter in his early formative days with the UFC. I've been to the UFC in, in uh, uh, Las Vegas. I went to their headquarters. You've got no idea how proud I am to say that this magnificent event is coming to Perth. Peter, to you and your crew, mate, what a magnificent achievement. I had the privilege of going to Melbourne at the time when Ronda Rousey and Holly, uh, Holly Humes were having it out. And let me tell you, 90,000 Victorians came to that event. The money that it brings in, not only that for the UFC lovers, but for tourism in Australia. Now, let me just share these stats with you. There's the venue holds 14,000. Do you know there were 78,000 fans registered with intent to buy tickets? 78,000 of the 14. Work that out. So whoever got a ticket, half your luck, good on you. But of that 78,000, 59 per cent of those tickets were purchased from buyers from outside of uh, Western Australia and outside of Australia. And I did say to Peter, mate, next time we've got to have the UFC at our footy stadium, because I know that Peter and his crew will fill that. So, Aussies, let's get behind Alexander. Let's wish him all the very best, and let's continue to enjoy this magnificent professional sport, the UFC. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I'll be reading out a short speech written by young Tasmanian legend Trenton Hoare for Youth Voice in Parliament Week. As I sit here taking a break from my studies to answer the question, what would you like the new parliament to achieve, I am filled with rage and anxiety. As a 21-year-old living in the electorate of Clark, trying to better myself by going to university so I can get a good job own a home and start a family, that utopian paradise seems distant, let alone even real. I am filled with rage because I wake up every day hoping for a better world, but I am barely seeing any progress. Our politicians, with the help of their corporate mates, are destroying our planet, creating a social divide between the rich and the poor, the whites versus the others. What is the point of me continuing on if the government continues to destroy the only home I've ever had? What is the point of me continuing my studies so I can get a good job, own a home and start a family if the world collapses anyway? You cannot have your cake and eat it too. So what would I like? the new parliament to achieve proper climate action, fix the inequality crisis and tax the rich, make Australia equitable. Trenton, thank you. Great speech. I was very proud to give it and I could not agree more with the content. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today it is my great privilege as part of the Raise Our Voice initiative to read to the Senate a speech by a young person here in the ACT, Grace Heffernan. I was raised on Gadigal country and now study on Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands. Author Charlie Maxey said, one of our greatest freedoms is the way we react to things. As climate change intensifies, our freedom to change our relationship with Earth is at risk and I need you to protect it. The par this parliament is the very last to write the story of the standard we accepted when we had the chance to change, to change the way Australia consumes, mitigates and legislates. 
and there has never been a greater policy window than the one opened by the federal election to transform energy, industry and our standard of life. A phenomenon about climate change is that, despite the way humans have reacted to past existential crises with vigour and innovation, we have chosen to bury our heads in the sand. This reaction astonishes and alarms me. So I ask this new government to reframe climate change not as something to ignore but a tremendous opportunity, to remember how adaptive we are and how the human spirit makes hope in and out of despair. And for you, as politicians, to grace us with a legacy Australia can be grateful for, react well. These words from Grace speak for themselves. Many, like Grace, young people across the country are asking people in this, in this place to make decisions that will secure their future, that will deal with the big challenge we, challenges we face to turn them into opportunities for all of us. That's the opportunity for us, and I sincerely hope that the Senate will take that opportunity. Senator Rennick. It is an issue of national concern that the major banks are abandoning communities across Australia at an accelerating rate, announcing the closure of 72 branches in regional communities in just the last six weeks. Branch closures strangle communities economically, socially and mentally. One of those is Westpac's branch in Coober Pedy the last bank in town, which Westpac is closing in February 2023. This is a major blow to the local economy, which is based on opals and tourism and is heavily dependent on the Westpac branch for cash. There is no alternative to cash in regional Australia, especially remote towns like Cooper Pedy. The next closest bank is in Port Augusta, 540 kilometres away. Westpac is telling local businesses that require cash withdrawals to use bank post at the local licensed post office. Except the problem with this is, is that it isn't equipped to handle large volumes of cash. It doesn't have the same security, and the bank's restrictions on cash withdrawals through bank post restrict local commerce. Westpac, Westpac didn't even inform the post office directly that it's leaving. Westpac and the other banks enjoy enormous public financial support. They should repay that support by maintaining banking services in the communities, in the regional communities. It's bad enough that maternity wards and many other essential services have been closing in regional Australia. Now regional towns are losing their banking services. This is why we need a government-owned postal bank to provide banking and insurance services to regional centres and small businesses. A postal bank can act as a bulwark against the cartel-like behaviour of the big banks. Senator Roberts. Thank you. There's nothing more galling than the sight of a 100 metre high wind turbine slumped over. A smouldering aluminium and concrete corpse, testament to wind power stupidity. Even if a wind turbine fibreglass blade makes it through a 12 year operating life, the blade is still a global waste catastrophe. Every year, Europe adds 2 million blades filling landfills. At the same time that we declared plastic straws an environmental sin, our beautiful planet has 40 million tonnes of wind turbine blades destined for landfill by 2050. Every blade of every wind turbine installed to 2030 will be in a landfill by 2050. So-called renewables need to be renewed every 10 to 15 years. We're not building our net zero nature-dependent generation once. We're doing it twice over or three times, with all the waste this will bring. This is environmental vandalism, killing the environment in the name of saving it. I remember when greenies hugged trees. Now greenies chop whole forests to hug manufactured goods composed of concrete, steel, fiberglass and gearbox oil. Greenies are resource hogs. Recycling wind turbine blades is not impossible. It just takes a huge amount of cheap energy, for which coal is the optimal fuel. That's why, without affordable coal energy, wind turbine blades and solar panels are dumped, not recycled. German wind farms kill 100,000 birds a year, and unlike those killed in cities, these birds tend to be endangered species due to the location of turbines. New model turbines are approaching 240 metres in height with blades close to 120 metres. That will need a hell of a big hole to bury. This is not free energy and it certainly is not renewable. Government should not force a technological transition. If wind technology was any good, it would not be reliant on subsidies of $500,000 per turbine per year. We are one community, we are one nation, 
and pushing the United Nations and World Economic Forum's Thank net zero you, is Robert. environmental. Senator Steele John. Thank you. All workers deserve human rights. All workers deserve respect. All workers should be able to do their work free of discrimination with adequate protections in place. I imagine that most people in this chamber would agree with that. But when I say that sex work is work and that sex workers are workers, well then suddenly this chamber is aghast. Now from 2020, uh, when a court ruling opened up the conversation about NDIS and sex services, I've had many conversations with people in the community, and here are just some of the things that have been raised with me consistently. That the intersection between disability and sex work moves in two directions. Just as disabled people rely on sex support services, many sex workers are themselves folks who identify as disabled people. Many of these people face additional barriers in receiving formalised disability supports due to discrimination uh, faced uh, by them because of their profession. Many disabled people uh, need access to sex workers or sex-based services uh, as supports in their NDIS plans. These supports are reasonable and they are necessary. When sex workers reach out to law enforcement to report assaults, they are rarely, if ever, taken seriously. And people working in the industry are often failed by multiple systems that should support them. We need to sort out our relationship with sex work in this country. The law is all over the place. Discrimination is rife, and the people in this building are too prudish to acknowledge that the industry even exists, let alone solve the problems of people working in it. We need change now. We need decrim now. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, Senator Henderson, do your best. <laughs> in Peter Credlin's excellent Sky News documentary, The Cult of Daniel Andrews, former Victorian Police Chief Commissioner Kel Glare oh, said yeah. in his lifetime he had oh, never yeah. seen a government as corrupt as the one led by Daniel Andrews. The Premier has left a trail of corruption and cover-up. After turning oh, Melbourne yeah. into the world's most uh, locked down city, Senator don't Henderson, vote. Senator Henderson, I would ask you to visit. Order, order, order. Uh, Senator Polly. Uh, Madam President, I was just trying to draw your attention to the fact that the Honourable Senator failed to acknowledge the Premier by his correct title. Thank you. And uh, the time has expired. Um, we're going to move to question time, but before I call Senator McKenzie, uh, I just want to announce some. Uh, visitors, so I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of a delegation from New Zealand from the New Zealand Parliament, led by the chairperson of the Governance and Administrative Committee, Mr. Ian McKelfey. Welcome. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. You now, you are now in the best chamber. Um, I also draw to the uh, attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the 2022 Australian Defence Force Parliamentary Program exchange participants. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the Senate and thank you for the work that you've contributed to in your time here. I just want to go to the um, point of order that Senator Birmingham um, asked me to review yesterday. And whilst I'm not changing my decision. I do think it deserves some clarity. So, um, Yesterday I undertook to review the Hansard of a question from Senator Hume to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher, concerning gas prices. The Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, raised the point of order on direct relevance. I noted that a minister is directly relevant when responding to both the preamble and the specific question. The preamble identified the Treasurer's statement about acting with urgency on gas prices. The specific question framed the matter around resolving uncertainty in the government policy on gas prices. There was a political frame to the question, and I consider the minister was being directly relevant in exploring the causes and emergence of high gas prices and returning the political serve 
in relation to uncertainty in energy prices. It would not have been in order for the minister to focus solely on those matters, given that the question asked about the government's intentions. However, by the time Senator Birmingham rose to take his point of order, the minister had come back to what the government had done and was doing uh, and in doing so was in order. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Pre President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. After being questioned at the Australian Financial Review's Infrastructure Summit yesterday about the suburban rail loop project, which didn't go through the Prime Minister's stated infrastructure for Australia process, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, who is quoted in the AFR today, said, I'm pretty confident that the project's right and is right for investment. On what basis of rigorous assessment, other than her own confidence, did the government approve $2.2 billion of funding in the budget for the suburban rail loop project? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Henderson, the minister has not even begun her response. I would ask you to be quiet. Minister thank you. Wong. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, President, and thank you to the senator for the question. And I do recall the extent to which all of us tried to campaign for state elections in this chamber, and I'm not sure any of us are actually very successful in it, but I'm happy to take the question. And if, if my colleague, Minister Watt, who actually represents the minister whose quote uh, you are using uh, is able to assist. I'm sure he will. Uh, in relation to infrastructure projects, uh, we have said uh, that we will review infrastructure projects to better align investment with construction market capacity. We are consulting. Order. Consulting. Uh, look, uh, you know, you are in a permanent state of outrage, aren't you? A permanent Order. state of outrage. There's, there's never any light and shade with this particular senator. It's just permanently outraged. We're always right up there, aren't we? But I digress. I digress. As I said in response to the budget, as I said in response to the budget, uh, the, uh, we are aligning Order. investment with construction market capacity. We are consulting with states and territories throughout this process. This is the responsible and honest thing to do. If those opposite were honest about this, they would recognise that the government is increasing funding to infrastructure in regional Australia over the next decade. I'll repeat that. Increasing funding uh, to regional infrastructure. Uh, over the next decade, uh, but rather than simply announcing, we are ensuring uh, that we can actually deliver on what we say we will do. Uh, and in relation to the points that the senator raised in her question, I would, would say it is interesting to get a question which goes to business cases and probity from a yeah. minister who never demonstrated that, who never demonstrated that uh, in her period in government. And here we, um, you might think that's outrageous, Order. but I think the public Order. record speaks for itself. Order. Well, well, which, which part of that does, which part of that does Senator McKenzie uh, want me to, to resolve from? In relation, well, thank, uh, thank you, you Minister I'm, I'm happy Your to. time has much. expired. Um, just a moment, Senator McKenzie. Before I call you, there was so much noise uh, during the minister's response. I found it very difficult to hear. I would ask, minister, I would ask all senators to respect that the minister has the right to answer the question in silence. Um, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, given the government's documents show funding would not flow to Dan Andrews' controversial suburban rail loop project until 24-25, at the earliest 19 months away, for what reason was funding awarded in the October 22 budget, other than to suit Labor's political timelines? Yeah. Uh, order. Order. Order on my right. Order. I'm not going to call the minister until there's quiet. Senator Henderson, please. It's, we are not at a football match. We are in Senate question time, and you are to be silent to hear the response and out of respect to the person answering the question. And before I call um, the minister a response, I do remind Senator McKenzie to refer to um, people by their correct titles. So it would be Premier Andrews. Thank you, Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, I'm asked, I'm asked a... 
Really? <laughs> she can't. Can you, anyway. your, your team love it when you use um, it all the time. Uh, the, they love it. I'm asked why the government funded the project. It's called honouring an election commitment. Uh, we had an election commitment to provide $2.2 billion towards early works for suburban rail loop east, and a detailed business and investment case was released by Victoria um, last Wong. year, which demonstrated a benefit cost Senator ratio. Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. A point of order relevance, uh, Madam President. Mine went to the profiling of the project. The funding doesn't flow in your own government documents till 2024-25. You could have run it through Infrastructure Australia uh, right. processes, but Senator you announced McKenzie. it in this budget. Senator McKenzie, that question does go to why, and that's what the minister is responding to. She is being directly relevant. Please continue, Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, I was actually asked um, why we were funding it, uh, and I was explaining to the senator why we were funding it. And I'd also make the point, and she may not wish to hear the facts about the detailed business and investment case. It demonstrated a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7. That is a dollar seventy return for every dollar invested. It will still be assessed, subject to assessment by Infrastructure Australia, as is required. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you. It's nice to know it will be going through Infrastructure Australia. Minister King also to told the AFR Infrastructure Summit that if Infrastructure Australia's review of the project sees it not worth progressing, that she would personally talk to the Victorian Labor government about, and I quote her again, how they think they can make it stack up. Minister, at what point of the PM's reformation of Infrastructure Australia are we going to see ministers not intervening to make sure that projects unfit for funding are going to be persisted for until they stack up? Minister. Well, uh, I hadn't heard that quote before, uh, but if I. Well, Order. Sorry, I've been doing a few other things. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't sit around reading the quotes of every. every no, it's not that. I'm just saying, you know, I don't have every quote of a minister who I don't represent. I'm sure Senator Watt would have an excellent answer on this question. Word. I'm sure he read, he read every word. Uh, but minister word. Wong, please resume oh, really? your seat. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Madam President, as uh, Minister Wong is seeking to elicit a laughs from her side, uh, the relevance McKenzie, of my question. No, is not I'm sorry. A point of order. That is not a point of order. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Uh, Senator Watt. Um, thank you, President. I think you were going there anyway, but surely Senator Bacchetti has Wong, to uh, Senator name Watt, the point why of order. Are you on your feet? What is the point? We were Watt, about to ask, ask the point of order. I've ruled the point of order out of order. 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 Seriously, Senators. I'm going to ask Minister Wong to continue. Thank you, President. What I was going to say, from what I heard of the quote, uh, it, is, it seems an em eminently sensible position to ensure that Infrastructure Australia can properly assess uh, this important project, which uh, the, uh, the government uh, was elected with a, a commitment to uh, implement, which we are funding, which already has a business case. It seems to me an eminently sen sensible Order. position to ensure that it Order. is properly Order. Order. Eminently sensible to ensure it properly stacks up, and that's what the minister's Thank quite you, goes Minister to. Wong. Your time has expired. S uh, Senator White. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The Albanese government's proposed changes to workplace relations laws will deliver much-needed job security and wage increases after a decade of neglect by the Liberals Order. and Nationals. Order. How will the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill support small businesses to bargain with their workers, and what does this mean for workers? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you. Order. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White, who I again uh, one of the people on our side of the chamber who has a long history of standing up for the rights of workers uh, and also having formed very cooperative relationships with business uh, in her career in the union movement. And Senator White is a great example of what our government is trying to do, which is build partnerships between unions, workers and business for the benefit of the economy and for the benefit of those businesses and also those workers. 
I understand it's a foreign concept for those opposite who just thrive on conflict and want to keep us in that conflict-driven environment that we've been in for 10 years, but some of us actually want to move on. And you know what? So does small business. Let me just give you one example of the small businesses out there that are actually looking forward to the kind of multi-employer bargaining uh, that, that we are proposing to have. Now, uh, Senator Watt. I'm going to wait for silence. Order. I would ask Senators McKenzie and Henderson in particular to lower the tone of your interjections, please. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Now, on the one hand, the opposition demands examples of small businesses that support the system we're trying to bring in, and the minute you try and do it, they don't want to hear about it. And that's because the opposition are intent on keeping our country in a conflict-driven model that does not work for anyone. Ms Julie Price, the executive director of the Community Child Care Association, gave evidence to the Senate inquiry recently. She represents over 750 community not-for-profit early childhood education and care centres. She gave evidence explaining that multi-employer bargaining in Victoria had delivered above award wages for workers over a decade with the support um, of employers. What? what she what? said was that— Please resume your seat. Order, Senators, particularly those on my left. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you, Thank you President. Now, Ms Price, who represents hundreds of community-owned uh, childcare centres, made the point that the agreement they had struck across a range of enterprises covers just under 60 services in Victoria. It delivers better wages, 16 per cent above the award. Uh, and you know what? She goes on to say uh, that the centres are community-owned, they're managed by boards and volunteers, and they don't have the financial resources or the expertise in the IR to be able to negotiate an agreement themselves. This is the kind of system that small businesses can take advantage of to avoid having big HR departments and strike Thank agreements you, with their workers, White, which is what they want. Your time has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Um, Minister, it's well known that small businesses are more award-reliant. Why is it important to provide small businesses with additional support to create agreements with workers? Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White. As we say, we understand that it's a foreign concept for the opposition that employers and workers can act together cooperatively for both their benefit, but our government actually understands that. Mr Mimo Scavera, the president of the HVAC Manufacturing and Installation Association, also gave evidence to the Senate inquiry. He represents nine major employers, collectively employing Order. approximately 900 um, people. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, no, Senator McKenzie, I'm waiting until your own side is quiet. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, on relevance to the good senator's question, um, can the minister name one small business that uh, actually Senator supports McKenzie. Labor's Senator McKenzie, reforms? that is not a point of order. Thank you. Um, senator Wong. Well, President, I, the persistent point of orders which actually go to the content of substantive debate, we're very happy to have substantive debate. This is time for question time. This is real. Well, Order. This, is, this is not the ways in which points of orders have traditionally been used, used nor should be used. If the, minister, if the senator wants a debate, we can have a debate. Thank you, Minister Wong. I ruled the point of order out of order. Um, minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. And isn't it terrible to see the coalition not want to hear from employer groups? You really would have thought, you really would have thought that of all the parties, they don't, they would support employer groups, but not the ones that support multi-employer bargaining. The ones that oppose it are fine. The ones that support it are terrible. Mr. Senator Scavera Watt. said, "It's not about Senator having Watt. a race to the bottom." To put it bluntly, Senator at Watt. the moment, please resume your seat. Again, noise, please. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you. Mr Scavera said it's not about having a race to the bottom, to put it bluntly. At the moment, the major construction projects don't have any regulation in relation to pay, so you have a mixture of people on a site that will either be enterprise agreement covered, award covered or covered by whatever other means people are creating. Uh, we're hoping that through this mechanism we can have an industry agreement through multi-enterprises. That's what we're aiming Thank for, you, to Minister regulate the market. Thank you, Your time has expired. Um, Senator White, second supplementary. Minister, why is it urgent that we pass these reforms before Christmas? Minister. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Please resume. Please resume your seat. Once again, the interjections, particularly from my left, are absolutely disorderly, and I would ask you 
to be quiet so that we can all hear the minister's response. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. It is urgent that we pass these reforms before Christmas because they will be good for workers and good for small businesses. They will be good for the economy. And Senator Pocock and Senator Lambie, we all know that you have important decisions to make about this legislation in coming days, and I encourage you to think about the arguments we are putting Senator forward, McKenzie. that small businesses are putting forward, or you can decide to line up with that rabble over there who want to continue to keep Australia in conflict and low wages and low productivity. I know enough about Senator Pocock and Senator Lambie that they want to see agreements and they want to see cooperation in workplaces that deliver to businesses and workers, and that is exactly Order. what we are putting forward here. The comments that we saw given at the Senate inquiry by representatives of childcare centres, by representatives of manufacturing industries indicate um, uh, that— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Pocock. Point of order, President. Uh, if the minister could please direct his comments through the president. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. I'll order. 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 Senators on my left. Minister Watt, if you would direct your uh, contributions to the chair. Thank you, President. And, and through you, President, I say to Senator Pocock and, and Senator Lambie, take the evidence of the committee inquiry into account. We've heard from childcare representatives, we've heard from manufacturing representatives who say that multi-employer bargaining is what they want. Uh, thank it's you, good Minister. For their your time has expired. Working. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The October budget contained no immediate relief for Australians facing rising inflation and cost of living crises. Instead, the government committed to spending $2.2 billion on the suburban rail loop despite the Victorian Auditor General finding that the Victorian government, and I quote, did not demonstrate their economic rationale for the entire project and they have told us they have no plans to do so. Minister, isn't it true that Labor is supporting Dan Andrews' pet projects that don't stack up but refuses to find sensible policies that will reduce the cost of living for Victorians without driving up inflation? Uh, before I call no, the minister, not... order, order, order. I remind, I remind senators that Senator Wong. I remind senators that uh, state leaders are entitled to be addressed by their correct title, and that's the second time in a matter of minutes I've had to remind uh, senators on my left of that. Minister. Uh, thank you. And, um, I think in the best way to answer this question is to say I completely reject um, the assertions put in the question, uh, and I reject the assertion that there was no cost of living uh, relief in the budget. Uh, if you read the budget, you would read um, the investments that we are making in cheaper childcare, in renewable energy, in free TAFE, uh, as some of those investments. Also, I would say look at the. Uh, more than $32 billion in increased payments through pensions and other payments through the social security system. $32 billion, the biggest increase to assist. And the reason, Senator Henderson, I hear you yelling at me and interjecting, the reason that those payments have increased so considerably is to assist lower income households with those increased costs of living largely driven by those increases you hid before you, the change of government to the increases in energy prices. Uh, so the reference Minister, to cost of living relief— uh, Senator Henderson. I ask the senator to please direct her comments through the chair. Thank you. Uh, she is doing that, Senator Henderson. Minister, please continue. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, well, perhaps if Senator Henderson stopped interjecting, um, then we would have we wouldn't be in a position where we had to to respond to those interjections. Order. Uh, in terms of Order. infrastructure, and the Senator Van's question went to infrastructure. The infrastructure minister has gone through the infrastructure portfolio very carefully to identify projects where sensible investments can be made Order. can be made that, that meet tests like for example having a business case anywhere near the project there are some projects funded 
under your uh, government when you were in power that didn't have uh, those, that piece of work underpinning it, uh, to go through uh, to work with Infrastructure Australia, the business case that the Victorian government has done, and I know that Minister, you, Minister King is working with Infrastructure. Senator Van, first supplementary. Thank you. The Victorian Auditor General said of the suburban rail loop, and I quote, the benefit cost ratio for the project is 0.51, when calculated in line with the DTF's guidance, below even the Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office rating of 0.6 Order. to 0.7. Minister, why is the government spending $2.2 billion on a project that demonstrably will not deliver value for money but will continue to overheat in the construction sector, pushing up prices for Victorians, contributing to inflation and making the cost of living crisis worse for Victorians? Thank you, Senator Van. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, again, I reject um, the assertions put in the question to me. The suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project. We are, honouring, we are honouring our election commitment. We are doing what we said we would do. Uh, we are delivering upon that election commitment. And that Order. project will transform how Victorians move around the state and reshape the way Victoria grows. Um, and I would say, in terms of cost of living um, relief, the budget provided cost of living relief in a way that is a affordable, and responsible and doesn't add to inflation. And I think you'll see from all of the um, assessment of the budget, uh, find somebody who, um, and all of the economists and that, that have assessed the budget who said that the budget in itself does not add to inflation and cost of living relief was provided where it was affordable and uh, sustainable. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van, second supplementary. The October budget confirmed that the Albanese government was cut, cutting hospital funding in Victoria by $1.4 billion. Why is the Labor government supporting Premier Andrews, boondoggle, while at the same time making— oh, sorry, uh, uh, Premier McKenzie, Andrews' health uh, Senator crisis— Senator Van, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that remark. Uh, Madam President, um, I do withdraw calling our Premier uh, of Victoria— I do not repeat. Senate, no. Senator McKenzie, you know my rulings on these things, and I didn't think I would have to remind you not to repeat the offence. Simply withdraw the remark. I withdraw the remark. Thank you. Senator Van, please continue with your question and order on my right. Why is the Labor government supporting the member for Mulgrave's boondoggle while at the same time making his health crisis even worse by cutting funding to Victorian hospitals. Thank you, Senator Van. Minister. Uh, thank you. And um, I almost feel sorry for Senator Van being asked, uh, asked to add, ask that question, uh, because those who wrote it know very well that there is no cut to health funding in Victoria, that they know very well what has happened there. Uh, we look forward to working with the Victorian government and we look forward to a re-elected uh, Dan Senator Andrews Wong. government. Uh, after Saturday's election to deliver on these important infrastructure commitments, um, to work in partnership with them. Remember that, where you have federal and state governments working together in the interests of the nation. Uh, we look forward to that. We look forward to continuing that, delivering on our election commitments, working with the Victorian government on infrastructure and, importantly, on health to make sure that Australians have the health care system and the infrastructure they deserve from governments that are mature enough and responsible enough to work together. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. President, my question is for the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Murray Watt. Minister Watt. Right now in Victoria, the Andrews government is logging four MCGs worth of native forest every day. The Victorian government pledged to end native forest logging by 2030 and protect 9,000 hectares of old growth forests. But a damning expose by the ABC last week found that the state owned logging operator Vic Forests is continuing to log old growth forests that were marked for protection. And this is on top of two court findings in the last month that found that Vic forests were illegally logging forests that was home to two threatened species, greater gliders and tree g-bungs. Minister, what is the federal government and you as minister doing 
to ensure that Victoria's native forests are actually being protected. Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. And thank uh, you. Senator yeah, Watt. it sort Senator, of feels like it's Victorian Senator, election week Senator this week, doesn't it? Please resume your seat. I would ask all senators, in particular Senator Scar and Senator Thorpe, to be quiet while the minister uh, answers the question. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And yes, it, clearly it's Victorian Election Week, and clearly there's a couple of parties who are scrambling for votes rather than getting on with the job of governing, which is what we are doing, and what uh, what the Andrews government is doing in Victoria right now. Uh, now, I, I, I have met with Senator Rice about forestry issues, and I understand that these are things that you um, uh, care about very sincerely. And as I have explained to Senator Rice. Uh, what our, the Albanese Labor government does support a sustainable forestry industry. We respect the fact that there are some states who have made decisions about phasing out native forestry, others have not. Uh, the reality is that our country is in a position at the moment with a massive timber shortage uh, and, and potentially other related shortages. And there are other, other parts of the country who, who have chosen uh, to continue with native forestry at the moment, including Tasmania, and that is something that we support. That is their right to do that. Uh, but, uh, but, of course, Senator Rice is well aware um, that in, in states like Victoria we have a regional forestry agreement process underway, uh, which, 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 le which leaves a lot of the management of those forestries to states. There's obviously been litigation about these matters recently, with courts having things to say about that, and I know the Victorian government is taking those decisions seriously. Um, but what the, what the Albanese government is doing is trying to strike a balance between the need for a forestry industry to provide the wood and timber and paper products that we need, Senator while also McKenzie. making sure that we are protecting the environment. That's why we went to the election with a big commitment to expand the plantation estate. Uh, in, in Australia and, and plant Senator more trees Wilson. through plantations to provide that timber. But the reality is uh, that in many, many parts of the country at the moment, the native forestry industry plays an important role in meeting that supply, and we support the people who work at that industry. So we think that that's a balanced approach, uh, and we think that that's the one that Australians want to see. Uh, Senator Rice, first supplementary. Minister, when it comes to protecting the critically endangered ecosystem of mountain ash forests, scientists tell us that 2030 is way too late. They will be pretty much logged out by then. At the recent climate conference, Australia joined the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership to increase action towards last year's COP commitment to strengthen our efforts to conserve forests and accelerate their restoration. How are you going to bring Victoria into line so we can deliver on this international commitment? Will you amend the EPBC Act to ensure that that's Thank you, the case? Senator Rice. Your time has expired. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Rice. As Senator Rice is well aware, the way the RFA system, the Regional Forest Agreement system, works is that it essentially displaces the EPBC in relation to forestry uh, endeavours and has its own system of managing the environmental needs uh, of, those, of those forests. Uh, we, and that is a system that we continue to support. Senator Rice is all, also aware that the Victorian government has made decisions about the future of its native forests. As I say, we respect the, their right to make those decisions, but we do support the ongoing uh, efforts in other parts of the country to, to pursue native forestry, including in Tasmania, uh, which is what they've chosen to do. Uh, we are trying, as I say, to strike a balanced approach which meets the forestry needs and the timber needs of our country, supports the workers in those regional communities, while also maintaining environmental protections. Uh, Senator Rice asked about the EP EPBC. Again, she would be well aware that the EPBC and the Samuels Review is currently being considered by the government, and we'll have more to say about that before too long. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. A week after COP27, and amongst record-breaking climate-fueled floods across the country, there's be never been a more important time for climate action. A Victorian Forest Alliance report found that native forest logging in Victoria emits around 3 million tonnes of carbon per year, and that's the equivalent of 700,000 calves. What's the federal government doing to ensure native forests in Victoria are protected and that native forest logging isn't worsening our climate crisis? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Um, well, again, if Senator Rice may have noticed that only last week at the COP conference, Australia joined 25 other nations in signing up to the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership. Um, and again, that is another demonstration of our, uh, our determination to ensure that forestry is conducted 
uh, in an environmentally sustainable manner. That is the intent of the RFAs. That is the Senator intent um, of the policies that we've pursued. Uh, if, if particular forestry operations don't do the right thing, then they, that they will suffer the consequences of that. And that's what we've seen as a result of some of that litigation at the moment. Uh, but we are not going to stray beyond our responsibilities in the forestry space. Um, these are joint exercises between the federal and the state government. And as I say, look at our election commitments, look at our budget, which delivered over $200 million towards forestry, in particular plantation timber, while also making sure that we're providing workers with training and increasing the efficiency of native forestry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please inform the Senate how women will benefit from the reforms in the Secure Jobs and Better Pay Bill? Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Pratt, and um, I thank you for the question and for your uh, interest, uh, long-standing interest in gender equality and achieving gender equality in this country. The Secure Job Better Pay Bill will deliver on uh, the Albanese government's commitment to a fairer workplace relations system, which provides Australians with job security, gender equality and sustainable wage growth. For nearly a decade, wages were kept low as a deliberate design feature of the f previous government's management of the economy. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will take long overdue steps to promote gender equality and promote pay and secure work for women. The bill puts gender equality at the heart of the Fair Work system by making gender equality and job security objects of the Fair Work Act. It will make it easier for working women in undervalued industries to win a pay equity claim before the Commission by removing the need to find a male comparator and by making clear that sex discrimination is not necessary to establish that work has been undervalued. The bill will establish a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel in the Fair Work Commission, supported by $20 million in funding from the October bu budget. It will provide greater access for bargaining for lower paid and feminised sectors through the supported bargaining stream. It will increase pay transparency by pro prohibiting pay secrecy clauses and strengthen access to flexible working arrangements so families can better share and manage their caring responsibilities. And where the previous government refused to act, this bill will prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, a recommendation of the Respect at Work report. Uh, President, women have waited far too long for their work to be properly valued, to get better access to flexible work and to feel safe and respected at Thank work. You, Minister. They the should not have to wait has any expired. longer. Senator Pratt's first can supplementary. The... <coughs> Can the minister outline how multi-employer bargaining will help close the gender pay gap? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the question because the gender pay gap continues to sit at 14.1 per cent. I think all of us on this side of the chamber agree that that is unacceptable, that women go to work, they work hard and they earn less than uh, men in the workplace. We must address the gender pay gap Senator if we're going to have a gender equal Australia. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will provide greater access to bargaining for low paid, highly feminised sectors such as the community sector, cleaning and early childhood education and care. Employees on enterprise agreements earn on average more than employees on awards. For example, in the female dominated health care and social assistance industry, employees on awards are earning 19 per cent less in average hourly earnings than employees on collective agreements. We must pass these laws so we can improve uh, the pay rates for women in these industries. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Can the minister outline how these reforms align with the government's broader efforts to advance gender equality? Thank you, Senator Pratt, Minister. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Senator Pratt. And yes, I can. The reforms are just one aspect of this government's ambition for Australia to be a leader on gender equality. Our budget put gender equality front and centre, investing over $7 billion in initiatives that will drive gender equality in this country. We are modernising paid parental leave and investing in cheaper childcare. We introduced paid domestic violence leave. We supported wage increases for workers on minimum wages and in aged care. 
We are taking action to strengthen gender pay reporting. We will implement all recommendations of the Respect at Work report, and we will keep the focus on gender equality through a national strategy to achieve uh, gender equality, the work which has started uh, now and will be finished in the first half of next year. We also have the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, led by Sam Melston and uh, 12 other amazing women who are putting their shoulder to the wheel to make sure that we uh, can respond to the work that they do uh, on assisting us to uh, address uh, economic inequality you, for women. Senator Pocock. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Minister Farrell. Australians rightly celebrate when we lead the world. We are rightly proud when we punch above our weight on the world stage in many things. But leading the world in gambling losses on a per capita basis is not something to celebrate. Australians lose some $25 billion every year gambling. Does the government agree that we need strong and decisive action to protect children and vulnerable people from the harmful effects of gambling and gambling advertising? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pocock for his question and his courtesy in uh, giving us some advance uh, notice uh, of that uh, question. Um, look, you rightly, um, uh, you rightly uh, set out the um, uh, amount that uh, Australians uh, lose um, each year uh, through, uh, uh, through gambling, and uh, uh, that obviously is a very significant, uh, significant amount of money. Um, the government uh, is concerned um, about uh, the impact of, uh, of gambling uh, on, uh, on children, and uh, we've done uh, a number of things since uh, coming to um, uh, government uh, in this uh, respect. Um, uh, the government uh, recently established a, a parliamentary uh, inquiry into uh, gambling and uh, its uh, impact on uh, uh, gambling harm. Um, one of the uh, key focus areas of the uh, parliamentary inquiry is considering the effectiveness of current gambling uh, advertising restrictions, particularly on limiting uh, children's exposure uh, to gambling products and services including through uh, social uh, media. I am aware of uh, <coughs> gambling-like games, for instance, the video games that include uh, loot boxes and social uh, gaming, and they're of concern to uh, many, cons uh, many uh, com uh, community members, um, and uh, work is being done <coughs> um, on this issue and uh, obviously will be part of the focus of the parliamentary inquiry that uh, I referred to uh, earlier. The Office of uh, the eSafety Commissioner has a guide on its website for parents about gaming, including those with gambling-like uh, elements. Thank you, Minister. Elements. Your time has expired. <coughs> Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister. Uh, an ABC investigation last year revealed that the gambling industry has donated $80 million to polit political parties over the last 22 years. Given what we know about uh, gambling and its effect on society, does the minister believe it is still appropriate for any political party to accept donations from industries that make profit from gambling, given the effect on society? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. And again, thank uh, the uh, Senator uh, Pocock for his, uh, his question and uh, the uh, information that he has uh, provided to uh, the Senate. Um, look. Um, the uh, Labor Party is very seriously interested in uh, the reform of the, uh, the electoral uh, process. Um, and uh, of course, we have uh, <coughs> sent uh, a number of recommendations to the uh, parliamentary committee that looks after um, uh, the issue of uh, electoral funding, funding, the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Electoral uh, Matters. Um, some of the things that uh, I have um, proposed as the minister responsible in that area have been things like um, reducing the, uh, the uh, threshold levels for the disclosure of, um, uh, of donations. So at the moment, <coughs> the figure is. The Thank figure you, minister. Is, the Your figure time is... has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Order. Thank Order. you, President. Thank you, Minister. 
how, how will the government ensure that no child is subjected to ga gambling advertising, whether that's on social media or in the broadcasting of live sports events? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. But Walsh was gaming. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Again, thank uh, uh, Senator Pocock for his uh, concern uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, I actually didn't sort of finish my previous uh, answer, unfortunately. And I'll just say that um, uh, one of the things that we're proposing to do is, in that space is, is uh, uh, real-time disclosure of, uh, of donations. Um, the issue that you raise about uh, harm on children, um, we have set up um, an inquiry, um, as I mentioned uh, in one of my earlier answers, uh, Senator Pocock, um, and I would hope that yourself and other members of the uh, Senate who have got an interest uh, in this area um, will take the opportunity of that inquiry um, to bring the sorts of issues that uh, you have uh, quite rightly uh, raised uh, here today. Um, bring that to the, uh, the committee so that, so that that committee uh, can Senator look at Thorpe. these issues uh, and you, deal Minister. with them Your in a sensible fashion. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I would ask that you not uh, continue with those interjections. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Minister, yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Cash, you said, and I quote, we are dealing with an inflation challenge at the moment and no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation." End quote. Can you confirm it's the government's position that you don't expect wages uh, to grow uh, at the pace of inflation? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, well, I, the point I was making yesterday, and I, I thank um, the senator for the question, was that we don't expect wages to grow at the rate of inflation as it currently is now. You'll see from the budget papers, I think it's in the 24-25 financial year, that we are expecting wages uh, to move ahead of inflation. Um, but what we, well, well, that is what the budget papers say. Um, but I was, I was responding to a question uh, about uh, wages moving. Well. What I was responding to was wages moving at the rate of inflation as, inf as inflation currently is. Uh, and I think you wouldn't find anybody, including on your side, that would be arguing for wage increases uh, in the order of 8 per cent. I wouldn't imagine, because that will cause other problems uh, that we are trying to avoid. Wages at the moment are not impacting on inflation. Inflation is being uh, largely contributed to, or the increase in inflation is down to energy costs caused by the, way, uh, the war in Ukraine and by uh, some of those supply chain issues, shortages that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so we are taking a responsible position in relation to wages. We want to get wages moving. That's why we have the industrial relations bill before the parliament. We want to see an end of uh, the wage stagnation decade that was overseen by the former government. Uh, we've made no secret that we want to deal with wage inequality in low-paid, feminised industries. Uh, and the budget papers outline clearly the wage forecasts over the forward estimates that they will remain below inflation for the first two years and then they will gradually uh, increase to a point where they just uh, increase above inflation Thank in that you, third year. Senator Fawcett, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. The Australian public are also dealing with the reality of the current situation where they are seeing costs going up and they will recall the promise made before the election this year, on the 11th of May, by the now Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, who said, and I quote, Labor wants to make sure that wages keep pace with the cost of living, end quote. So can you confirm, Minister, that Labor has abandoned that promise to the Australian people made before Thank the election you, Senator Fawcett, to keep pace with the cost of living? Thank you. And I think you'll see from our budget papers we do want uh, workers to get wage, uh, wage increases that help them deal with the cost of living. No, so that, uh, the uh, senator is incorrect when he asserts that. There has been no change in position from this government. We are dealing with an inflation problem in this country right now, though, in case anyone over there hadn't noticed. If you haven't noticed, 
Right, you've noticed, have you? Okay. Order. All right. Order. Well, just the reality here is that we are trying to deal with the inflation challenge and we are in a sensible and responsible way dealing with the after effects of a decade of wage stagnation. You are the party of wage stagnation. So the nerve of you to stand up and challenge us uh, on our Minister, position to get wages moving is seat. a bit Senator Henderson. Uh, um, thank you, Madam President. Once and again, I would draw uh, the minister's attention to the fact that she needs to make her comments through the chair. Uh, thank I you. believe the minister is mostly making her comments to the chair. Uh, I would also ask those on my left to uh, stop calling out. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And in fact, in the last six months since we uh, came into government, we have done a number of things, and I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to, to continue on this, including supporting increases to the minimum thank wage you, that Minister. you never Your did. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, second supplementary. Thank you, President. I again go to the Australian public's expectation there will be consistency before and after the election. On the 20th of May, the now Prime Minister said, and I quote, it's not bad luck, it's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living, end quote. Uh, Minister, will you now also label this situation your bad policy that wages are not keeping up with inflation rather than blaming circumstances? Thank you, Senator uh, Fawcett. Minister. That's right. Don't deal with the, don't deal with the economic uh, reality right now. But I would say, in response to that question, vote for the Industrial Relations Bill. Vote for it. That's the single biggest thing you could do right now to help us get Order. wages moving. Order. That's what you should do. You've overseen a decade of wage stagnation. You're now saying you want Order. to see wages keep up with the cost of living. Well, support with us. Walk with us. Stop being the party of work choices. Stop being the party that want to keep wages down. Remember that. Stop, stop wanting to make uh, childcare, aged care workers, those on minimum wage, not get a decent pay rise. Stop arguing about things. Like when in government you had that section about uh, the importance of low-paid work, a whole section in your submission to the Fair Work Commission. Yeah, That's your wages. record. We're yeah, trying to get wages, wages moving. We proudly stand wages. next to working people to argue for that and join with us and support the legislation. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. Minister, the government secure jobs better pay bill abolishes the Australian Building and Construction Commission. What problems are solved by specifically abolishing the ABCC that aren't actually caused by the code it is meant to enforce, which your government has already acted on? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Lambie would be well aware that. For a number of years uh, leading into the last election, it was Labor's clear policy to abolish the ABCC. And that was because uh, it had completely failed workers in the building industry and firms in the building industry as well. Um, Senator Lambie, or through, through the President, Senator Lambie, uh, um, if you haven't already received, seen these statistics, I'm happy to show you the figures that show that the entire time the ABCC was in existence, productivity on building sites actually fell. It went backwards. So for all the claims that were made that it was going to be the solution to productivity and drive the industry forward, the facts actually show that the industry went backwards in productivity. Uh, and that's let alone um, the gross waste of taxpayers' money that we saw under the ABCC pursuing trivial matters through the courts. And we just we just went through it again at estimates oh, yeah. recently. We just went through it again at estimates recently about the legal expenditure. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Order. I remind those on my left, this is Senator Lambie's question. She has the right to hear the answer in silence. As you're well aware, everyone in this chamber is aware, the crossbenchers do not get the same opportunity as the major parties to ask questions. And I would ask those to be courteous and allow Senator Lambie to hear the answer in silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, President and, and Senator Lambie, I can assure you that this government does take uh, workplace conduct, whether it be from workers, from businesses, from, from unions, very seriously. And that's why 
under the system that we're proposing, the Fair Work Ombudsman uh, will have a range of powers to take action where that's warranted. I guess our fundamental point is that we don't think that different workers should be treated differently. We should have one regulator of conduct on work sites, uh, and that is the Fair Work Ombudsman. We don't need uh, an additional body for one industry that pursues workers and pursues unions and leaves employers alone when we all know uh, that in the building industry there are rogue employers as well. The ABCC never did anything about that. It did very little to recover underpayments to workers, a very serious issue, uh, and we think the Fair Work Ombudsman is the appropriate place to, to do that work. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I understand that the Labor Party and the union movement doesn't like the fact that the ABCC has busy, busied itself policing flags and stickers. I agree. Regulators shouldn't be distracted by small beer infringements like that. But you can fix that with a tighter building code. The CFMMEU has made it clear it will continue to breach laws it does not agree with. That's not restricted to stickers and flags. Does your government not believe in the need for a building code at all? Thank you, Senator Lambie. And Minister Watt, I'll just remind you to make your remarks to the chair. Through the chair, Please. certainly. Um, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, President, the, the building code, again, uh, was another example of this government having a very one-sided, uh, the former government having a very one-sided attitude uh, towards conduct on building sites. Uh, the building code was a, a, was a part of the arsenal of the ABCC, which was used to crack down on unions and workers and do nothing about the abuse of workers and unions on construction sites. What we're in favour of is a balanced approach from a regulator that applies across all industries, so that whether you're a hospitality worker or a childcare worker or a, or a truckie, Senator Stirl, or a construction worker, I know, I know truckies always behave. Um, I remember that from my days representing the TWU. Um, the, um, but whatever, whatever industry it is, people deserve to be treated equally. Uh, and the building, uh, the building code was another part of that arsenal, and that's why we've repealed it. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Madam President, the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill transfers some of the power from the OBCC to the Fair Work Ombudsman, but doesn't transfer all of its budget. It's being asked to do more without the money to do it. Something's got to give here. What safeguards will you put in place so the Fair Work Ombudsman doesn't have to choose between its core business like policing wage theft and policing the industry? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, President, and thanks again, Senator Lambie. Again, I remember from the estimates uh, hearings which we recently conducted, uh, evidence was given about a, a number of positions from the ABCC moving across to the Fair Work, work Ombudsman. Um, so they are being given extra resources to pursue whether it be employers, unions, workers who are doing the wrong thing on work sites. Uh, so I'm very confident that the Fair Work Ombudsman does have the resources to pick up some of those roles that the ABCC previously uh, played. Um, what we're about is making sure um, that important things that are actually reasonable in a workplace setting get pursued by the Fair Work Ombudsman, and all the nonsense and politicisation that the ABCC was given taxpayers' funding for, that is what is going to end. And I think that's what, us, that's what people voted for. We could not have been clearer in the lead-up to the election that we were going to abolish the ABCC. Um, we feel that we've got a mandate to implement that reform now, along with all the other reforms that we've, we're planning to implement. Um, and I'm out of time. Thank you, Minister. What, Senator Green? Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the Minister update the Senate on developments in the human rights situation in Iran overnight and the response by Iranians themselves? Minister. Thank you um, to Senator Green. I thank her for uh, her interest in this matter and for her, her solidarity with the women and men of Iran who have been standing against uh, the repressive and violent actions of the regime. And I acknowledge uh, that that is uh, a position shared by, uh, I hope, all uh, in this chamber, but certainly uh, many across the chamber have been also raising their voices. I know that people would have been following events in Iran closely. Uh, and I think all of us would have been moved by the image overnight of the Iranian football team standing silent during their, the Iranian regime's anthem. And this was a courageous act, a courageous act. By refusing to, and by refusing to sing the anthem, they're actually joining a chorus. 
joining a chorus in Iran and around the world that has grown steadily louder over the last two months. And while the Iranian soccer team staged their protests, protests within Iran continued, especially in majority Kurdish areas. And so did the regime's brutal response. That response included attacking protesters using machine guns mounted on vehicles and even using drones, missiles, and the death toll now runs well into the hundreds. We all know that this started on September 16th with the death of Masa Amini, whose Kurdish name was Jinnah. Uh, her unexplained death in the custody of the so-called morality police was a spark that lit a flame of protest that has spread across Iran and to the streets of cities around the world, including Australia. Protest activity has make it, make, taken many forms, street demonstrations, women and girls removing their hijabs with others also cutting off their hair. In solidarity with protesters, Iranian shopkeepers, factory workers and employees in the oil and petrochemical sectors have participated in strikes, and we saw Iranian archer Parmida Ghassimi remove her hijab in a sign Thank of solidarity you, during an award fine. ceremony in Texas. Senator Greens, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how has the government responded to these developments overnight? Thank you, Senator Green, Minister. Thank you. With with new reports of violence and retaliation against those expressing their right to protest, this morning the Australian government again called in Iran's chargé d'affaires, and I welcomed the opposition's meeting with the chargé a few weeks ago. It is important that Australia speaks with one voice in conveying the abhorrence of these events. And as Iranian authorities have brutally cracked down on protesters, this country has joined in the international condemnation. We have made a number of international in interventions, including supporting the convening of a special session of the Human Rights Council on the situation in Iran, which will take place this week. We provided early co-sponsorship of a resolution calling for a fact-finding mission, and we will advocate intensively to build support for it. Just as the Iranian representative was left in no doubt, the Senate should be clear of this government's resolve to continue working with others to build pressure on the regime to cease its brutal campaign against its own thank citizens. You, um, Senator Green, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. What can the government say to Australians who are concerned about reports of harassment and foreign interference by the Iranian regime? Minister. Uh, uh, I certainly am, and I have no doubt that all senators would be deeply concerned with the reports of Australians here in Australia being harassed for their participation in protests and the reported threats made against their families in Iran. You see, the, of course, the right to peaceful protest is at the heart of Australia's democracy. The, our concerns were relayed in no uncertain terms to the Iranian charge d'affaires this morning, and the Department of Home Affairs Counter Foreign Interference Coordination Centre is working with the community to conduct target engagement in for, on foreign interference. My message to anyone involved in such activities is this: Australia's laws on foreign uh, interference are unequivocal. Allegations of foreign interference are investigated and we will prosecute if appropriate. We will defend our democracy and people's right to protest and express their views within Australia just as we stand up for the rights of those to do so you, elsewhere. Your time is six, five. Uh, Senator Dunning. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Wong. And I refer to reports in The Australian today revealing that Ms Plibersek's decision on 4 November to review 18 previous ministerial approvals of coal and gas projects may cost 174,000 Australians their jobs and cause the loss of $100 billion worth of investment in our country. Has the government, modelling, has, has the government done any modelling on the economic and social impacts of these decisions? And if so, what does the modelling actually say? Thank you, Senator Daniam. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question, uh, Senator Daniam. I, I infer from the question, uh, and I don't have the detailed information before me. I may have at any point in this answer and, um, uh, that this is a review on, in the context of Ms. Plibersek's statutory role. Uh, as such, uh, I wouldn't be responding to uh, assertions by others about what might or might occur, but not, might not occur in the context of that review, and obviously the government wouldn't be in a position of modelling hypotheticals. 
Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Given the decision to review these uh, projects has come about because of legal action of Environmental Justice Australia, a group set to benefit from the recent budget in a share of nearly $10 million of government funding to continue to appeal coal and gas projects, will the government review its decision to hand taxpayers' money to organisations jeopardising jobs and projects helping to supply our energy? Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister Wong. Did, she, did he actually say who they were? Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you actually said the name of the entity, uh, but I would make the point that um, we live in a country where there is the rule of law uh, and funding entities or people uh, to, uh, who then may use their rights under the rule of law and exercise them. Uh, that is what happens in a democracy which respects the rule of law. Senator Dunningham, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. I've got no issue with the rule of law, but I do have an issue with taxpayers' money being used this way. How can the government honestly tell Australians it is for lower power prices and more Australian jobs when it is actually funding groups engaged in green lawfare, jeopardising much-needed jobs and, of course, projects that supply our energy? Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister. I, I think, if, we, if I may say, Senator Dunningham, and I understand why he's asking the question, there were a lot of non secretaries there. Uh, the the uh, government has, um, uh, will apply uh, uh, its approach to environmental approvals under the law which exists, which is the same law as was applied under you. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't be commenting on any projects currently under assessment uh, by the minister uh, now or in the future. And with that, if I may, I'd ask that further questions be placed on notice. And I would also ask, perhaps if we could, order. Uh, if I could seek leave to make a short statement in relation to. Um, the earthquake in West Java and an, and an earthquake in Solomon Islands. Islands. I thank the Senate and I thank my colleague Senator Birmingham for uh, permitting us to do this. Can I start by saying the Australian government extends its deepest condolences to our neighbours in Indonesia following this, morning, this morning's magnitude 5.6 earthquake in West Java. It is clear there has been substantial loss of life and property. And the thoughts of all of us are with those killed and injured and their loved ones. I have been in touch this morning with my Indonesian counterpart, Eva Retno, uh, and the Australia stands ready to assist our Indonesian friends at this time. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is not currently aware of any Australians impacted. In the past two hours, uh, we have also been informed of a, informed of a magnitude 7 uh, on the Richter scale earthquake off the coast of the Solomon Islands. The situation is unfolding. I am advised that all Australian government personnel are safe and accounted for. DFAT is seeking to confirm the safety of other Australians in the Solomons and their families. There has been some minor damage to an annex building of Australia's High Commission. Staff are also moved to, a higher gra to higher ground in response to the tsunami warning that was issued. I am informed that the warning has now passed and that the High Commission remains operational. And I thank all those at the post for their work. An Australian member of the Solomon Islands Assistance Force has been deployed to National Disaster Management Office to assist in coordination. We are a steadfast friend and partner to Solomon Islands and we stand ready to support the Solomon, government's, the Solomon Islands government response and I have expressed that uh, to Minister Manelli. Can I say that anyone with concerns for any Australians uh, in either West Java or Solomon Islands can contact the Consular Emergency Centre on 1300 555 135 in Australia or plus 6262613305 outside Australia. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. Uh, President, uh, human tragedies and natural disasters remind us all that we live amongst a community of nations that is underpinned ultimately by a common sense of humanity. And within our region, uh, the nations who we count as friends and partners are ones who we stand with during such times of difficulty. And we are aware that at least 162 individuals have lost their lives in the town of Tianjur, West Java, in Indonesia, following the earthquake there, many others injured and missing, families, of course, torn apart, devastated and shattered, uh, and a community facing huge disruption and enormous rebuild. As Senator Wong has indicated, and I thank her for foreshadowing these remarks, more recently an earthquake in Solomon Islands, a situation still unfolding, but again a community facing uncertainty, including uh, from the potential threat of tsunami. 
Uh, these are all difficult times for the communities involved. The opposition joins the government in expressing our condolences to those who have lost loved ones, our full support uh, to Indonesia and to the Solomon Islands uh, as they deal with these difficulties. We extend also our support uh, to the DFAT officers and consular staff who will be working uh, with uh, people during these difficult times and also to the relief teams who no doubt have work to come and extend full bipartisanship in terms of any response that the government provides in support for Indonesia or the Solomon Islands. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Yeah. Senator Waters. Thank you. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Uh, leave is granted, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. I would like to join on behalf of the Australian Greens and extend our sympathies to those in West Java and uh, let the folk of uh, the Solomons know we are thinking of them. Uh, as, as in difficult times like this, Australia rises to the challenge, and I hope that our government um, will see some Australians out there to help very soon. And again, we are thinking of those in our region suffering right now. Thank you, Senator Waters. Just a moment, Senator Colbeck, I'll just uh, get the deputy to come forward. Can I ask senators to please leave the chamber quietly before I give the call to Senator Colbeck? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of questions from coalition senators today to government ministers during question time. Mr. President, what the Australian people are seeing six months into the term of this new government is that what was said before the election doesn't necessarily apply after the election, but also how the Labor Party will continue to cynically and politically use their governance in relation to their relationships with the states. We've heard in relation to the Ring Road project Ring Road? Ring, Road. Ring Road project in and suburban rail in, in, in Victoria, where the allocation of $2.2 billion to that particular project when the Victorian Auditor General questions its viability continues to be there. And quite extraordinary that the current minister, Minister King, says that if it doesn't stack up through the Infrastructure Australia process, they'll just send it back until it does stack up. Now, how is that process? How is that good process? When Tasmania asked for some support for, for a stadium to support the AFL licence that's uh, coming our way, which is great news, the Prime Minister said that he wanted to see a business plan. When New South Wales was looking for support for infrastructure projects, there were significant cuts to infrastructure projects in New South Wales, although they were rephased out beyond the budget estimates. But when Victoria wants a project to suit its election timeline, even though the project has questionable economics, $2.2 billion of Australian taxpayers' money is funnelled into that in support of it, Mr. President. So there's, that, there's money funnelled into that, Mr. President. So while Tasmania wants to see a stadium built, to support an AFL side, that's too bad. But to suit the political purposes of the, new, of the Victorian Brown, Labor can't, Party can't for their can't election campaign, $2.2 .2 billion can be found, Mr. President. And we're seeing that in relation to cost of living, Mr. President. Before the election, no end of government or now government ministers, then opposition ministers, were out there in the public arena talking about how they would be working to support Australians with cost of living. In fact, the now Treasurer said on Sky Agenda on the 1st of May, that means under Labor you'll have a government which cares about cost of living and has plans to deal with it. Well, Mr President, what we're actually seeing is that there was no plan, there is no plan, 
Uh, and that's being demonstrated by the cost of living pressures that we're seeing now. The budget admits that electricity prices will go up by an excess of 50 per cent. The gas prices will go up by an excess of 35 per cent. Australians are coming to realise that they were sold a pup before the election with all the commitments that they were made around cost of living. In fact, as the opposition leader said in his address and reply to the budget, everything's going up except your wages. And the government's now admitting at that. They're crab walking away from all of their promises. They're just seeking to redefine their promises, or they're doing what they've done all along, is to blame somebody else. It's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's problem. But what's clear, Mr President, uh, Deputy President, what's very, very clear is that Labor don't have a plan. They never had a plan, despite saying dozens and dozens of times in the lead-up to the election that they did. But what Australians are realising now that just because they said it doesn't mean it was so. Doesn't mean it was so. And so the cost of living continues to go up, the cost of your gas and electricity bills are continuing to grow up, your tax payments are going up, government spending's going up, and real wages are forecast to go down. This government made commitment after commitment after commitment to support Australians. They said they would be with them all the way. They would be beside Australians in dealing with the challenges of cost of living, uh, and they would support Australians to do that. They would support Australians in that risk. But what has become very apparent, Mr President, what has become, Deputy President, what has become very apparent is that Australians are now on their own. Labor has no answers. It's crab working away from its commitments. And Australians are going to have to deal with these problems on their own. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Deputy President. Uh, look, I, it, it's very clear from the questions asked by the opposition and, and even the Greens today that there's a Victorian election on the horizon and there's a focus from those parties. But on this side of the chamber, we are, we are focused on delivering for Australians cost of living relief and higher wages, and that is what we are getting on with this week in Parliament. Uh, look, we certainly have a desire to work with state governments, and we know from the answers given from our ministers today that we are really keen to make sure that no matter which state we're talking about, we are working with states to deliver infrastructure projects. Foreign concept to those over there who made a sport out of um, picking sides with state governments and, and fighting state governments in the last term. Uh, but we are interested in working together to deliver jobs and to deliver infrastructure. Now, it's pretty rich for those opposite to come in here and talk about infrastructure funding and decision making because we know that they are the party of the colour coded spreadsheets, whether it's car park rorts, safety rorts building rorts, sports rorts. There wasn't a fund that the former government didn't try to rort and use taxpayers' money as Liberal Party money. So we're not going to sit here and cop from the other side uh, debate about funding and decisions on f infrastructure funding. We are delivering our election commitments and we are going to be funding infrastructure and delivering integrity to infrastructure funding, funding projects that deliver value for money and deliver jobs for Australians. In Queensland alone, can I tell the Senate, we are delivering $18.5 billion in infrastructure funding. And before those over there uh, protest about the delivery of that funding, can I say that over half of that investment is in regional Queensland. I couldn't be prouder of the infrastructure commitments that we are delivering. And we're doing that in conjunction with the state government because we're working together in most places, all three levels of government, to deliver these projects. But those on the opposite side of the chamber today come in here and accuse our government of walking away from promises on cost of living relief. And can I assure you we are not doing that at all? We are delivering cost of living relief, whether it's cheaper childcare or cheaper medicines. But more importantly, we are also working very hard to deliver real pay rises to hard-working Australians. This is the party over there coming here lecturing us about wage growth in high inflation when we know that the Liberal National Party were the party of low wages, literally in a submission to the Fair Work Commission, argued the benefit of keeping wages low for low-wage workers. They had, they had a deliberate design feature 
in their approach to wage growth that tried to keep wages low. And it worked. Like, <laughs> the facts speak for themselves. After 10 years, we saw stagnant wages and low wages that didn't keep up with the cost of living. Stagnant wages have an impact on, on everyday cost of living, on families, on the food that they can put on the table, but they also have an impact on our economy. There's a reason that the economy went backwards under this mob, and it's because they refuse to understand that lifting wages lifters, lifts the economy. We've got a broken bargaining system, and uh, it is clear from every side of this debate, whether it's workers, whether it's unions, whether it is businesses, and it's really hard for those over there to hear those, those quotes from small and large businesses who acknowledge that the bargaining system is broken and it needs to be fixed. So can I assure those opposite who have raised concerns in their questions today and hopefully will raise them in their taking note speeches that if you are concerned about the wages of Australia's lowest paid workers and making sure that people can keep up with the cost of living, there's a very simple thing that you can do this week in Parliament or next. You can come in here and you can vote for our secure jobs and better pay bill because it is a bill that will deliver a fairer system, better wages and a better bargaining system. If you want to do that, you can join us in, in supporting workers, in supporting childcare workers, aged care workers, workers throughout the economy who you stood there and thanked during the pandemic for all the hard work that they did. Now you've got a chance to thank them to make sure that they have a pay rise that delivers on cost of living. You, you can Senator do that Green. next week in the Senate. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Aki. Um, sorry, Deputy President. Um, the questions we heard today in the chamber and the answers around the funding of the $2.2 billion suburban rail loop. Now, it was my first estimates. I'm new here. And I learned about this phrase of reprofiling of budgets and money and what we're going to put. So we're taking on a loop. It's <laughs> my first lesson. So what we're looking at is that money in the budget we have to take on faith. It's not printed. It's not written. It's there. It's like a Bitcoin transaction. It is on faith and it can disappear just as quickly. It can leave thousands of people without their jobs, thousands of people without their money, and this is what we're finding. But we do find this $2.2 billion in the budget for 24-25, and we see $1.4 billion coming from health. Now, I go to the $2.2 billion, and in the question we said the Victorian Auditor General found that the Victorian government did not demonstrate the economic rationale for the entire project, and they have told us they have no plans to do so. Now let's not think that $2.2 billion builds a suburban rail loop. It's up to $130 billion to build a suburban rail loop. What is that $2.2 billion for? Is that the down payment on a loan fee for Belton Road? Is that what it is? is what does this do in 24-25? We saw that on the Newcastle-Sydney high, higher speed rail promise of the government, where they put $500 million towards establishing a planning committee and buying property. But no rails will be laid, no sleepers will be laid, no trains will be bought. Again, it is just money for nothing. People won't get from Newcastle to Sydney faster, people won't get around Melbourne faster, but we've put that money there to hang the hope out and the profiling will take care of the rest. When we talk about prices raising and cost of living, we always hear about the Ukraine situation and the price of gas. We hear the price of fuel, we hear the price of coal. But the majority of Australian coal-fired power plants have fixed-term contracts on their coal at about $100 a tonne. They haven't raised. A coal truck doesn't go via the mine, via Ukraine, via the Donbass, back to Australia to a coal-fired power station to produce it. Our gas doesn't get shipped overseas via the Caucasus back to Australia. And no wind turbine, no solar panel runs its wiring through the Ukraine back to Australia. They have put price pressure, but that's not to cover all the cost of living. That is domestic promises and a lack of policy that is driving these people's costs higher. And when you look at the opportunity cost of all this, that $2.2 billion again could have gone to ease this thing. I'm sure the rigorous processes that this government claims were on that $2.2 billion for the suburban rail loop 
took a shorter period than it takes to get an ambulance in Melbourne nowadays. People spend hours. It was last night talking about a child that waited an hour and a half and put on hold while they waited to get an ambulance. What could have that $2.2 billion done for those people down there? What could it have done for cost of living at home? What could it do in so many ways? But it appears people can't buy energy anymore. But is there a fear that these $2 billion can try and buy an election? And remember, this was an election that was meant to be easily done. This was a mention that was going to be a walk in the park. But through all the fog and mirrors and everything that's going on, it's becoming a tussle. It is not a own goal. It's not another Premier Dan Andrews cakewalk. This will be close because the people of Australia are having enough of pushing reprofiling projects to the never never, promising bits of money that will never see a project. They're having enough of seeing interest rates go up eight times since this government was elected. They're having enough of seeing energy prices predicted to go up 53 per cent and then 30 per cent. The, the people of Victoria and the people of Australia want to see action. And we can hear you point the finger if we did anything in the last decade. And I get it. We don't have power anymore. But we've had a budget. There was an opportunity not to do everything but to do more. It hasn't done it. All it has done is come up with things that were promised, not research properly, not going to help the people in the, the, the areas they need right now, and we need to do better. There needs to be another thing that comes in shortly to help people with the cost of living. We need to relook at this suburban rail loop and give people the things they need, like money on health, money on living, and we, that's what we should be focusing on. Thank you. Senator Krogan. Thank you. Um, it was interesting to sit here and listen to Senator Fawcett blaming the Labor government for the stagnated wages and the challenges we have in cost of living pressures in Australia at the moment. Seriously? You spend nine years in government presiding over these things with an absolutely dedicated policy of suppressing wages that have been really clear about that, and you want to blame us? You want to blame the Labor government after six months for those pressures? That is just absolutely ridiculous. So let's just be really clear. In six months, in six short months, we have moved to, to work on cheaper childcare. We have a bill in front of us. We have increased renewable energy and we have a plan for our electricity system into the future that is going to make a difference, that is going to improve how we can utilise renewable energy in this country. We have introduced the, the free TAFE places to address the skills shortages that we have been stuck with for years now and that are only getting worse. We, have looked, we are bringing in extra university places to also address those same skills shortages. And as we heard earlier uh, from Senator Gallagher, there has been $32 billion in increased payments, including into the um, age pension all of these things to address the cost of living pressures and the employment pressures that we have, the skills gap, etc. And we have also increased the minimum wage. Well, we didn't, but we supported it, and we have encouraged that to occur. And now we, have, and we are on the verge of the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill that will make a difference if those in this room, this chamber, would pass it, support us getting behind having wages moving, moving so that people are not struggling under the stagnated, wage, stagnated wages that we have seen from the opposition while they are in government for very nine very, very long years. So we are taking action and we are going to make a difference. The problems we are facing um, with the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill are ones of ideology in the main. Now, I am uh, honoured enough to sit on the Employment Education Standing Committee, which is looking at this bill. And we have had an inquiry which has had five days of hearings. And just to be clear, that's more public hearings than any other workplace relations related bill since the introduction of the Fair Work Act. And that committee has heard from employers, it has heard from unions. 
It is heard from the community. It is heard from small business. It is heard from workers. It is heard from not-for-profit organisations, from the Department of Employment and also from the Fair Work Commission um, to ensure that each member of the committee has had a chance to unpack the bill, to explore the issues. And that is exactly what has happened. But one of the common things that we're hearing now is that small business are going to struggle and are going to suffer here. We are hearing all sorts of outlandish claims about there being um, strikes from coast to coast, I think was the comment from Senator Cash. And there is nothing, nothing in these bills that would see us would see that happen in that small in any environment, but certainly not in that small business area. Even when there was 60 per cent um, union density, it was never in small business. Small business has never had a deep union uh, unionisation, and there's nothing in these bills that's going to change that. And when we go to the other end of the scale, where we have the big end of town coming and talking to us, particularly some of those areas where they're never going to see any impacts from this. Their businesses are in a situation where they have their wages settled, they've been bargaining, everything's going nicely. This bill isn't going to change that. This bill is not going to change that. This bill is going to get wages moving. It is going to address some significant cost of living pressures that we are facing in this country. And it is going to give a fair go for the workers, not just allow the big employers, the medium employers, the employers without any morals, to keep moving to a low wage environment. This is about everybody having a go, from the businesses Thank to the employees. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the, the first two questions that were, were asked uh, by the coalition in, in uh, question time today, and uh, note that they were about the suburban rail project. And uh, I don't think we heard uh, any contribution by uh, by the Labor senators that have stood up here during take note uh, that actually made even a glancing reference to. Uh, to those particular questions, I could have taken a point of order on that, uh, Deputy President, but uh, I, uh, I didn't because I just thought this is going to be interesting to see if they're continuing to avoid, I guess, the point uh, that that was being raised by those questions. And of course, that point is all about integrity, transparency, and sound economic management. Because uh, this uh, Andrews Labor government suburban rail loop is just another. Uh, example of, uh, of this government's uh, failed budget and their utter hypocrisy. Because whenever Labor's in political trouble, they always go to look to rail to haul them out of, uh, the, of, of a fix. And so they're at it again. And the suburban rail loop's estimated spend of $125 million, the, the price tag of just two legs of the project, and it won't even be completed by 2050. Yet the Prime Minister had to step in and help out his old mate there, uh, the Victorian Premier. The federal government committed uh, to a $2.2 billion spend at their October budget, almost a, a quarter of their infrastructure spend. Now, this is pork barrelling at its absolute finest. As usual, Labor are putting their priorities over Australians' priorities. Never mind the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, the, the out of control inflation that we're experiencing right now in this country. Labor is happy to scrap uh, excellent programs such as the Building Better Region Fund, but of course that is only so that they can afford to commit to a project that hasn't even had its business case approved by Infrastructure Australia. Uh, as reported by the Australian Financial Review, I quote, Victoria's Auditor-General has criticised the Andrew government's 400-page business case, which had declined to submit to Infrastructure Australia for failing to demonstrate that the economic costs and benefits of the project justify the investment. Now, in my home state of Western Australia, uh, Premier Mark McGowan's signature Metronet, Metronet project uh, that he committed to at the 2017 election is also facing 
uh, major cost blowouts and significant delays. And Senator Brockman uh, is here. He knows that the delays that have been experienced uh, right across uh, right across that MetroNet uh, project. And and what we're seeing is that the the Albanese Labor government has ripped out 1.2 billion dollars from the budget that had been earmarked for a very important project that was determined by Infrastructure Australia, Infrastructure Australia as a, one of the key infrastructure projects that was necessary for the productivity uh, to be driven uh, in, in, uh, in my home state of Western Australia. Uh, and that was, of course, the Row 8 and Row 9 project and the, the, the freight link that uh, was, was earmarked in the budget. Uh, for, uh, for quite some time, waiting for a government in Western Australia to commit to it, but they have failed, uh, failed to do that, sadly. And in fact, they've ripped it out of the budget, and it's no longer there available for a government that would choose in Western Australia to build that important project. And they've just instead got these ridiculous projects up and down Leach Highway that uh, are not actually resolving the, the congestion and the traffic issues and, and importantly, taking uh, heavy freight off those routes uh, through suburban areas, through suburban streets, uh, the, the, whereas row eight and nine would have uh, created a thoroughfare for large trucks, for large heavy freight uh, to be able to get in and out. And so uh, we're seeing uh, in, in, in Victoria, obviously, the election's coming uh, this Saturday. And, uh, and there, the, the Victorian people have a, a big decision to make this Saturday, and, and what we're seeing is that this uh, federal government, federal Labor, is doing everything it can to help protect uh, uh, the Premier there in, uh, in, uh, in, in Victoria to, to try and help him to be able to uh, win back another government. But this, what we know is that the only real way that that uh, state can really move past the the situation that uh, they've found themselves in after, after quite some considerable time, particularly over this last period, over the COVID period, uh, we know that the only opportunity to be able to do that is to be able to see a Liberal elected government there, which is going to help them fix their budget mess and help them fix their infrastructure projects. I put the question, though, for the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Rice, you seek the call. I do. Thank you, um, Deputy President. I move to take note of Minister Watt's answer to my question on native forest logging. And this is something that is close to my heart. I have been campaigning for decades to end the destructive logging of Australia's native forests, and particularly Victoria's. And sadly, the minister's answer shows that Labor just don't get it. The minister talked of balance, of sustainable forestry. I mean, let me translate that for you. What that means is ongoing forest destruction. What that means is the death of hundreds of endangered greater gliders in illegal operations, logging operations undertaken by the state-owned logging company Vic Forests. What balance and sustainable forestry means is the ongoing emissions every year of three million tonnes of carbon, the equivalent of 700,000 cars, while we are in a climate crisis, as the devastating floods around the country are reminding us of at the moment, as the black summer fires three years ago were all too stark a reminder of the climate crisis that we are in. In a few days from now, voters in Victoria have a choice. They have a choice between very different approaches to our native forests. The Labor Party has failed comprehensively at both state and federal levels to protect Victoria's precious native forests. They make vague promises about ending native forest logging, but the time frame is so far away that vast swathes of forests and the animals that rely upon them are going to be gone by the time that 2030 time comes around, at the rate of four MCGs worth of forests every day. They say that the forests are being managed jointly, but the Labor federal government is doing nothing about the Labor Vic Forest illegal logging, refusing to pull the Victorian Labor government into line. Minister Watt made no commitments to get rid of the logging laws our regional forest agreements that allow this logging to continue. He made no commitment to make changes to our environment laws, the EPBC Act, to better protect our forests. The Vic 
Labor government and the Vic federal government are working in cahoots to allow the ongoing devastation of our native forests and the wildlife that depend upon them. The Greens have got a different vision. We have a clear policy of ending native forest logging. We want to see a just transition, one that provides clean, green jobs that are sustainable for both workers and the environment. We want to see people working in protecting our forests, in ecological restoration, in revegetation, tackling weeds and pest animals, on disaster management and relief, people employed growing trees in plantations and on farm forestry, so that 100 per cent of the wood being produced in this country and in Victoria is, comes from those sources. We want to see people employed in growing hemp as an alternative source of fibre. We can be growing and supporting our regional communities, not leaving them abandoned in a dying industry. And I want to thank, in particular, the activists and the campaigners who have fought so hard over so many years to be protecting our native forests, the protesters, the citizen science, the organisations and the people who are taking legal action. We have seen three separate court cases in, the last, in recent months that have found Vic Forests and its logging have broken the laws that are meant to be protecting our forests and the animals that live in them. The courage and the commitment of these campaigners has made a huge difference, a huge difference to our forests, a huge difference to our future, a huge difference to our climate, and I want to thank them. And the voters of Victoria should be listening to this as well, because the Labor Party, when it comes to forests, is a party of too little, too late, and Victorians would do very well to remember that on Saturday. I put the question. Uh, does any other member have a contribution? We have 30 seconds left. I put the question. Those of the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, we'll move on. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No, I'm calling the clerk, am I? Yes, I believe I am. Yes. President, uh, I can advise that postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notices of motion number one for today, postponed to the 24th of November. In general business notice number 71, postponed to the 30th of November. I have no notifications of uh, extensions for committees. Thank you, Clark. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 25th of October 2022 of the Honourable Anthony Tony Austin Street, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Corangamite, Victoria, from 1966 to 1984. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Tony Street. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death on 25 October 2022 of the Honourable Anthony Tony Austin Street, former Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Industrial Relations and former member for Corangamite, places on record its gratitude for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. President, I rise on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of Honourable Anthony Austin Street, known as Tony Street, a, a former foreign minister, who passed away on 25th October at the age of 96, and I start by conveying the government's condolences to all of his family and friends. Tony Street took on big responsibilities as a federal minister, guarding the Fraser government's policies in both industrial relations and foreign affairs. He did so as a conciliator and as a moderate, working to bring consensus and agreement. This approach served him well in both of these policy areas, and as an instinctive consensus builder, he was a natural fit for both of these portfolios. 
In particular, he was uh, clear in his support of multilateralism, recognising Australia's national interests would be advanced by working in cooperation with other nations. However, his story begins in 1926 in Melbourne, where he grew up on the family property in Lismore, roughly uh, halfway between Geelong and Hamilton and just north of Lake Karangamite in southwest Victoria. He didn't have to look far for political inspiration. His father served both as the member for Karangamite in Victoria and as a federal minister. Geoffrey Street became Minister of Defence in November of 1938 and played a major role in the expansion of the military and munitions production prior to his death in the Canberra air disaster in 1940. His son eventually would eventually take the same political path in the same seat. Tony Street was first elected to represent the electorate of Karangamite in 1966. And in a seat that now, nowadays is known for changing hands, he was re-elected seven times, seven times prior to his resignation in 1984, serving for over 17 years. He was briefly a minister in the McMahon government, serving as assistant minister in the Labor and National Service portfolios from August 1971 until the election of the Whitlam government in 1972. When John Kerr, Sir John Kerr appointed Malcolm Fraser as caretaker Prime Minister on Remembrance Day 1975, Tony Street found himself as the senior minister for Labor and Immigration and in the Cabinet. Following the election, the portfolio name changed to Employment and Industrial Relations, and he held this position through to 1978 and then Industrial Relations alone until 1980. At various times, he concurrently held additional portfolios, including that for the public service and, perhaps somewhat oddly, the minister assisting the Prime Minister in women's affairs. We are reminded that it was not actually until Bob Hawke appointed Susan Ryan to the role that this was a role actually held by a woman. Regarded as a conciliatory politician, as Industrial Relations Minister, Tony Street supported the idea of closer relationships between unions and employers, recognising that it would not be possible to increase productivity without good labour relations. He didn't always win, win plaudits from the union movement, and I don't think anyone would describe the Fraser government as pro-union, but he did work concertedly to change the policy approach, having been a critic of the coalition's previous attitude to industrial relations management. In 1980, Tony Street was appointed to succeed Andrew Peacock as Minister for Foreign Affairs. And of course, there was a direct swap between them and Mr Peacock took over the industrial relations portfolio. Andrew Peacock's time in the, industrial, in the foreign affairs portfolio it was a time in which the Liberal Party was turned in a direction less partisan and more focused on the national interests than it had been under former Prime Minister Billy McMahon. This was an approach that Tony Street continued. And as I said earlier, he was a proponent of multilateralism. He said, in its role as a middle power, Australia needs a foreign policy which encompasses not just bilateral relations, but the multilateral diplomacy of international organisations and blocks of countries acting together. President Wise words then and now. Tony Street was active in critical foreign policy decisions in the region and around the world. One of his first tasks was to denounce Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge regime, which at the time was still recognised by the United States the United Nations and ASEAN. In 1981, Tony Street was heavily involved in Australia's boycott of the Springboks rugby tour to New Zealand. And crucially, he was also an early builder of Australia's relationship with China, following on from the foundation set by Gough Whitlam. Continuity in our early engagement with China across partisan lines was a crucial decision in the national interest. Tony Street knew that it was not just sufficient to talk about Australia as a middle power, but that to maintain and advance Australia's position required active engagement and investment in our relationships. He said, and I quote again, a middle power must acquire those qualities by its own efforts, then it must make a conscious effort to maintain them. 
words as important today as they were 40 years ago. Concluding his time as a minister with the defeat of Malcolm Fraser's government by Bob Hawke in 1983, Tony Street left the parliament in 1984. With his death, we see two eras of Australian politics coming closer to their conclusion. He had been the last surviving assistant minister of the McMahon government and the last surviving Liberal Minister of the first Fraser Ministry. Tony Street was a parliamentarian and he was a minister of substance. He combined pragmatism with a desire to forge cooperation and consensus. Australia is better for ministers like Tony Street who look to advance the national interest first. In closing, can I, on behalf of the government, again express our condolences following the passing of the Honourable Anthony Austin Street and again conveying my sympathies to his family and friends. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, I too rise to honour the life of the Honourable Anthony Austin Tony Street, a distinguished parliamentarian, a thoughtful liberal, a considered and humble man of effective engagement with both friend and foe alike. Born in 1926 to Evora and Brigadier Geoffrey Street, a former Defence Minister himself, Tony was not unknowing to political life. His passion for sport also started early, having joined the Melbourne Cricket Club at the age of six. During the time of World War II, Tony attended Melbourne Grammar and was made school captain. He left in 1945 and, following a call to service, joined the Royal Australian Navy, serving upon HMAS Norman, Queenborough and Shropshire as an able seaman. And as were many at the end of the war, he was then demobilised in 1946. Tony then returned home to the family farm and also joined the Lismore branch of the Liberal Party, starting a trajectory to an ultimate parliamentary career. Tony brought to the parliament his learnings of the land, noting that after 20 years of running your own farm, you learn to take the rough with the smooth. Elected as the member for Karangamite in 1966, Tony served in numerous spokesperson roles uh, following that period of opposition that he entered in 1972. He was then appointed to his first cabinet ministry, as Senator Wong has indicated, in 1975 as Minister for Labor and in immigration under Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. Tony Street's stature at five foot four inches, or thereabouts, depending upon which article you read, attracted some nicknames with the friends he made. Having a close, lofty mate in the Navy, they gained the duo, they gained the duo name Dot and Dash. But it was up in the press gallery that dubbed Tony Street and his close accompaniment of Malcolm Fraser as the odd couple. Nicknames aside, Tony remained polite and thoughtful throughout each of his cabinet positions, remarking that losing your temper impairs your capacity to think straight. But he always stayed true to speaking his mind when required. This no doubt made his diplomatic demure most fitting in his final portfolio of foreign affairs, as indeed in his work in industrial relations. It was within government, firstly in the portfolio of industrial relations, that Tony made a name for himself. He confronted the circumstance and reality of unemployment at the time and offered a lowering of the confrontational approach to trade unions, an approach that he took with candid realism which earned respect. He said at the time, and I quote, it is impossible to be dogmatic about this very complex subject. Experience here and in other democracies shows that the lawmaking power of government, particularly where personal conflict is involved, must be used with fine judgment. It was a judgment that he brought to try to ensure that parties could come together. The speeches Tony would give across his portfolios came to be recognised as subtle but significant. Senator Wong has referenced some, and indeed in 1982, as Minister for Foreign Affairs, he delivered a hallmark speech to the Australian Institute of International Affairs outlining Australia's role as a middle power. He stated, and I quote, because of its very size, 
A superpower enjoys authority, whether it deserves it or not. However badly it may behave, it will, by dint of its power, always command respect and even credibility from one quarter or another. But a middle power must acquire those qualities by its own efforts and then make a conscious effort to maintain them. That job of maintenance becomes an important part of a middle power's foreign policy. Moreover, if a middle power is sufficiently determined, it can achieve significant authority by sheer force of political will. The doctrine outlined by Tony Street is one that many Australian foreign and external affairs ministers have sought to hold true to, and our nation is better when they do hold true to that approach and, in doing so, seek to ensure that we are best able as a nation to influence our region, our world, and to do so from a position of respect and credibility. Tony Street took that approach and applied it in his engagement with others. He presented stances on matters of human rights and humanitarian issues that were ones of principle, as Senator Wong has referenced, in relation to matters as sensitive of the times, such as apartheid in South Africa and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Tony Street's passion stretched beyond the parliament and, of course, was well known for a passion for cricket and a reputation as a leg-break bowler was evident in the well-used cricket ball he always kept in his attaché case. While not playing competitively in parliament, except in the press gallery versus politicians' matches, he would grip and spin the ball most days, just in case. Serving always with distinction, Tony made a humble exit from politics in 1984, in the election following the defeat of the Fraser government, announcing that it was time to give younger members of parliament a go. The member for Karangamite for an impressive 17 years, Tony Street served the Australian people with decency, integrity and the qualities of a gentleman, a passionate sportsman who worked the land and served his country and parliament. Tony Street's retirement took him back to the family farm. And I think I'm safe to say that he had a fulfilling 96 years of life, something that we can all but only hope for. On behalf of the opposition, the Senate and the Liberal Party, to Tony's loved ones, his wife Ricky and sons Geoffrey, Alan and Philip, I extend our gratitude for his service to our nation, to our party and our deep and sincere condolences on your loss. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I too rise in this condolence motion to pay tribute and honour the life of Anthony Austin Street, Tony Street. As a former member for Krangamite myself, um, Tony Street was legendary in terms of the contribution that he made to the Krangamite community over some nearly 18 years. Uh, Madam President, I had the great joy of having afternoon tea with Tony and his wife Ricky last year. Uh, it was clear that Tony was very frail, um, some 95 years of age, but we had the most joyous and wonderful discussion over a couple of hours where he spoke of his lifetime of service, his love of the Liberal Party, his focus on consensus, on getting things done uh, through taking the middle ground in bringing people with him, both his local constituents, people on both sides of the House and all of those with whom he dealt, including when he was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I can't repeat many of the stories, um, but they were fabulous. I did ask if he would uh, record some of the stories. Uh, he declined. He was never someone to promote himself. Uh, he was a true gentleman. And when I messaged his son Geoffrey earlier today and asked how he wanted and his sons to be um, how his sons wanted um, Tony Street to be remembered. Uh, Jeffrey said, 
We don't really want very much, only for people to know that our father was a real gentleman. He was respected on both sides of the house and he was also someone who rejected extreme views. We have heard in this debate the contribution that Tony Street made to this parliament and to this nation. He came from a political family. Indeed, his father was the member for Karangamaish. And tragically, his father, Brigadier Geoffrey Street, died when Tony was only 14 years old. Uh, Tony went to Melbourne Grammar. He attended uh, with Malcolm Fraser. He was the school captain in 1944. And following his schooling, he joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1944 as a gunnery radar operator, uh, serving on HMAS Norman, HMAS Queensborough and HMAS Shropshire, including seeing action in the Pacific. He joined the Liberal Party in 1946 and, as we know, he was elected to the seat of Karangamite in 1966, where he served for almost 18 years. In his maiden speech, Tony Street said that the primary producer's most valuable weapon in his continual battle against rising costs, underlying the value that um, computers and data analysis would play in the um, increasing complexity of farming operations. He had a great love of the land. He was born of the land. And um, while he settled in his later years in Ocean Grove, uh, the love of the land never left him. Tony Street was highly respected by people from all walks of life for his effectiveness, fairness and decency. He served with great distinction in a number of ministerial roles, including the Assistant Minister for Labor and National Service during Billy McMahon's term, the Shadow Minister of Social Security and Welfare, Health, Primary Industry, Shipping and Transport, Science and Technology during the Whitlam years, and as the Minister for Employment in Industrial Relations, the Public Service and also Foreign Affairs, of course, under Prime Minister Fraser. As Australia's representative on the world stage, Tony Street promoted the importance of consensus and strove to chart a new course for Australia as a middle power. In that role, he steered the legislation for the foundation of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research through Parliament, and he played a key role in the negotiation of the Australian-New Zealand Close Economic Relations Trade Agreement in 1983. He held, as I said, a strong belief in consensus. He was renowned also as being a great cricketer. In fact, he had real potential, and perhaps if, if his life had taken a, a different course, he may have played for Australia. Uh, he was endearingly known as the little leg spinner from Karangamite. His attitude to cricket was a profound metaphor for life. Wherever he went, he carried in his attaché case an old, much bowled cricket, bowl, cricket ball. Every night he would grip it and spin the ball for practice to keep his fingers strong, just in case. Uh, we have lost a great Liberal in the loss of Tony Street. Um, we've lost a great local resident. Uh, we have lost someone who was a true parliamentarian, who put the service of his community and his nation ahead of himself. I would like to convey my deepest condolences to Tony Street's family, particularly his wife, Ricky and his three sons, Geoffrey, Philip and Alan. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. Thank you, senators.
I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. And we will start with Government Business Number 83, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator O'Sullivan. 83, was it? Yep. yep. Standing in the name of Senator Cash. Thank you. Uh, standing, I stand in the name of Senator Cash. I ask that uh, General Business Notice of Motion Number 83 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There I being none, I call Senator O'Sullivan. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator O'Sullivan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to General Business Notice of Motion Number 80, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Thank you. Thank you, President. I ask that uh, General Business Notice of Motion Number 80, proposing the introduction of a bill, uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steelejohn. I move that the uh, following bill be uh, introduced a bill uh, for an act to amend the Customs Act of 1901 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steele. John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele, John. I uh, present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Steele. John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. Senator Steele John. The, 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 the bill, uh, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum related to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Steele John. Thank you. I table ex an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard and to continue with my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Steele John. We will now move to Government Business Number One, standing in the name of uh, Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I seek leave to amend Government Business Notice of Motion Number 1 before seeking leave to have the motion taken as formal. Is leave granted? Yes. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Chisholm. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the amended motion being taken as formal? There being none. Oh, oh, Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, we'll move the motion and I'll come back to you, Senator Rob. Senator uh, Chisholm. I move the motion as amended. Uh, Senator Roberts, you're seeking leave. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. One Nation opposes this motion. The Senate is the House of Review. One Nation will resist the Anthony Albanese government's efforts to restrict the Senate's opportunity to debate and to amend. We oppose turning the Senate into a rubber stamp for the lower house. If Senator Gallagher must continually reorder business, one has to ask what's gone wrong in the government. Why did the Albanese government set out a sitting calendar containing fewer sitting days than normal? Then with the end of the year looming, we face guillotine motions and a truncation of Senate process. I doubt this is due to the government's lack of ability. These repeated reorders, when taken together with the decision to reduce the crossbench staff, reeks more of deliberate censorship than incompetence. We have to ask what deals were done with the Greens and with Senator Pocock to approve this and previous reorders. Dodgy deals extend well beyond Victorian Premier Dan Andrews to Labor as a whole. Uh, Senator Roberts, I remind you when referring to uh, leaders in other states, you use their correct title. Thank Premier you. Dan Andrews. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, <laughs> Senator Birmingham. Great. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, just a moment, Senator Birmingham. Uh, one, Senator Mackenzie, it is incredibly disorderly uh, to call out when you are not in your seat. And I asked you earlier today to withdraw that remark, and I'm going to ask you to withdraw it again without comment. I wasn't on. I wasn't in front of. The Senator Mackenzie, I'm not. It's not an argument or debating point. It was well heard, and I'm asking that you withdraw the remark. If it would assist the chamber. 
I, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, President. Well, President, there are some parts of this motion that are not unusual for an end of sitting period, and we acknowledge that, uh, that governments have uh, matters that are routine to the orderly business of government that need to be progressed with. And, uh, and the opposition has sought to engage with the government in as constructive a way as possible in relation to those. However, there are other uh, there are other matters to this motion uh, in terms of scheduling additional sitting days, including sitting days for which the purpose of them is now undefined. But it is obviously clear that the purpose of those additional sitting days is part of the government's plan to ram through with undue haste their irresponsible and reckless industrial relations reforms. Ultimately, this government went to the last election promising a very contained suite of IR reforms but instead, just months later, is seeking to pursue reforms that workplaces and industry groups across the country have denounced. We won't be giving the government a blank cheque in terms of extra days next week for IR reforms that nobody voted for and that every industry group is saying will drive inflation higher and jobs lower. And Senator Birmingham, I assume you're um, seeking leave to um, move this motion? Uh, no, that was, that, just a, that was just a short statement. Okay, for, short statement. For, for, for clarity right, for the sorry. Chamber, President, yes, there you. is an amendment circulated yes. in my name. However, the government has subsequently amended its motion um, in ways that we were not aware of until seeing that. I will not be proceeding with the amendment circulated. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. So we uh, have got uh, an amended motion put forward uh, by Senator um, Chisholm. In the name of Senator Gallagher, so I'll now proceed to uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, President. Just if I could uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Certainly not, Senator Henderson. No, I can right. tell you that much. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Greens will be supporting this uh, hour's motion and uh, the ordering for business for the remainder of this week. We also support the amendment um, as circulated by the government to help facilitate a very important piece of legislation, the territory rights legislation, to um, finally, hopefully, pass this place. This legislation has been tried many times for far too long. Uh, Territorians have been denied their rights because of uh, talk about se secret deals and dodgy deals, deals that were done in this place decades ago, and Territorians have been suffering uh, the results of it ever since. So it's time we corrected this, and it's time we s made sure that all Australians are seen equal under the law. Um, this, bill, uh, this motion deals with a number of bills. There is a huge number of them. We understand that, uh, but we are willing to facilitate uh, the passage of them on the basis uh, that uh, this place needs to be functional, it needs to uh, work Senator properly Hanson for the Young, people, and we will support the motion. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, which has been amended by uh, Senator Chisholm and put by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No, Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, moved by uh, Senator Chisholm as amended, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order, there being 33 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. We will now move to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I seek leave to amend business of the Senate, no uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number two relating to a reference to the Senate Standing Committee on Procedure before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is the amend the oh, amendment changes the return date from 1 February 2023 to 31 March 2023. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion as amended. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. Claims of public interest immunity made by ministers in response to orders for production of documents balance transparency with the recognised position that there is information held by government that it would not be in the public interest to disclose. This includes documents that put our national security or defence at risk, prejudice an investigation by a law enforcement agency or an ongoing judicial process, or put public safety at risk. Senator Roberts proposes upending this process. The Procedure Committee and other committees have, recognised, have already extensively inquired into the making of public interest immunity claims and the procedures for dealing with them. I strongly encourage the opposition as a party of government to reconsider its support for these changes. In just the last parliament alone, those opposite issued claims of public interest immunity in response to 40 per cent of Senate orders for production of documents. Now they are proposing to support Senator Roberts to erode these protections. The opposition should put responsibility ahead of political opportunity. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion as moved and amended by Senator Roberts be agreed to. That's business of the Senate number two. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for if you want. Do you want how long? Four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that um, business of the Senate number two, as amended by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 41 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, I believe there may be two further divisions. We will now move to general business, number 81, standing in the name of Senator Antic and others. Enough. Senator Antic. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I inform the Chamber that Senators Hanson and Roberts will also sponsor the motion. And I seek the general business notice, notice of motion 81 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Antic. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 81, standing in the name of Senator Antic, Hanson and Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. I only heard one voice. I only heard one voice, and that was yours, Senator Rennick. I'll put it again. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 81, standing in the name of Senators Antic, Hanson, and Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. One minute.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 81, standing in the name of Senators Antic, Hanson and Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is negated. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 84, standing in the name of Senator Canavan. Senator Canavan. Yes, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion No. 84 relating to estimates hearings for the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee. The amendment has been circulated. Is leave granted? Sorry, can I just ask what it is? Because I don't recall seeing it. Is it short enough to read, Senator Canavan? Well, it's, it's about half a page. Maybe we could move to the next item if there is one. Uh, no, this well, is it's, it. Okay, maybe we just pause. I'm in the hands of the Senate. Uh, okay. I believe it's fine, Senator Canavan. Okay. Thank you very much. I amend the motion the term circulated and I ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is that the um, amended motion uh, be as circulated, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Oh, let's put it again. I think I need a few more voices. So the question is that the amended motion number 84, as put by Senator Canavan, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. Lock the doors. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 84, as amended by Senator Canavan, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there be 41 ayes and 17 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. And that now concludes formal business. There is an urgency motion. It just allows senators not participating in the vote to leave. Order. Senator Hanson has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Four, four and a half, five, seven. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All good. No. All good. All right. Seven and three quarters. Well done. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's uh, debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Sen Hello, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Sorry, Senator Hanson, I just need you to move the motion, please. I move Thank the motion, you. a matter of urgency. 
Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you very much. I rise to ask the Senate to affirm its support for free and fair elections, which accurately reflect the intention of Australian voters. Prior to the 2016 federal election, the Senate amended federal electoral laws to ensure voters retained control of their preferences. The result in 2016 was a Senate with a strong crossbench the Australian people wanted. This followed previous Senate election outcomes, which defied public expectations. Those outcomes had Glenn Drury's name all over them. We all know who this man is and how he has made his name over the years as a so-called preference whisperer. In the past week, reports in the Herald Sun newspaper have served to remind us of his talent and of the need to always be vigilant in the defence of free and fair elections. It hasn't been the best week for Glenn Jury, I can tell you. It's been recorded admitting he has worked with the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews to deliver a crossbench Labor can work with. He's on the record saying he manipulates upper house group voting tickets to mislead Victorian voters and direct their preferences to left-leaning minor party candidates, all in effort to keep Premier Andrews in power. He even admits to creating a fake party, the SAC Dan Andrews party, in his effort to mislead voters. The Victorian Premier initially denied any involvement, but it's been confirmed Mr Drury has been working closely with his office in the lead-up to this year's state election. It's telling that the Premier has resisted many calls to reform Victorian electoral laws and get rid of the upper house group voting tickets. Now we know why. Premier Andrews has well and truly been a law unto himself. He has been the most unaccountable government in the history of Victoria with a long list of scandals. IBAC's referrals and political scalps under his watch, branch stacking, the botched hotel quarantine program, fire services reform, printing rorts, misuse of parliamentary allowances in the Red Shirts affair, country member allowances claimed by city-based MPs, taxpayers billed for chauffeuring dogs and MPs bullying their staff, and not to forget the collision with a cyclist. Today there are more revelations with the recording of Mr Jury saying he used his position on the staff of former Senator Darren Hinch for personal financial gain, acting on privilege for knowledge of the Financial Services Royal Commission to sell his bank shares. This is an indirect contravention of the law. That he may well have broken the law for personal gain is an important matter that should be investigated. Of greater importance is that Australian voters have confidence in their votes, support candidates they want to support and have confidence in the accuracy and integrity of dem democratic elections. To Victorian voters I say this. Vote below the line in the upper house to make sure your preferences are directed to where you want them. The only safe vote above the line is One Nation. We are not part of Mr Jury's cohort of fake parties, and you can be confident your preferences will remain with conservative candidates and like-minded parties. One Nation Victoria is also pledged to undertake electoral reform so that in the future Victorians can have confidence in the outcome. Failure to ensure election integrity is a betrayal of the Australian people's trust and since this is a function of law, it is up to us lawmakers to meet this expectation. One Nation has been very active in this space, introducing legislation in this effect last year, and I commend my colleague Senator Roberts for his diligent efforts to protect and enhance election integrity. So I ask the Senate to stand in condemnation of the Premier Dan Andrews for being associated with this manipulation of the system to mislead voters. I ask the Senate to stand in defence of free and fair elections which reflect the intent of the Australian people and which strengthen their faith in the principles and institutions of Australian democracy. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator White. Acting Deputy President, the Australian Labor Party has a long and proud history of strengthening our electoral system. And in that tradition, the government's priorities continue to 
to be improving transparency and accountability in our electoral law. Labor believes Australians deserve to know who is donating to candidates and political parties and who is influencing policy. That's why we have had legislation before the parliament for years to ensure the donation disclosure threshold is fixed at $1,000 instead of the current $15,200, and, we, and we're introducing real-time disclosure of donation. These proposed reforms have been referred to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters as part of the standing uh, inquiry following each election. I know they maintain broad support. More broadly, though, some senators in this chamber, especially those attacking the Victorian Premier, may want to reflect on some of their own practices around fundraising and donations before lecturing others. Indeed, Acting Dep Deputy President, I could take the rest of my time on this urgency motion to point out the complete hi hypocrisy from Paul N. Hansen's One Nation in bringing on this debate today. I could spend my time stepping out how this sort of baseless attack is one one thing, Senator Hanson's desperation in trying to improve her, her party's dismal polling pr prospects at the Victorian election this Saturday by pulling a stunt in the Senate. This motion is just a symptom of Senator Hanson's relevance deprivation sin syndrome after Pauline Hanson's One Nation flopped at the last federal election. Now Senator Hanson is worried about flopping in the uh, Victorian election this weekend, but Acting Deputy President, I will not waste my time addressing the long and ugly history of Pauline Hanson's One Nation. No, instead, I I'd like to take, time, take a moment to point out to Senator Hanson and to the Senate just what the state Labor government in Victoria has achieved, and in doing so show Senator Hanson what good government in my state looks like. It looks like delivering on generational infrastructure projects, like removing 67 level crossings to make to make uh, commuting quicker, safer and cheaper, and building 6,300 new social and affordable homes with a view to deliver 16,000 in the next four years and building the Metro Tunnel. It looks like delivering on world-leading climate change policy by cutting emissions by 50 per cent by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050, re-establishing a state energy uh, company to make energy cheaper and greener and, and making the largest tram network in the world powered by 100 per cent solar energy. It looks like providing reforms that makes Victoria the place to be. Whether you're a renter who now has access, be who, who has access to better and protected rights, a casual worker who can now access a sick pay guarantee, or a kid in any government school who can now see a mental health professional, it looks like leading the nation in recognising and advancing the rights of Australia's First Nations people through a Victorian truth treaty telling and treaty process. It looks like leading the nation by being the first state to legislate voluntary assisted dying laws, now a norm in this country, which means people can die with dignity. Dignity. It means educating our young people for the benefit of all Victorians by making kindergarten free, making TAFE courses for in-demand occupations free and making it free to study nursing. Acting Deputy President, I could go on, but what I will say lastly is that the achievement I have outlined doesn't doesn't just look like good government, they are good government. And while it's clear that some people want to scramble to repair their own reput reputations by attacking the Victorian government and its achievement, the reality is that the Australian Labor Party in Victoria has a proven record of getting things done. And I have no doubt that if re-elected it will only build on the truly life-changing reforms that have made the lives of Victorians better. Thank you, Senator White. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, um, Acting Deputy President. The Greens will not be supporting this urgency motion today. Whilst we agree with Senator Hanson that group voting tickets are an abomination, and I'll come to that shortly, there's more than a whiff of electoral denialism to this motion. We know that the far right here in this parliament and around the world is waging a war on democracy and on free and fair elections, and we are not interested in being a part of that. Thanks to our AEC and our state and territory electoral commissions, Australia's elections have some of the highest integrity and transparency in the world. But none of that changes how appalling group voting tickets are. Group voting tickets enable preference whisperers, like Mr Drury, to allocate your preferences for you when you vote above the line. That means for the over 90 per cent of voters who do just that, when you put a party like the Health Party or the Sustainable Australia Party as your number one, you could very well end up sending your preferences to pro-gun parties like the Shooters and Fishers or anti-abortion parties like the Democratic Labor Party. And under these rules, the only way around this to actually control your own preferences is to vote below the line, number every box, risking an invalid vote if you make a mistake. Here in the federal parliament, the Greens were proud to be part of abolishing group voting tickets in 2016. In every other state and territory, the parliament has made the wise decision to abolish 
group voting tickets. Everyone knows group voting tickets need to end. Experts like Anthony Green hates them. Every state and territory government, including Labor governments uh, like Mr McGowan's in, uh, in WA, also hates them. The Greens hate them. Even the Liberals hate them. It's only the Victorian Labor government that has refused to abolish group voting tickets. My Victorian Greens colleagues have been the only members of the last Victorian parliament who have pushed to get rid of group voting tickets and have challenged both the Labor and the Liberal parties to commit to reform this undemocratic system before the election on Saturday. The group voting system will continue to distort the will of voters until Labor and the Liberals commit to reform. Victoria needs to get on with the job of abolishing group voting tickets, and the Greens will continue to campaign both here and in Victoria for improvements to our electoral system. But make no, mis no mistake, we won't team up with One Nation when it comes to questions of electoral integrity. Thank you, Senator Waters. S Senator Babette. The Victorian Premier, Mr Daniel Andrews, doing dodgy deals with election fixer, Mr Glenn Jury. Now, that is a classic case of someone someone shaking hands with the devil. That's what that is. Now, my problem, my problem is that I can't tell which one of these two is the devil. Is it A, dictator Dan? Is it B, election rigor, Mr Glenn Jury? Or is it, as I suspect, all of the above? Now, Mr Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, has a record. He has a record that would make the devil himself blush. Blush. He has racked up the worst debt of any state by far. By far. $170 billion predicted debt. More than Queensland, more than Tasmania, more than New South Wales combined. He has crippled, crippled our state's health system. People are dying at home waiting for an ambulance doesn't even show up. That's what's happening. He has overseen the harshest and the longest lockdowns on planet Earth. He was responsible for the highest COVID death rate in the country. He had a pregnant mother arrested in her home. But what for? What for for a Facebook post? He arrested and pepper sprayed senior citizens. He kept you from seeing your dying relative and mourning the loss of your loved ones. He had the police shoot innocent people with rubber bullets. He shut the playgrounds. He kept your children out of school. You were arrested for daring to go to the beach by yourself. He divided families and tried to keep you, keep you apart for Christmas. He used the pandemic as an excuse to turn my home state, the once great state of Victoria, into a living hell. That's what he did. And as if that was not enough, he himself is mired in scandal and scams that seem to have no end. You know what? There's something new in the paper every single day about Dan Andrews, Premier Dan Andrews. Here's one. Absolute disgrace. Uh, sorry, sorry, Senator Babette. Hang on. There is a point of order, Minister. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm sure Senator Babette's aware that there are uh, standing orders in relation to using props in the chamber. There is actually Senator Babette, but uh, please continue. I withdraw. Now, he's a subject of not one, not two, not three, not four, but five IVAC corruption inquiries. Five. Five. That's how many? Five. Now let me ask Labor members this. How many times should IBAC investigate your dodgy Victorian colleague before you find the moral courage to condemn him? How many times? <laughs> Are you waiting for a sixth corruption inquiry before you find your voice? Well, you might not have to wait for long as the Liberal Party has now just referred Dan Andrews, Premier Dan Andrews, to IBAC once again. Number six. Number six. Exactly. Number six. Now, how hellish does Victoria need to become before those of us here in Canberra will finally say enough is enough? Now, the scandal is not only that dictator, da dictator sorry, Premier Daniel Andrews Premier, deals with dodgy Glenn Jury. The real scandal is that federal Labor protect the corrupt and tyrannical Premier Dan Andrews as one of their own. That's the real scandal. Now, as Mr Glenn Jury this political fixer has boasted on camera to creating sham political parties in order to fool voters into voting for candidates and parties that will be cooperative to the Premier Dan Andrews. 
when these voters might have reasonably believed that they were actually voting to be against Dan Andrews. Now, this election fixing is permitted in the state of Victoria, and it is outrageous. It is outrageous that we allow this to happen to the benefit of Daniel Andrews. Yes, and it beggars sorry, belief. Sorry, Senator Babbitt. You know where we're going to go here on a point of order, Minister. I mean, Senator Babbitt is entitled to be as disrespectful and and uh, use pejorative language. Uh, to suit what no doubt is going to be a terrific uh, post on Telegram or whatever the sort of right-wing posting is these days, but, but he, he is required in here to use uh, the Premier of Victoria's proper title, and he ought to show the Chamber a little bit more respect. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babbitt, uh, second time, but I would ask that you refer to whoever it is by their proper title, and I don't need any help. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, how many reports of corruption, election fixing and incompetence need to come out of Victoria before someone in the Federal Labor Party finds the courage to say something? How many? How many times? Now, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese took time out on Monday to thank Premier Daniel Andrews uh, on Twitter. He said, Dan, Premier Dan Andrews is building a better future for all Victorians. Now, the PM is surely having a lend of us. 60,000 Victorians fled Victoria last year, the most on record in a single year. Now, the future that Premier Dan Andrews is building is so good, so good, that Victorians they see their future elsewhere. How can the Prime Minister support Dan Andrews and keep a straight face? This is the same Prime Minister who promised to elevate the tone of politics. When Victorians go to the polls on Saturday, they should not reward Premier Dan Andrews, but instead sack him. Thank you, Senator Babbitt. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. In the last few days, a video exposing preference manipulator Glenn Drury has been circulating on social media. Even the mouthpiece media was forced to acknowledge Drury's boasting confession that he manipulated election results for 25 years to sell seats in parliament. Manipulating preferences is morally reprehensible, and any party that participates in these dodgy deals is morally reprehensible. The scheme involves setting up fake parties and, in effect, selling preferences to parties that otherwise would not get enough votes to win. Most Victorians simply put a one above the line without realising where that party's preferences go. In the 2021 Western Australian election, Liberal Party preferences elected a Greens member. Now, I'm sure voters would not have taken that decision themselves. Any party participating in this scheme clearly puts power ahead of principle. Drury, Drury alumni include Legalised Cannabis Party, the Democratic Labor Party, Darren Hinch's Justice Party, Fiona Patton's Reason Party, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party and, sadly, the Liberal Democrats. One Nation has not used Drury. We have lost elections where we significantly outpolled the winning party get lost because Drury's dodgy preference deals. In 2014, Dan Andrews spoke to the Liberals about abolishing group voting tickets. It never happened. A lot of Dan Andrews' promises never happened. One Nation's clarity and directness may not suit some people at times, yet with One Nation, what you see is what you get. And I stress, voters who vote above the line enable parties to allocate your preferences. Instead, for a fair democracy, preferences should not be given to corrupt, undemocratic parties and should always belong to each voter. I urge all Victorians in this weekend's election to vote below the line, mark at least five squares, ten is better. That's the only way voters can control and allocate who gets preferences. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we value and protect democracy. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Now the question is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Aye. Hmm. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
the doors. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson in relation to the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. There have been 29 ayes and 31 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Bruce. No worries. Senators, those not involved in the debate, I'd ask that you uh, have your conversations outside. Order. Um, hang on. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Macdonald. Senators, order, if I can please, could you have your conversations outside please? All I can hear is you talking. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Macdonald, which is also shown in item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? That was lucky. The, the proposal is supported. I understand that the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It has become apparent oh, over the last few weeks that this is a Labor government of old, not of Hawke or Keating or Curtin, but of the disastrous Rudd-Gillard Rudd days. Labor has been marred by cabinet leaks, indecision and warring cabinet ministers. And this has culminated in the latest failure, domestic gas policy. They have shot themselves in the foot and now they're complaining it hurts. Back in September, after the Jobs and Skills Summit, the Prime Minister unequivocally ruled out any thought of a new mining tax. And yet, Less than two weeks ago, it was leaked that this was back on the table. Another broken promise from a broken government. It is mining tax 2.0. Labor's own budget has forecast gas and electricity price increases of over 40 per cent and 50 per cent over the next two years. And what was their solution? Well, it was to cut critical funding to projects designed to provide more gas supply. And in the October budget, 
They axed the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program, a program designed to secure gas supply from the Beedaloo Basin, a basin that could supply over 200,000 petajoules of gas. That's 200 years' worth of supply. And in that same budget, they also slashed more than half of the funding for the Cooper Aidavale Basin Plan. Over $30 million allocated to increase domestic gas supplies was gutted, further stranding investors trying to increase our domestic gas supply. And to make matters worse, Labor has showered green lawfare officers like the Environmental Defenders Office and Environmental Justice Australia with almost $10 billion in handouts. What we have is a government in crisis. Labor has no plan to address cost of living, no plan to address rising electricity prices and no plan to address rising electricity prices. All we have are thought bubbles. And furthermore, state governments that are now paying for reservations, price caps and government interventions are the same states that have locked gas away, reducing supply to the domestic market. The hypocrisy is astounding, for it will not be states like Victoria who suffer under a price cap or resources tax. It will be states like Western Australia and Queensland who already produce gas for domestic users. Yet instead of working to get more gas out of the ground to help Australian families and industries, Labor is instead laying siege to the resources sector from all sides. Mining companies are now warning that up to 33,000 jobs are at risk from a potential new Mining Tax 2.0 from Labor as well as their irresponsible industrial relations legislation. That would imperil projects valued at up to $77 billion, spreading investment, uncertainty and contagion. The mining sector has identified 140 projects subject to pre-final pre investment decisions that would be at risk from new taxes and ill-thought-through industrial relations changes. And more broadly, with Labor reviewing the EPBC and creating additional barriers for approvals, there is now potentially up to $100 billion in investments and 174,000 jobs now at risk with the Environment Minister's politically charged project reviews. Now, we know that the surest way to a secure affordable, reliable gas is through increasing supply. The Coalition knows this. Minister King knows this. Unfortunately, some of her cabinet colleagues cannot fathom the thought of investing in gas supply. The coalition developed our strategic basins program to target projects that brought domestic gas supply online, projects in the Beedaloo, Cooper, Adavale, North Bowen and Galilee. And these projects were backed by industry and, with government support, had the potential to bring hundreds of petajoules of gas to market. The coalition invested over $360 million in our strategic basin plan and national gas infrastructure projects. Fund, uh, plan, funding to ensure Australian households, consumers and manufacturers have access to affordable gas. Gas is and will continue to be a necessity for decades to come through power generation, for manufacturing, industry, agriculture and energy transitions. Labor needs to stop their internal bickering and guarantee more gas supply now. Thank you, Senator. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it is really something, isn't it, to be lectured to by the National Party, of all of the parties in this chamber, about division. Uh, it's peak Senate. We should probably offer Senator Macdonald an extension of time to talk about it more because this is the group of people who could have done something about this or any number of things in the nine years that they were part of government, but they didn't use their nine years for that, did they? They actually just spent most of their time in government bickering with one another about who was going to get to be the DPM. That was their big priority, working out who was going to get the big position. And they didn't pay attention to the very significant policy issues that required the attention of the government, that required the attention of the National Party, that the regions would have appreciated had it been dealt with. They didn't do any of those things. They fought amongst themselves. 
about who was going to be the Deputy Prime Minister. The truth is that energy prices are, of course, a very real challenge for our economy. We are currently dealing with the most significant shock to energy markets in 50 years. And that is a direct result of Russia's illegal and prolonged attack on Ukraine. And the IEA says this about it. They say energy markets and policies have changed as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, not just for the time being, but for decades to come. So if you think about the context that we are dealing with, it's a pretty sad reflection on the opposition that their choice is to come in here and make a pretty narrow partisan and political point. Exactly, there is a national interest to be dealt with here and it needs to be taken seriously. Australian households, businesses and industries are grappling with the impact of this. And responding to it is made all the more difficult because of the chaos and dysfunction that afflicted the last government, particularly on the question of energy policy. And since coming to government, we've been taking steps to remedy it. So in the very first days after the Albanese Labor government ministry was sworn in, we had to deal with a very significant crisis emerging in the energy market, in the electricity market, and that was successfully navigated in a collaborative and orderly way using the institutions of the market and working with colleagues in states and territories. Since had to deal with a gas supply issue, which again we've dealt with in an orderly and collaborative way, and now we are dealing with pricing. But the truth is, Senator MacDonald likes to talk about the legacy on gas, but the Morrison government's gas-fired recovery failed to get more gas into the system. It was all talk and no action. They said they'd enforce use it or lose it conditions on gas licences, and that actually didn't happen. They said they'd develop a gas reservation scheme, and that didn't happen. They said they'd avoid a shortfall in the domestic gas market with new agreements with the three East Coast LNG exporters, but they didn't bother to extend the Australian domestic gas security mechanism or the heads of agreement before the last election. There's a lot of talk and not much delivery. We understand that this matters for Australians, and we are taking prudent, responsible and careful action to reduce energy price pressures on Australian households and on Australian industry without undermining investment. As the IEA points out, and almost any other serious commentator, these are extraordinary times. Energy markets around the world are being reshaped, and the government is working on options to bring prices down. Greater transparency in the market is urgently needed, and the solutions lie not just in one place. It's no silver bullet. They lie across the energy supply chain. And so the ACCC is advising the Treasurer on how the gas industry's voluntary code of conduct is operating and how to ensure reasonable pricing. As the Treasurer has said, our first preference is not a tax outcome here. Our first preference is a regulatory outcome. But it makes sense to leave other options on the table until we conclude a view, and it's not wise to rule other options out. The budget contains $67 million to modernise energy market regulation and to increase the ACCC scrutiny of gas markets. And any additional action that we take on energy prices will be balanced against the need to maintain investment confidence and to support Australian Thank industry you, and Senator households. McAllister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Fossil fuel companies in Australia are, are amongst the dodgiest polluters in the world and destroyers of First Nations cultural heritage. For decades, they have been aided by a succession of Labor and Liberal governments. Supply is not the issue here. Don't be fooled. Don't be a fossil fool. We export around 80 per cent of Australia's gas. The idea that we simply need to increase supply is a complete joke. But it's a joke that governments have adopted as energy policy over the last decade. More gas production just means even more exports and profits for oil and gas companies like Santos, Woodside and Chevron. 
This is a government that is captured by these fossil fuel companies, allowing them to continue destroying our lands, water, air and sacred sites, facilitating manufactured consent rather than ensuring traditional custodians providing free, prior and informed consent. Climate change is here. The climate science spells it out clearly. At the recent COP, we heard stories from First Nations people across the globe who are being displaced, leaving their ancestral homes and losing their ancestral bones because of climate change. The International Energy Agency has said itself, if we are to have any chance of sticking to 1.5 and protect our cultural heritage, there can be no new oil and gas projects. This sounds simple, right? But this government is more interested in protecting their corporate donor mates in the fossil fuel industry than taking meaningful climate action. Instead, this government gave $42.7 billion in fossil fuel handouts in their recent budget. While we are in a cost of living and climate crisis, and while First Nations people in the Beedaloo and across the country are fighting to protect their country against fossil fuel companies. Just yesterday, the Greens tried to stop the government from lending their mates in the Victorian government $32 million for a dodgy gas development on my country, Gunai country, Golden Beach pristine, beautiful country, part of the 90-mile beach. The audacity of the Victorian Labor government to talk treaty while they log our country, drill into our ocean, which destroys our lands and waters and totems and sacred thank sites. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, whenever I follow a Green senator in this place who talks about economics and supply and demand, I always refer to my book on basic economics and see what that tells me about supply and demand issues. And Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe seemed to think this is not a supply issue. It is absolutely a supply and demand issue. And what happens when you constrain supply, you constrain supply, prices go up. It is economics 101. When you constrain supply, prices go up. And that is what we have seen. That is what we have seen in the Australian gas market. It is basic economics 101. You constrain supply and prices go up. The tragedy, the tragedy of this situation is that Australia has ample, ample supply of gas. It's just a question of getting it out the ground and getting it to market. And that is where there's been a failure, a failure of in particular governments, the gov state government of Victoria. And in respect to that, in respect to that, in that context, in that context, it is so disappointing to hear some of the rhetoric coming, emerging from some of the government ministers on the other side of the chamber. And in particular, in particular, I talk about, uh, I refer to the comment which was made by the industry minister, Mr. Ed Husick, which was quoted in an article written by the great political editor of the AFR, Philip Curry, entitled "Labor Unions Rupture Over Gas Prices," and I quote. This is what Minister Husick said. It's Team Australia or Team Greed. The choice is up to the gas companies. End quote. That's what he said. That's what he said, Mr Acting Deputy President. He cast a slur, a general slur, on, upon all of those companies, great, including great Queensland companies, in, which spend millions and millions of dollars on gas exploration, have invested in important infrastructure in places like Gladstone, in my home state of Queensland. It's all about Team Australia or Team Greed. That's what the minister says. That's what the minister says, and casts a general slur over those involved in the oil and gas industry. And I say, I say through you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, where was the minister for industry? Where was the minister for industry when those companies, when those companies were struggling with gas prices near the floor and were writing off billions of dollars in investment, incurring billions and billions in losses? Where was his Team Australia or Team Greed rhetoric? Nothing. Critics. Crickets. Absolutely nothing. Crickets. Nothing. But now the market has turned 
He wants to cast a slur on the gas companies. What he should be doing, what he should be looking at, is in particular the state government of Victoria and how it has not taken the action ne necessary to increase gas supply in the East Coast market. I want to quote from an article, uh, an op-ed piece, which was written by Mr Ian Davies, who actually is involved in the gas industry and knows something about the gas industry. And I think this article, which appeared in the AFR uh, a month or so ago, is actually contains all you need to know about this argument. Contains all you need to know about this argument. I quote: "The key to reducing gas price is to unlock the upstream gas industry's potential to deliver more gas." End quote. That's the key. This is a supply issue. This is a supply issue. The gas is there in the ground. We need to get it to market. That's the key. That's the key. And again, I quote from this outstanding op-ed: "Simply blaming upstream gas suppliers for all of the economy's woes." is not only wrong, it is cynical, political and lazy." End quote. That's what he says. He's involved, Mr Davies, he's involved in the gas industry and has been for a long period of time. And that's the response, that's the response to the slurs from the Minister for Industry, who invokes greed, etc., etc., instead of looking at the underlying causes. And the underlying cause is a lack of, of supply. A lack of supply. The Narrabri gas project in New South Wales could provide half the market for gas for residences and businesses in New South Wales. Half the market. But it's taken 10 years and more. We're still waiting for that gas project to come online. That's the issue. It's an issue of supply. And those opposite ministers in this government are engaging in this rhetoric, which I refer to as cynical, political and lazy rhetoric, demonising the gas industry instead of looking at uh, ways in which supply can be increased. And I'll, I'll end with this quote from Mr Davies' article. We are a sophisticated and wealthy nation with sophisticated and complicated markets. Let's act like it. End quote. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The National Party have put forward the urgency motion today. It is the same party who held the resources portfolio between 2030 13 and 2022 and failed to introduce a domestic gas reserve policy in Commonwealth waters. If a domestic gas reserve policy had been introduced, Australians would not be facing a shortage of natural gas or high-priced electricity. Budget Paper 1 shows Australians will receive more from beer drinkers than foreign-owned multinational companies exporting liquefied natural gas. When I introduced the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020 to get more natural gas for Australia, not one party supported me. We can only blame the parties that have formed government for the high-priced gas which has killed manufacturing in Australia and is driving electricity prices higher. I am not going to let the, natural, the Nationals virtue signal on natural gas when in government they helped foreign-owned companies avoid paying tax in Australia. If the Nationals had stopped taking $55,000 a year from oil and gas companies for corporate membership of their party, they might have been free from the criticism of conflict of interest. Australia expect their government to act in their best interests. That won't happen while the big parties take millions from oil and gas companies. And as I keep reiterating, until we deal with the gas of the northwest shelf and get these multinational companies to pay their fair share of tax in Australia here and get a gas supply from Western Australia to the east coast of Australia or build more pipelines to service the needs of Australians, we are going to lose more industries, more manufacturing because of the lesser gas. This has been ill thought out and ill prepared by governments who have not fought for the benefits of the Australian people. And it's an absolute crying shame that they never supported my bill, the Offshore Petroleum Gas Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefits Bill, in the best interests of all Australians. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, first, I just, just wanted to briefly respond to Senator Hanson there. It is not correct to say that the, the former Liberal Nationals government uh, did not uh, impose a domestic gas reservation policy. Uh, one of the last acts I did as a Resources Minister was to, uh, was to establish uh, a a change in policy of the federal government that any new gas field developed in Australia would have a domestic reserve requirement. Uh, stand by that decision, and we very much hope that some of these new gas fields are developed to help supply gas to Australians. In terms of comments Senator Hanson made about offshore uh, oil and gas fields, we 
only really have a couple of those in Australia, some off west the Western Australian coast and some off the Victorian coast, with a little bit up in Northern Territory. The reality is those in the west and the north are not connected uh, to the eastern coast, and there is not a shortage of gas in our north and west, so an off offshore reservation policy there would not have alleviate, alleviated the situation we face here in eastern Australia. And that being as it said, in Western Australia there already is a 15 per cent domestic gas reserve requirement. Uh, which supplies them with gas uh, properly so. Uh, in the Bass Strait, the other, the other big resource we have, all of that is supplied domestically. The Bass Strait resort already Reserve already does go to domestic sources. Uh, a domestic gas reserv reservation requirement would not have changed that. The problem we have as a nation and have faced for some years is that the Bass Strait as a region has been declining in terms of its gas uh, reserves, especially low-cost gas, which comes when you produce oil. That has increased prices and costs uh, for the users of gas in eastern Australia, and we have been desperate to find new sources of gas. Of course, we have the coal seam gas in Queensland, which helps, but it is a relatively high-cost form of gas production, and what we desperately need is to find more oil. Uh, that is why the decision in the budget only a few weeks ago to slash funding for the development and exploration of new gas fields is so disappointing uh, to the manufacturing industry in this, in this country, to anyone who wants to support and see uh, power bills, energy bills come down in Australia. Effectively, this government is crying crocodile tears for the manufacturing industry right now. Uh, they, are, they are purporting to have sympathy uh, uh, for, the, for the factory owners, uh, for, for small businesses, for just mums and dads who are struggling to pay their bills right now. But on the other hand, they're doing nothing uh, uh, with, with the actions they could take to alleviate those circumstances. If the government was serious about bringing down gas prices in making sure we keep manufacturing jobs in this country, why would they cut over $50 million for the development of the Cooper and Attervale basins uh, to develop more gas for Australians? The truth is Australian governments have always been involved in the development of new oil and gas fields in this country. In the Bass Strait, it was the Menzies government at the time that provided a production credit, a drilling credit, uh, to uh, then uh, uh, BHP and SO uh, to develop that field, and it served Australia well for 50 years. Because drilling for new oil and gas fields is extremely risky, mm -hmm. uh, at the early stages of the de development it is very hard to make the sums stack up, even more so when you have a government uh, calling in 18 coal and gas projects right now. So the risks of paying up lots of money, hundreds of millions of dollars up front to drill, and you don't even know if you're going to get approval at the end of it, make it very, very difficult. So there is a public good in developing our own resources. Because let's be clear, the gas companies, I agree with Senator Hanson, the gas companies don't own the resource. It's owned by the Australian people. And so because it's owned by ourselves, we should seek to develop the knowledge and understanding of those resources so that we can attract further investment uh, from companies uh, to develop them. It is our resource. It's like owning a block of land. When you own a block of land, you try and market it. You want someone to buy it. You might, you might fence it. You might put some fences around it. You might do some stick picking on it to make some buyers interested in coming along and potentially developing it. Same principle here. It is our oil and gas. It is our resources. We should be doing that early work, that exploratory drilling to bring up, to de-risk those projects, to bring up the knowledge of it so that we can attract investment and bring down power bills and keep manufacturing jobs in this country. The government's decision to slash funding uh, from those, those activities is so short-sighted and it is so hypocritical because we have the Treasurer out there today saying that somehow he wants to find a solution for the manufacturers and gas industry of this country, yet in his budget only a month ago he slashed the very funding of development of resources that we could help uh, alleviate those resources. If only, only we, our factories could be, could be powered by the hypocrisy of this government, we would never have another problem with solve climate change. There's an infinite supply of hypocrisy from those opposite, but we can't bottle wishful thinking and help it to protect jobs in this country. We actually have to get our hands dirty and drill and support those people who work hard for our nation to develop our country. That's why we supported the gas industry when we were in government. I just wish this one would do the same. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Brockman. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on this matter of urgency, and I'm very happy to follow my, my colleagues, Senators Scar and Canavan, on the matter of gas policy in this country. And I think it's very important, uh, just following on from Senator Canavan in particular, to pick up on his point that we have two very different 
gas markets in Australia. We have an eastern, gas, uh, eastern states gas market, which is currently facing extraordinary cost pressures. But we also have a Western Australian gas market, a gas market in Western Australia that has been described recently in a major uh, uh, newspaper as providing Western Australia a low energy paradise. Um, and Western Australians are the largest gas consumers of any Australians. Now, did these things happen as a result of accident? No. And as you would know very well, Mr Acting Deputy President, they happened as a result of government policy led by Sir Charles Court of the Liberal Party. In fact, rather than the current gas reservations policy, um, it was the take or pay agreement that Sir Charles Court put in place with the North West Shelf project that actually enabled Western Australia to develop uh, the situation it currently has, where it has internationally recognised low glass prices, um, sufficient supply to meet industry demands. I, I would like to see that industry demand increase in actual fact. I would like to see more growth in Western Australia as a result of our uh, very cost effective gas prices. But not only did that gas policy provide West Australia with a very solid foundation of its own energy supply system, but it also meant that we could supply our major trading partners and allies with a very important uh, export commodity. Japan, a nation recognised largely, uh, widely as a, a, a positive environmental uh, advocate internationally, is our largest importer of LNG from Western Australia. Some 48 per cent of LNG from Western Australia actually goes to Japan. Uh, again, uh, Japan is widely seen as having very strong environmental credentials. But not only do we export to Japan, we are other, also export to other very important uh, trading partners. South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, China, India. L uh, West Australian LNG quite literally powers the world. And that is a very positive thing. Uh, these projects don't come at no cost. These projects require significant, significant uh, investment up front for returns that may come decades down the line. Uh, Scarborough, uh, uh, the Scarborough project in Western Australia has a cost of some $12 billion. Uh, now, that money needs to be invested, decided upon and invested long, long before any return from that investment is forthcoming. And we have a situation on the east coast, we have, on the west coast, we've seen those investments flow over a consistent period of time, thanks to good government policy starting with Sir Charles Court. On the east coast, sadly, we can't say that has been the case. As Senator Scar and Canavan pointed out, an underinvestment, particularly in a state like Victoria, in fact, not a, you can't even call it an underinvestment because it's been a regulatory block. It's been governments refusing to allow business to unlock the resources that do exist that has seen this current situation where we have a massive spike in gas prices. And I think the greatest irony then is when we see this government flailing around, what solutions has it actually managed to come up with? Well, it's come up with no solutions. It's come up with a few thought bubbles that really puzzle me. Price caps. As Senator Scar said, when have price caps ever solved a supply problem? I mean, never. And there's 2,000 years plus of history to demonstrate that point. What other solutions have they come up with? A new mining tax? A new tax on gas companies? I mean, do they really see that as being a solution to a price problem on the East Coast? And thirdly, they've come up with a regulatory fix. Well, safe to say, I don't think anyone on this side in this place has any faith in this government coming up with a sensible regulatory fix. Thank you, Senator Brockman. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Macdonald be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved <coughs> by Senator Macdonald uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as seller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as seller for the noes. Order, there being 26 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Senators. Uh, we'll now move to the consideration. Excuse me, Senators, if you could depart the chamber or resume your seats so we can continue. I shall now proceed to the consideration of a document uh, which is listed on page five of today's order of business. There being no speakers, I'll no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm at, I'm at item 14, so we're about to go to 15. Which, thank you, thank you, Senator Urquhart. We'll now move to the tabling. Oh, Senator Shoebridge. Yes. Uh, you only need to rise in your seat. You don't need to wave. No, Senator I just Shoebridge, feel item the ship was, 14, was the sailing on. At page five. Um, uh, I seek leave to table a report relating to the findings of the independent and Peaceful Australia Network, IPAN, people's inquiry into exploring the case for an independent and peaceful Australia entitled Charting Our Own Course. So Senator Shoebridge is seeking leave to table a document. Is leave granted? Yep. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Thanks to the Chamber. I table the report. Thank you very much. We will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition that contains 5,727 signatures calling on Football Australia to advocate for justice for workers injured or killed in the construction of the 2022 FIFA World Cup 
I understand the whips have agreed to give leave. Leave that to me. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. So you're free to table that, Senator Thorpe. Could I also seek leave to make a one-minute statement? No. Leave is not granted. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. We'll now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I pre present a statement on the committee's review of the regulation relisting Islamic State Somalia as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code Act 1995. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Urquhart. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present two reports as listed at item 15 of today's order of business. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to committee reports. Uh, present uh, go, com, government responses to committee reports. There being there being none, I'll move to. No, I think. No, no, sorry. Are you, so we're at uh, government responses to committee reports. There are none. So we then move to then we'll move to committee reports presented out of sitting. Senator White. Me. I rise to speak uh, to the Joint Select Committee report uh, on the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022, tabled out of session. In late September this year, the Attorney General referred consideration of the National Anti Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and the National Anti Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022, which we affectionately refer to as the NAC bills, uh, to a joint select committee with representatives from both houses. I was pri privileged to serve as chair of this committee. The committee subsequently invited organisations and interested members of the public to make submissions in relation to the provisions of the bills and, the, and held hearings across four days in October. On 10 November 2022, the committee's report was provided to the President of the Senate and tabled in the House of Representatives by uh, Dr Helen Haynes, the member for Indi and Deputy Chair of the committee. The report contained the unanimous view of all committee members that the creation of a National Anti-Corruption Commission was critical to restoring the public's trust and confidence in elected representatives and public officials. The committee was greatly assisted in its work by the contributions from a broad, broad range of views put by organisations and individuals from all states and territories, including trade unions, academics, civil society organisations, law societies, media organisations and government departments. More than 120 submissions were received and 40 organisations and individuals appeared at the committee's hearings. On behalf of the committee, I thank those who took the time to offer their views about the provisions of the legislation and for their thoughtful and considered contributions. In particular, the committee had the benefit of hearing from former and current commissioners and inspectors from state and territory-based anti-corruption bodies. Their experiences and the views they offered in relation to the functionality of the legislation in their jurisdictions and how the NAC bills could be improved were of invaluable assistance to the committee's work. I thank those that appeared before the committee for making the time to offer the, these contributions. I'd also like to express my thanks to the committee secretariat, who did an exemplary job of managing the submission and inquiry process and who were instrumental in the preparation of the committee's report. Their professional and hard work professionalism and hard work were deeply appreciated by the committee. I would also like to acknowledge the work and dedication of my own staff, Caitlin and Ben, in assisting me with this very important task. The committee's report ultimately made six recommendations for changes to the legislation. These changes include permitting witnesses involved in investigations to disclose relevant matters to a psychologist or other medical practitioners, adjusting the definition of corrupt conduct, extending the role of the inspector to include an audit function in relation to the use of coercive powers, clarifying that the commissioner can investigate matters on their own motion, ensuring that all persons within a media organisation are offered the protections in relation to disclosure of journal sources and requiring a person who is the subject of an investigation to be notified of the outcome. I'm pleased that the recommendations are now reflected in the government's proposed amendments to the legislation being debated now in the other place. 
The Attorney General is to be commended for moving uh, to introduce the, the NAC as, as soon as possible and for subjecting the provisions the, of the legislation to the scrutiny of the public and, public and the Joint Select Committee. The introduction of the National Anti-Corruption Commission represent, represents a watershed moment in Australian history. Transparency and accountability of our nation's parliamentarians and public officials is plainly a significant issue of concern for the electorate. This government is committed to restoring trust and confidence at a national level, and the creation of the National Anti-Corruption Commission is a significant part of a suite of reforms designed to achieve this outcome. I thank my fellow committee members for the dedication and commitment to collaboration they exhibited in the review process. The level of engagement and close attention to detail displayed by all members in the course of the public hearings and our, and our del deliberations was surely an example of parliament working at its best. For me, as a first-time chair, the bar set by the members of this committee is one all others will be measured against. I'm proud to commend the report and the NAC bills to the Senate. Thank you, Senator White. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. It's a real privilege to follow uh, the chair of the Select Committee, Joint Select Committee, that was looking at the NAC legislation. Uh, and I do want to make a number of comments in this regard. Um, firstly, I want to provide some acknowledgments, and secondly, I'd like to make a number of substantive points. Uh, with respect to acknowledgments, I think the, the chair of the Senate Joint Select Committee, uh, Senator White, did an absolutely outstanding job uh, chairing, the, chairing the Joint Standing Committee. It was a big ask uh, for a senator who's new to, new to this place to undertake that role, and I think uh, Senator White performed it uh, admirably uh, and did an outstanding job. Uh, there was a combination of the velvet glove uh, and the occasional, um, the occasional flourish of the iron fist. Uh, to bring the, uh, joint, bring the Joint Select Committee back to heel, um, and uh, it was a very, uh, it it was a very uh, effective, effective chairing. Uh, on one occasion, uh, committee members were aghast to see, uh, in uh, no less than the Australian Financial Review, the, uh, the chair's, uh, chair's role in this regard as constituting sit and steer. And uh, I'm left to reflect that uh, far from being sit and steer, it was more chair and coalesce, because uh, we did coalesce. We came together, all the members of the committee came together and made a unanimous report. And there's significance. There is great significance in the fact that members of the government, members of the opposition, uh, Senator Shoebridge representing the, the Greens, who also made an outstanding contribution uh, to the conduct of the committee, uh, and also Dr Helen Haynes from the other place. There's significance in the fact that everyone came together and made a unanimous report. Great significance. And I think uh, the NAC legislation uh, is far better uh, for the work of the committee than it would otherwise have been. And I think, uh, as Senator White said, this is, uh, this is parliament at its best. I would like to make um, one further acknowledgement before I raise a number of substantive points, and that is to the wonderful work of the Secretariat. I mean, it was outstanding. It was a very, very tight timetable, and the Secretariat uh, performed above and beyond. So uh, my heartfelt congratulations to them uh, in that regard. There are three points I'd like to make which uh, I think need to be reflected upon as we continue on this journey. The first is uh, the importance of the inspector. And it was the, the Roman poet Juvenal who coined the phrase, who is to watch the watchman? And in the context of a National Anti-Corruption Commission, which has, extraordinarily, uh, has extraordinary powers, coercive powers, in situations where privileges such, such as the privilege against self-incrimination, privilege surrounding uh, communications between a person and their lawyers, are to some extent abrogated, it is extremely important that the inspector have considerable ambit to audit the exercise of coercive powers by the NAC, um, but also has the resources, also has the resources to conduct that oversight uh, role. And, and that's something I think uh, we need to look at um, as we progress down this path. Second point I would like to make is in relation to uh, appointments. And I think uh, many of us on the committee uh, came to the view that 
whilst the legislation can say one thing, of great importance is who is actually appointed to the key roles at the NAC. Who is going to be the commissioner? Who is going to be the inspector? Who are going to be the deputy commissioners? Who is going to be the chief executive officer? And those role, the people who fill those roles will have uh, extraordinary powers, and it is very, very important that the right people are selected to those roles. In that respect, um, I've, I'm of the view, personally, I'm of the view that uh, the joint standing committee, which is going to be established under the bill to supervise the NAC, should actually achieve a supermajority in terms of selecting who those individuals are. I don't think it's good enough, from my personal perspective, for it just to be a simple majority uh, in circumstances where the parliamentary joint standing committee is chaired by a government member who has a casting vote. I think that is something which needs to be considered. Uh, I actually believe that in the vast majority of cases the parliamentary joint standing committee will act in a collegiate fashion and in, it is most likely that in the vast majority of cases that unanimous decisions are made with respect to accepting recommendations which are made with respect to appointments but I think it's a perception issue as much as anything it's important that there's a perception that um, that the government can't necessarily carry the day on its own with respect to the appointment to these important positions. And the third point I'd like to make is in relation to whistleblowers. We did hear some very uh, strong testimony that there needs to be there needs to be reform with respect to the management of whistleblowers in particular, so that whistleblowers, whether or not they're in the public sector, the private sector, are given the support and guidance they need in order to effectively discharge the important role which they conduct. And carry out in our civic society. And I think uh, the evidence is, is there that at this point in time uh, there's a maze of laws that need to be navigated by whistleblowers. And someone who in the private sector used to be a whistleblower officer in, um, in, for a major company, uh, I think it's absolutely important that whistleblowers have the courage to put up the red flag with respect to issues, should be given support and should be able to get the guidance which they need to, uh, to discharge their important role in our civic society. Um, and with that, um, I, uh, I look forward to uh, making further contributions during the debate on the bill. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I also rise to speak to the report on the inquiry into the NAC bill. And I'll start as well by um, thanking and commending the work of the chair and acknowledge Senator Scar's contributions in that regard. Um, the chair approached this in a very even-handed and collegiate way, um, sometimes um, uh, having to sort of uh, pull out the, uh, the, the, the velvet glove covering the iron fist to keep us on track. We had a very short amount of time. We had an overwhelming number of witnesses who wanted to come before us. And I think in four days, we, the committee, through those hearings, um, fully explored a number of the critical issues. So I do want to acknowledge the work of the chair. I think she did an excellent job keeping us all on track and, um, and ensured that the process itself um, was multi-partisan and, and a genuinely fair process. And I, and I do want to acknowledge also the work of the deputy chair, Dr Haynes, the member for Indi. Um, I acknowledge her work as well leading up to this bill. Um, and between them, the chair and the deputy chair, I think, formed a a, a, a pool of experience and common sense that got us through the inquiry and, and produced the final outcome, which was everybody on the committee supporting a national anti-corruption commission, no matter which their politics were, everyone on the committee, and I think it was a significant achievement, supported a national anti-corruption committee and of course commission. And of course it didn't come out of nowhere. And I do want to acknowledge the ongoing walk, work of Senator Waters. Um, who managed to get this, this chamber, a majority in this chamber, to pass a NAC bill in previous parliament, and we were that close to getting NAC legislation years ago, only to be deflected by, I think, some pretty toxic politics. And that's why I want to acknowledge the, the achievement in getting everybody on that committee to support getting a NAC bill legislated, hopefully legislated by the end of this year. Um, uh, but there are... Um, uh, there are a number of matters that I just want to put onto the record, some concerns about where we landed. Um, the first is, um, on behalf of my party, the Greens, we don't support Recommendation 5 of this committee, which seeks to narrow the definition of corruption. 
take away a generic de definition allowing the National Anti-Corruption Commission to investigate and, and pursue um, a, a broad definition of corruption. And, and what we say in relation to the, the moves that are being taken now to narrow the definition of corruption, what corruption do people not want the National Anti-Corruption Commission to look into? Please identify for us the corruption that you don't want the NAC to have jurisdiction for. And if you can do that in a coherent way, we'll listen. But until such time, we don't see any cause, um, any, any rational reason to narrow the definition of corruption and the jurisdiction for the Commission. One of the other issues that um, I, I think was a, a significant missed opportunity in the report was, was the failure to actually translate the evidence we got on public hearings and the necessity for public hearings and the importance for public hearings that did not translate into the appropriate recommendation from the committee. Um, we had current and former um, uh, commissioners from the New South Wales and the Victorian anti-corruption commissions come to us and say, from a New South Wales perspective, they found um, public hearings were essential for their anti-corruption work for a variety of reasons, not least of which it, 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 was, a, it was a check and balance on the anti-corruption commission itself that had to justify its work in public, justify fair processes in public, and having public hearings was actually a, an accountability measure on the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. And also, public hearings enabled witnesses who were otherwise not known to the Commission to see what was happening and bring forward critical evidence. And in relation to a number of, of, of inquiries by the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, those witnesses who have come forward after seeing public hearings have been essential for uncovering some deep and entrenched corruption and then fixing it in New South Wales. And we heard from the IBAC commissioner in Victoria how their legislation, which largely prohibits public hearings, in fact mirrors the proposed uh, model that we're seeing um, pushed by the, the, the government and the opposition and, and, and limits public hearings to whether exceptional circumstances, we had the IBAC commissioner come and say, don't repeat the mistakes in Victoria. Don't make the same mistakes. But unfortunately, we don't see that evidence. And also the evidence of advocacy groups, current and former judges, um, a, a slew of, of highly credentialed witnesses came and said, remove the exceptional circumstances test, allow public hearings to be held in the public interest. But unfortunately, the committee's report does not reflect that evidence. And I think that's a significant mistake, and I can assure you now it will be an ongoing work of our party. And we hope, we hope with goodwill, a majority in this chamber in the Senate, to fix that obvious mistake in the bill. When it comes to inspectors, um, we also heard some compelling evidence from Bruce McClintock, SC, amongst others, um, who's the current inspector of the New South Wales um, um, ICAC and I think also has, is the inspector of the Northern Territory equivalent. His compelling evidence was the proposed role for the inspector in the current bill is far too narrow. Basically, the inspector, who's effectively a, a permanent ombudsman, over, should be a permanent ombudsman oversighting the, the role of the, the NAC, in the federal model, in the proposed model we see in the bill, the inspector is really just a mini NAC of NAC, whose jurisdiction is only limited to seeing whether or not there's serious or systemic corruption in the NAC. Now, that is very, very unlikely to ever occur. And it's not the role we see for inspectors in state and territory equivalents, who effectively are a, a check and balance on an anti-corruption commission with their extraordinary royal commission powers to ensure those powers aren't being abused, to ensure that natural justice is delivered, and, and to be a, uh, an on-the-beat ombudsman focused on fair processes. And we think there's a lot of work for this chamber to do to expand the role of the inspector in the debate. Could I also say, when it comes to journalist protection, I, I acknowledge the, that the recommendation from the inquiry is to, is to increase journalist protections. We sought to have, well, I sought on behalf of my party, to have those recommendations strengthened in the, com in the committee hearing. And I'm glad to see that tabled today from the government's proposed amendments um, are a, a proposed amendment to go further than the committee recommendation and to strengthen 
again some of the protections from journalists to ensure wherever a warrant is being sought against a journalist that the public interest in protecting journalism, protecting their sources, um, protecting um, their important role, um, their accountability role, that will be, must be considered in any warrant. I think, we, again, we need to go further, and there is a very powerful case to ensure that warrants um, for the production of evidence um, or for the attendance of journalists are contestable by journalists, um, and, and in that regard, the UK example was, 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 was reported to us in the committee as the best example going forward. I'll, I'll finish on this. The, the proposed oversight of this committee is by a, of, of, sorry, the proposed oversight of the National Anti-Corruption Commission is for a government-dominated committee, um, where the government, through the chair, will have the casting vote and will be able to control the operations of the oversight committee. Of course, the principal role of the National Anti-Corruption Commission will be to hold the government to account. It's largely to hold the executive account, not just sometimes um, non-government senators and MPs go rogue, but it's largely to hold the government to account. Therefore, having a government-controlled committee, dominated committee, as the principal oversight mechanism is a, is a significant problem in the bill. Um, I note the proposition by Senator Scar. Um, and it's a matter that he pursued in the hearings, uh, that at least on the choice of, commi of commissioner there should be a supermajority. Um, that, that is, of course, one of the options to, to remove some of that executive monopoly um, power that's proposed in the current bill. The other option, of course, is to ensure that the chair cannot be a member of the government, so that the government does not have a, a majority on that committee. And that's important not just for the selection of the commissioner or commissioners. It's also important for ensuring that there's independent funding. And in that regard, again, it was a, it was a missed opportunity for the committee not to recommend the same committee oversight processes that apply to the audit office should also apply to the oversight of the NAC. Um, but I, I want to finish on this. Uh, if you took us back two years and you took this parliament back two years, the idea that we would see politicians from across the political spectrum <coughs> unite around our support for a national anti-corruption commission, that probably would have seemed close to unachievable. But we managed to achieve it in the committee. I commend the chair, I commend the deputy, and I commend all members of the committee for working towards that goal, and let's get this done. Thank you. Uh, Senator Shearidge, <coughs> would you be seeking to continue your remarks? Uh, yes, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. Cancel that. Uh, we will now. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Minister for Northern Australia, Ms. King, I table a ministerial statement on developing Northern Australia. Anyone else? Uh, Senator MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much. And I rise to take note of uh, Minister King's ministerial statement on Northern Australia, because it is Northern Australia that is the top half of the country, 51 per cent of the land mass, home to 1.3 million people, and yet, as we know, it produces so much of the country's wealth and could be capable of producing so much more. But under this government, Northern Australia is like the submerged part of an iceberg. It's popping up, uh, propping up everything, but mostly keeping out of sight. We've got mining, agriculture, tourism and defence. So much opportunity, so much potential. We just need water. We just need infrastructure, insurance relief. We need population and, above all, belief. We need belief from those people who are in a position to pull the levers to truly grow Northern Australia. And as part of the coalition government in the last term, we recognise that in the economic development and prosperity uh, for Northern Australia, because it is truly our heart and lungs. And it is this part of the country uh, that is so important to us, and yet Labor is treating it like an appendix. Just recently, we've had the Prime Minister 
at the G20 talking about food security and Australia's role in feeding a good part of the world. Now, that is a terrific aspiration. We know that Queensland farmers and graziers, uh, our very efficient supply chains, um, are all delivering a fantastic, high-quality product. But how could we do more? How could we provide more food security to the rest of the world? Well, it is from that place called Northern Australia. And I was devastated to see that uh, so many water projects that we had worked so hard to get into the north were scrapped under this budget. Uh, we had a proposal for Richmond for an irrigation scheme, uh, for Huondon, both of their irrigation schemes, uh, Charters Towers, Big Rocks Weir is still going ahead, 10,000 megalitres. The big project at Hellsgate Dam is gone. The Bowen Pipeline is gone. Urana Dam is gone. Uh, these are all projects that was going to build the potential to grow more food in northern Australia. And with the floods in the south, this has, become, has been drawn into stark relief of what happens when half the country, some of the most productive agricultural regions of the nation, uh, are having a natural disaster like these current floods. Now, more than ever, we need to invest in the sort of water infrastructure, road infrastructure that have been proposed by the coalition to continue building food security. Uh, this is important not just for Australia and to get food around this country, but to grow additional food to be able to provide it to our near neighbours. Uh, it's been identified by the UN uh, a peace conference recently. Uh, and in other places where we are talking about food security being a critical element of the world's challenges. And, uh, and it is in northern Australia, uh, the place of such great rich soils, of big river systems, uh, great climate, technical know-how, proximity to markets, all good reasons why we should be uh, continuing to invest in the north. Uh, and we were growing this food bowl, as I said, $1.7 billion locked in to expand irrigation ar agriculture in central and north Queensland. Uh, but providing uh, irrigation uh, in these parts of the country would have provided uh, additional horticultural places, particularly during the winter months where already uh, regions like Bowen and um, uh, that the, the surrounds are providing 70 per cent of the nation's tomatoes and capsicums. What more could we do with the secure water supply? In the north, we also have mineral fertilisers, huge deposits of phosphate. Uh, it is so important that we continue to access the minerals that are critical to fertiliser production and ensure Australia's own supply chains. Uh, the, I want to acknowledge the Collaborative Research Centre for Northern Australia. Uh, what an energetic and terrific organisation that is. It has conducted tropical uh, crop trials, uh, high demand spices, aquaculture, increased beef production, to name but a few. And it is ter terrifically important that we continue to support the diversification of, of uh, crops and bring more people into that region. 40 per cent of northern Australia is owned or managed by Indigenous people who make up about 15 per cent of the population. Uh, and not every Indigenous person wants to be a ranger. Uh, when we look at things like the Indigenous References Group, chaired by the energetic Colin Saltmere, um, who's looking at spinifex production for a range of uh, potential uh, projects. When we look at uh, some of the great mining projects, in northern Australia. These are all uh, meaningful, purposeful jobs and careers that should be available to Indigenous young people as well as the rest of the population living in northern Australia. And the removal of infrastructure investment is incredibly concerning to those communities who are left without meaningful, purposeful jobs and investment. De-risking investment uh, is incredibly important, and that was the projects that we were doing uh, to encourage trillions of dollars of superannuation funds to invest into northern Australia rather than sending it overseas. Um, we have incredible resources, gas, coal, bauxite, rare earths such as vanadium and, of course, uranium. Uh, vanadium, if I misspoke, and, of course, uranium. And as the world moves to batteries, Northern Australia can be an exporter of choice of critical minerals or, better still,
build the factories in northern Australia ourselves instead of exporting other commodities, value add right here in this nation. But are our roads and rail to standard? Are ports big enough to handle increased freight? Are the bridges weight rated to allow for exports, but also for imports? At the moment, there are terrific uh, projects going ahead for um, uh, renewable energy, and yet we cannot get them off the port at Gladstone uh, and into the places where they're to be built because the bridges are not weighted, are not uh, weight rated to a level that they can be moved through there. Um, so we have been spending. The coalition has been really focused on serious planning, planning to invest these kind of infrastructure dollars. And the centrepiece of the plan was the Regions of Growth, Growth Initiative, which linked state. Uh, uh, and territory governments, local governments, as well as the federal government uh, and the Indigenous References Group to really plan where this infrastructure was most required, transformative infra infrastructure. And so the first three master plans that were identified, Mount Isa to Townsville, Beetaloo to Catherine and Darwin and Broome to Kununurra to Darwin, were all incredibly important uh, regions of growth that the master planning process was identifying what is the most important infrastructure uh, development to happen in, those, in that place. Now, the priorities included Indigenous economic growth, building capacity and supporting businesses and entrepreneurs, energy, affordability and supporting infrastructure, supply chain infrastructure of roads and rail, airports, storage and logistics, communications of black spots and bandwidth, water infrastructure, as I've already spoken about, to support agriculture and industry development, affordable insurance to support households and businesses, critical mineral development of value add and diversification, and of course tourism recovery, which bounced back so strongly during COVID, a workforce training uh, and education, assist addressing the critical skill shortage and labour supply which is in short, uh, short supply right across the country. And of course, important social services focusing on housing, health and aged care. So I am proud of our record in government. We started the focus on Northern Australia and I encourage Minister King uh, to continue holding Northern Australia in the similar regard. I want to thank all the MPs who've been involved in Northern Australia over the recent years. Uh, former Ministers Keith Pitt, Barnaby Joyce, Senator Matt Canavan and Josh Frydenberg and former Assistant Minister Michelle Landry. I also acknowledge all of the mayors, the Northern Australian mayors, the businesses, the miners, the farmers, the fishermen, the risk takers, the battlers and the visionaries who are proud to call Northern Australia home. Because I too am proud to call Northern Australia home. It is my goal to ensure our government pulls every lever implements every good idea to ensure that you and your children's children have a long and prosperous future. So I say to you that Northern Australia is more than just a place on a map. It's Australia's king of regions, and the coalition will continue to ensure it is treated as such. Uh, thank you. The question is that the Senate take note of the statement. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, ayes have it. Uh, committee memberships. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to appoint a senator to a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. There be no objection. I move that Senator Cadell be appointed as a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works. Uh, and do I put, can I put the, question? Uh, the, the question is that the uh, motion be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The clerk. Business of the Senate orders of a day number one, tabling of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report on the Privacy Legislation Amendment, Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022. Uh, Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports and legislation as listed at item, item number 19 on today's order of business together with accompanying documents. Thank you. 
And the clock. The clock. Government business, orders of the day number two, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022, in committee. The committee is considering the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022. The question that the bill as amended be agreed to. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Correct. Uh, there's a few amendments, so we'll go to you, Senator Farigi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Greens Amendments 1 through to 10 on sheet. One seven three nine. Leave granted. Yes, leave is granted. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the bill, as is drafted, allows providers to give educators employed in their centres a discount on their services. Um, and while um, yes, this does provide. Uh, sorry, this discount is intended to assist in attracting and retaining educators, and it does provide a little bit of that benefit, but it is completely inadequate in that purpose. And I think um, uh, we support this measure because it does provide support to educators. But importantly, it is a bit unfair because it excludes many of the other staff at centres. So we see no reason why other staff who are not educators but still work at um, early childhood education and care centres and do the important work should not be included in this. These staff are necessary for the functioning of early childhood education and care centres uh, and should not miss out on this discount. You know, for example, as noted by Good Start Early Learning during the inquiry, centre cooks are also captured under the Children's Services Award and excluding them creates inequity in a centre. Centre cooks play a crucial role in ensuring the health and well-being of children, um, and yet they have the highest rates of attrition in centre staff. Um, the government should, as a matter of fairness, provide them, but also other centre staff, with access to discounted early childhood education and care services. So this amendment makes the bill uh, much more fair and more generous by extending the permissible educator discount to all staff employed in early childhood education and care. Uh, and I know that Senator Pocock has an amendment which extends this discount, but only to cooks. It does not include other staff. So um, I believe that it should include all the staff who work at a centre and who are part and parcel of the functioning of our children's education. Um, so I move the amendment, and I do urge senators to support this amendment. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I, I thank Senator Fariki for her uh, contribution. Um, the government won't be supporting uh, this amendment as we do think it requires further consideration and consultation. Um, expanding the measure would place uh, an unreasonable burden on smaller providers who cannot afford to offer the discount, uh, and that could cause issues with uh, fair competition as well. Um, so we, we will not be supporting uh, this amendment as moved by uh, Senator Fruki. Seeking the call. So, oh, sorry, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, similar uh, reasoning. This, you know, this is something in discussions with childcare providers. Cooks were put forward. I think there needs to be more modelling done, and you know, the review of this bill should include that uh, to look at the cost of widening that scope, what the effect will be on on uh, on smaller centres. So, I also will not be supporting this amendment. Else? So the question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Aye. No. I believe the noes have it. 
Division required? Ring the bells. Four minutes. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments be agreed to. The amendments are 1 to 10, moved by Senator Faruqi on, from sheet 1739. Those for the amendments, for the question to the right of me, no, to the left of me, I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar for the noes.
Is there anyone else, Nick, you'd like me to choose occasionally? Or you, We now come uh, to sheet 1741, amendments in the name of Senator Pocock. I, I seek, I seek leave. You can move. I move, you don't need I'll just move. Um, I move the amendments uh, circulated in my name 1 to 11 on sheet 1741. You do need leave to move them together. So I'll take it that you've sought leave. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, I'll move them again. No. Yeah. Uh, please speak to them if you wish. I, you have the call to speak to the amendment. I'm happy just to let it, let it go. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give the call to anyone else in the chamber that wishes to speak to these amendments. Minister, you'll have another opportunity later just, if you wish. Just, just indicating the government will be supporting uh, these amendments as moved by Senator Pocock. Senator Fruki. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, the Greens will also be supporting Senator David Pocock's amendments because they go um, a little way to what the Greens' amendments were. Um, but I do want to point out the inconsistency of Labour's position, the inconsistent, contradictory and illogical to back an amendment to change the title of the bill, which was exactly, almost exactly the same as the Greens' amendment. So Senator Pocock's amendment changes the title of the long title of the bill. Uh, changing, yes, well, obviously, obviously, <laughs> obviously more persuasive. Changing the title, the short title of the bill, as was the Greens amendment, would actually have been a more significant change, a more meaningful way to change the discourse around respect for early educators. But Labour has taken the easy way out by agreeing to changing the long title but maintaining the disrespectful language of cheaper childcare in the bill. Obviously and clearly, politics has been at play. Are there any other contributions on this amendment or any other contributions in general? Because I intend to put the question. I'm putting the, I'll put the question that the amendments be agreed to, and these are amendments on sheet 1741, moved by Senator Pocock. I put the question, all, for, all those for the amendment say aye. aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Any other contributions in committee? Otherwise, I'll, I'll move to the procedure to take us out of committee and report progress. No. Uh, that's right. No senators in. Oh, Minister, um, I move the report be adopted. Uh, okay. Not yet, Minister. Mm. I was just seeking a. Whether any member wanted a final contribution, I'll now move. The question is now that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. With an amendment to the title. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.
committee. Uh, the committee has considered the fam Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022. The bill has, uh, the bill has been amended and agreed to. Minister. Uh, I move the report be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move the bill be read a third time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. Uh, government business orders of the day number three social services and other legislation amendment workforce incentive bill 2022 in committee Got that wording. Just getting ourselves organised, Senator Rice. I've seen you wanting the call. Honourable Senators, uh, we are considering com committee the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. And the question before the committee is that the bill will be agreed to. Senator Rice, you have the call. I understand you're in, you moved amendments on sheet 1698, and some have been dealt with, and you are now going to proceed with other amendments. Is that Thank you. you have the call. Thank you, Deputy President. Yes, I wish to move my amendment number two on sheet one six, whatever it is. Where is it? One, one six nine eight, um, which is to extend the work bonus to other income re report, income support recipients. This bill, as we know, creates a work bonus so that aged pensioners are able to earn significantly more before their, their pension gets reduced, which is a good thing. We're supporting this bill. But it really goes and po points attention to the fact that you have got people on other income support benefits who aren't getting the same benefit. And in fact, they are even more deserving of being able to earn more because their income support is considerably less. Whereas aged pensioners get $73 a day, people on JobSeeker only get $48. Whereas this bill is going to allow aged pensioners to earn up to an extra $11,800 in work bonus over a year, JobSeekers could only earn a work credit of $1,000 before their benefits get slashed. And in, face, and in fact, they face an effective marginal tax rate of somewhere between $60 and $80 for every extra dollar that they're earning when they take a few extra shifts that are available, when they might take the opportunity to do the work that's there so that they can pay a, pay a few bills, they can get the lawnmower fixed, they can pay off a loan that somebody has, has very generously given them. So what this amendment would do is to extend that work bonus that we are now going to put into legislation for aged pensioners to other income, report, other income support recipients to allow them also to get the benefits, to allow people on JobSeeker, people on the disability support pension, people on youth allowance to be able to earn more so that they too 
don't have to suffer the huge increase in the cost of living, that they might actually, at least in some weeks, be able to scrape by and afford to put food on the table, as well as pay the rent, as well as pay for their medical costs. Does anyone else have a contribution? Minister. Um, uh, Deputy President, just to indicate that the government uh, will not support uh, this amendment. Uh, the, the purpose uh, of the bill uh, is to provide uh, the relief and the incentive that has been set out uh, uh, at the Jobs and Skills Summit by the proponents of the bill more broadly uh, in the community uh, and by the government to uh, extend that support to uh, uh, age, uh, age pensioners, um, uh, categories of people on veterans' payments. Um, the, the effect of uh, adopting uh, the amendment proposed by the Greens party would be a very significant change to the bill. Indeed, it would take it away from its uh, primary purpose uh, and, in our view, would have unintended consequences. Now, I understand that that is not material for the proposers of the amendment because um, they want to make a political point about the system more broadly. I um, un understand that. Um, I do appreciate that some of those points have been made, and I appreciate the, po the, the manner in which they have been made over the course of uh, yesterday, and I expect some more uh, today. But the government won't be supporting uh, this amendment, uh, and, um, and I urge the Senate uh, not to support it either. So, Dillingham? Briefly indicate the opposition won't be supporting this amendment. Are there any other contributions? Otherwise, I'll put the question. I put the question that the request for amendment be agreed to, on, and that is request number two on sheet 1698, as moved by Senator Rice. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. I'm intending to ring for four minutes, unless guided otherwise. Four. Yep.
find it better. <laughs> find it better. Lock the doors. Order. The question before the committee is that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The request is request number two on sheet 1698 as moved by Senator Rice. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those against to the left. I appoint as a teller for the eyes. Senator McKim and a teller for the nose, Senator Scar. <laughs> Is it the second time? <laughs> Honourable Senators, there have been 12 ayes and 28 noes. It's passed in the negative. Senator Rice. Um, Deputy President, I now want to move item four on sheet um, 1698, which would raise the rate of income support to all income support recipients to $88 a day, to above the poverty line. And I know the government is going to say, oh, you're just making a political point. This is not a political point. This is an attempt to improve the lives of millions of Australians who are living in poverty, who are starving, who are suffering from malnutrition, who are suffering from scurvy, who cannot afford to live in a home at the same time as putting food on the table, at the same time as paying their medical bills. We can afford this, and this parliament, this government, should be doing this. While they are not doing this, meanwhile they are saying we're going to go ahead with the stage three tax cut and give the richest people in our country, give the billionaires, give the wealthy $250 billion over the next 10 years. That's the choice that's being made. Poverty is a political choice, and the Greens have decided that we will not stand for it any longer. We are going to take every opportunity we can to be advocating, to be pushing, to be working so hard for the people who are quagmired in poverty at the moment. We need to raise the rate of income support. We need to raise it above the poverty line. We need to raise it above $88 a day, and we need to do it now. Minister. Thanks. Uh, the, um, the government will not be supporting this amendment. And thank you for the, uh, 
Thank you for the uh, cheers. Um, the, the position that Senator Rice advocates, uh, she, I'm, I welcome the fact that she adopts it. Uh, there are many people in the community who, who live on the new start rate and find it very difficult uh, to live on that rate. Uh, the government has made it very clear that if we could raise the rate, that we would, and that we will consider it in the light of every budget. Now, uh, the government is responsible for managing uh, the fiscal circumstances of the budget. We've made it clear that we will consider it in the light of every budget uh, in terms of its circumstances as we come on, and we will not be supporting the amendment today. Senator Dunningham. Chair, yeah, I'll again briefly indicate that. Uh, pardon? That's an outrageous thing to say, but we won't be supporting this amendment. So. Are there any other contributions? Otherwise, I'll put the question. I put the question that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The request I refer to is request number four on sheet 1698, as moved by Senator Rice. Those to the question pass to the right of the. Sorry. Uh, those to the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Put the question. The question before the chair is that the request for an amendment be agreed to. Request four on sheet 1698. Those past the right of me to the left. I pointed the teller, Senator McKim. I pointed the teller for the eyes, the teller for the nose, Senator Scar. Senators, there being 13 ayes and 26 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Rice, I understand that the further amendment request one on sheet 1698 is contingent. Yes, is so I'll withdraw. Yep, so I'm happy to withdraw that um, further amendment. Do you wish me to give you the call for a further contribution? No. We now come to an opposition amendment. Uh, on sheet 1681, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I move requests one and two uh, and seek leave to do so together on sheet 1681. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Chair. And um, look, I've outlined the Coalition's rationale for these requests in the second reading debate, but just to quickly recap, um, obviously uh, there's been a lot said about our desire to improve the capacity for pensioners and other recipients of income support to be able to access or uh, contribute to the economy and uh, receive income without it penalising them. Currently under subsection 1073AA of the Social Security Act, um, pensioners are limited to earning income concessions of up to 300 bucks over a, an instalment period of 14 days. Um, the amendment we're request we're making here rather is um, in relation to doubling that amount um, to six hundred dollars uh, and enabling those recipients of the pension payment to continue to receive that without the um, penalty that they would otherwise be uh, exposed to noting of course all of the benefits that flow from that given the uh, worker shortages we have across Australia uh, particularly in regional communities, a couple of the points that have been made by organisations like the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, where they said, of course, in its pre-budget submission um, of last December, there's an army of older workers with the skills Australia needs who would still like to work but don't participate in the workforce as it reduces their pensions. Uh, and the same organisation, in its submission to the Senate inquiry on the bill we're debating now, uh, stated, considering the deeply rooted labour market conditions, faltering productivity rates and downgrades to domestic and international economic forecasts, these amendments will end long before challenges facing businesses and the economy are solved. And of course, that relates to uh, the provisions the government have contained in their legislation without uh, the further changes made by the coalition um, that the coalition is proposing now. So, on that basis, I would commend uh, the, uh, the proposal before the chair to senators um, and seek their support. Minister. Well, um, 
the, the oppositions. That I'm, I'm grateful for them uh, dealing with them cognately, but they don't really stack up uh, singly or together. Um, they aren't affordable. Um, they won't incentivise older Australians to take up work in the immediate term, where the workplace shortages that they claim to be concerned about are. Um, after a decade of mismanagement of this area, a trillion dollars in debt and very little to show for it, uh, these guys, these guys want to uh, double, uh, double the incentive. I mean that it's not serious. It's not a serious proposition. Um, it's not supported by anybody serious uh, out there in industry. Um, and we can't sustain about it as we go about a focused approach uh, on sustainable budget repair. Now, the former government used social services as a political football. Uh, you know, a new minister in social services about every 12 months. Uh, they didn't take social services seriously either. Uh, and the idea that uh, the new opposition can claim to have an interest in uh, labour shortages uh, after a decade of policy failure in this area, uh, falling uh, productivity, falling wages, falling capital expenditure and achieving the remarkable uh, achievement uh, of, uh, of uh, a, 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 a an enormous reduction in uh, temporary labour. Uh, the idea that they'd come here today proposing to double the incentive is pretty extraordinary, and the government urges the Senate to oppose the amendment. Senator Rice, you set the call. Yes, um, the Greens won't be supporting this amendment. Um, we um, negotiated with the government to get an amendment in the, in the House to extend the time period of this scheme through until December next year, and we think that that's a good period of time to be having this workplace bonus in place. We're happy towards the end of next year, potentially, to see whether it should be continued, but at this stage we are not supportive of um, moving uh, the amendment that would um, amend it, extend it now. Are there any other contributions? Otherwise, I'll put the question. I put the question that the request for amendments be agreed to. The requests are 1 and 2 on sheet 1681, uh, moved by the opposition, Senator Dunningham. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is the division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the request for amendments be agreed to. The amendments are requests one and two on sheet 1681, moved by Senator Dunningham. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the ayes, Senator Cadell, and teller for the noes, uh, Senator Shikoni. Honourable Senators, there being 29 ayes and 34 noes, it's passed in the negative. Thanks, Thomas. No worries. <laughs> Does any honourable senator have a further contribution on this bill? Otherwise, I intend to put the questions and take us out of committee. No honourable senators indicated they wish to make a further contribution, so I'll put the necessary questions. The question is now that the bill stand is printed. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022 and agreed to it without amendment. Minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Government business orders of the day number four, emergency response fund amendment, disaster ready fund bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Davey. Deputy President. Look. It seems somewhat incongruous that 
we are debating a bill that changes its name, moves money from one pocket to another, from response to emergency uh, management to mitigation projects, while across the eastern states we have thousands of people displaced by floods, children who can't go to school, parents who are probably a bit traumatised about what to do next, communities, including my hometown, on evacuation orders, and uh, you know, immeasurable losses that we're facing. We've had crop losses across the eastern seaboard, and not just the crops that are in the ground, but we have opportunity loss as well, because we can't get the tractors on the paddocks to sow the summer crops. We can't get the harvesters on the paddocks to take off or salvage any winter crops that we may have had. We have a town in the Southern Riverina right now that is absolutely isolated. People had until one o'clock today to be escorted out of town. And uh, if they miss that window, they are in that town because while the town is above, above the floodwaters, every road in and out of town is closed. Some properties will remain isolated for weeks, if not longer. The way the floodwaters move in the Southern Riverina is slow, and I mean slow. Personally, my front driveway is about to be blocked off. We'll be taking a tinny across to the main road to get to the shops. But against all that sadness and all the hardship, I am so proud to be part of a coalition who, when we were in government, mm -hmm. we established the Emergency Response Fund, we established the disaster recovery funding arrangements that are being used by the current government as we speak, which provides a method of partnership between state and federal governments so that we can respond without delay, so that we don't have to wait for the layers and layers of bureaucracy to come into play. And the Emergency Response Fund invested in this sort of work to help focus resources and the important work of both mitigation and, when we were in government, response. For many at this present time, planning for prevention is not the front of mind issue. Uh, I, certainly what people are looking at is how do we clean up, how do we patch up and how do we move forward. But I do agree that we do need to assess how we can be better and, and this bill does actually help to do that. The two main policy changes in this bill are a renaming, uh, but also to swap the primary responsibility of this bill from what we had as response to actually um, funding preparedness and mitigation activities so that communities can be better prepared for future disasters, be they flood, fire, cyclone or any other natural disaster. I mean, earlier this year we would have liked to have thought that the floods were behind us. March was dreadful. The northern rivers devastated. And the northern rivers are absolutely looking at not only how to build back better, but how to mitigate for what the future may hold. And there is so much work that needs to continue to rebuild Lismore and the Northern Rivers areas. But now we're seeing flood after flood. We've seen the community of Broke in the Hunter have multiple floods in just months. We're seeing Forbes facing river peak after river peak. 
Echuca, Shepparton, Swan Hill, Daniloquin, Moolamine, Canago, my little home village. We've only just reopened our pub after eight years. Our pub burnt down eight years ago. We've just reopened it in October, and they are now sandbagging as much as possible in the hope to restore or to protect the brand new flooring that they've put in. So in 2019, we set up the Emergency Response Fund, our government, the coalition government, and the intention was for it to be an investment fund so that we had money ready for when disasters hit. And this in initial investment would grow over time and did grow over time. As at the end of December last year, the balance was $4.7 billion. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's an increase from the $3.97 billion initial investment. But as uh, this, the current minister, Senator Murray Watt, um, who I rate, who I work very well with, but when he was shadow minister, almost from the time the fund was established, he criticised the government for not spending the money even when we didn't have a disaster to respond to. He believed we had a crystal ball and that we could have predicted the level of damage caused by the one in 500 year Lismore floods. That we could have predicted that we would have three consecutive La Nina events that would lead to what is happening at the moment. Well, we didn't think that. We thought we needed to be ready to pay for the repairs when natural disaster hits. But I do acknowledge that preparedness and mitigation is very, very important. And the opposition, uh, sorry, I'm the opposition, the government, the now government, when they were in opposition, they made a commitment that they would spend 200 million annually to for disaster prevention. This bill delivers on that commitment that they made. But what this bill lacks is the critical detail about how they will do that, what the money will cover, how pro pro potential projects will be assessed, transparency as to how the funds will be dispensed, what prioritisation they will have, how it will be dispersed amongst the states. In introducing this bill into the House of Representatives, it was evident that much of this important administrative and financial probity detail was missing. As we know, the Senate Selection of Bills Committee raised concerns. The Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee held public inquiries. And while there was overall support for the intent of the legislation, concerns were raised about the why and how of its operation. The insurance industry believed 200 million annually is a bare minimum. The Red Cross in their evidence suggested there should be a significant proportion of the fund directed to building social and human resilience for people and communities. On the other hand, the Australian Local Government Association suggested the bulk of the monies needed to be directed to local government for local mitigation projects and infrastructure and be allowed to build back better because that's where it's needed to start. Other witnesses raised a number of issues from better data collection, improved accountability and accessibility and overall better access to information. But that's what's missing in this bill. I asked the Local Government Association about their reference to build back better and whether there is a grey area between recovery and mitigation. Their response was clearly that it's very important to have a sharp and clear definition about the fact that this funding in the future, if this bill passes, can only be used for mitigation infrastructure and that local government advocates for, for a formula and needs-based funding arrangement that is transparent. Other witnesses and submitted, uh, submitters indicated 
for a need to determine who the stakeholders might be and how and what funds could be used for, how projects are prioritised and how the jurisdictions are all covered. My concerns expressed at the inquiry and since around these grey areas uh, and around the recovery and mitigation. We know some local government areas were in the process of building mitigation projects but have been delayed by their current floods or by the lack of labour or by the inability to get materials. Now, I know that we don't have that crystal ball, that we can't predict. We can look at the models, we can make our best guess, but that is not a silver bullet. And we all need to always be prepared for disaster. But I am willing to support this bill with an amendment uh, that improves the transparency of the bill and improves the accountability on whoever is in government in the future. There are many examples of impacts that have not been expected or previously experienced. Take, for example, Ugaura. They were prepared, preparing for a flood. They thought the waters would come on. They didn't expect a tsunami. I agree that we do need to invest in resilience and building measures and risk reduction. And that's why our government committed out of our emergency response fund 150 million for the Northern Rivers uh, resilience and mitigation projects that will be advised by work that is currently being done by the CSIRO. But we don't have the luxury of doing that in isolation from current and repetitive events. Right now, our communities are asking us to rebuild. We are learning, and the latest floods have shown us that we need to reconsider where and how we build houses, roads, bridges and other transport routes. And I acknowledge that the current minister has finally accepted that, despite when the former natural resources, uh, natural <laughs> recovery and response commissioner, said the same thing. The guy who's now our minister called for him to be sacked. There has been much talk now about planning laws, and those discussions need to be had, but we also need to acknowledge that we have allowed planning and development on flood plains, and we need to work with those communities on what works best for them. The opposition will support this bill. We will be moving an amendment to make it more transparent. We cannot underestimate the current fragility of our rural and regional communities. We pride ourselves on our toughness and our ability to get on with the job. But large parts of Australia are at present struggling, and they need to know that we are going to stand by them in both recovery and future mitigation efforts. So I implore the government to make sure that while moving this funding from recovery to mitigation projects, that they don't turn their back on the funding that will be required following these floods, this latest round of disaster. The roads infrastructure that needs to be repaired alone is going to require a significant commitment from government. So I implore government not to forget this hard task at hand, but we will support the bill uh, with an amendment for this um, emergency response fund. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to speak to the Disaster Ready Fund Bill, and I want to acknowledge the experience of Senator Davey and the towns that she spoke of. 
and the experience of so many farmers and others, communities who are today dealing with disasters across our country. This bill is not spending any more money on natural disasters. It's simply reprofiling $150 million set aside for recovery spending to be spent on public works to minimise the impact of disasters when they strike. Instead of $50 million for preventative work and $150 million on recovery, the entire $200 million will be spent solely on disaster readiness rather than mixed in pre- and post-disaster response. The Productivity Commission and the insurance industry have made it crystal clear that spending on disaster prevention saves much more money than just spending on cleanup after climate fueled disasters strike. This will only become more obvious if we continue to let the climate crisis continue on its current path. A government's first duty is to keep its citizens safe, so we should be spending more on resilience. For this reason, the Greens support the principle of recalibrating all of the emergency response funds allocations to pre-disaster preparedness. However, the funds on offer do not go anywhere near what is required to keep Australians safe from coal and gas fueled natural disasters. Further, this investment is completely undercut by the funds' investment in fossil fuels and the government's continued handouts to the fossil fuel industry. For example, we saw the government recently provide $1.5 billion in the budget to expand Australia's gas industry in the Northern Territory. You can't claim to be putting out the fire while pouring petrol on it. This is why the Greens are moving amendments to increase the spending cap from $200 million to $300 million a year and to require the Future Fund in its management of the Disaster Ready Fund to ensure that the fund is not invested in fossil fuels. It's a rich irony, which cannot be lost on so many Australians, that the Disaster Ready Fund is invested in the very same coal, gas and oil companies whose activities are causing the climate emergencies that the fund has been set up to mitigate. Companies like Woodside, Chevron, Santos, Whitehaven, which have no plans to diversify, they just are taking actions which are destructive of our planet. When this bill passes the parliament and becomes the Disaster Ready Fund, it will start off holding 21.2 million in coal, oil and gas companies. This is like a hospital being funded by dividends from tobacco companies. The Future Fund, which manages, manages the Disaster Ready Fund, has a staggering $3.4 billion invested in the world's biggest 50 polluters. If the Future Fund isn't going to extract, uh, instruct its fund managers to engage with those companies to stop them opening new fields and to move away from destroying the planet, then they should simply divest. We're experiencing the impacts of the fossil fuel emitting activities of these companies across Australia right now. Nationwide, 200 local government areas are disaster declared, including about 75 in New South Wales alone. The floods have taken a toll on the national economy with the agriculture industry, so many farms and farming communities taking a sizeable hit. We're already experiencing a cost of living crisis which will only be exacerbated by continuing floods which affect our food production and they affect our supply chains. The effect of flooding will last for weeks and even months, and for some people the impact will be for years, as communities struggle to rebuild. I'm constantly inspired by the strength of communities coming together to support each other. We see it every night on the news. But they can't keep doing this on their own forever. They need a government that has their backs. For these reasons, the Greens are moving amendments to require the Future Fund to sell off its future fuel shareholdings as quickly as practicable and prevent future investments in climate-destroying companies or projects. The Future Fund, in its management of the Disaster Ready Fund, must ensure that the Disaster Ready Fund is not invested in fossil fuels. This makes sense. It is so obvious. Governments need to spend much more than the $200 million a year to keep Australians safe from climate damage caused by the burning of coal and gas. So we need so much more than is offered by this bill. As Senator Davies pointed out, the Insurance Company of Australia has said that we need to spend $30 billion of investment 
in large-scale coastal investment over the next 50 years. That is $600 million a year to protect against storm surges, erosion and sea level rise. The ocean is a very slow-moving beast. From the heat absorbed so far, Australia will experience one in 50 year storm surges every year by 2050, no matter what we do. That is what the science is telling us. It is locked in, but every extra tonne of coal and gas adds to the catastrophe and makes the damage worse. This bill and its 200 million equals just one third of what is needed to cover natural perils from the ocean. This is before we factor in the damage arising from floods, fires, heat waves, droughts and cyclones moving southwards. For these reasons, we're moving an amendment to lift the spending cap from 200 million to 300 million a year, which we would hope the government supports. The PBO has advised that the fund would operate with this level of disbursement until 2047, in line with the government's net zero goal. The Greens believe that coal and gas companies should have to pay to clean up the mess they are causing. In 2011, when the Brisbane floods hit, everyday Australians had to pay through a temporary increase in the Medicare levy. When the floods hit again this year, clean-up costs are being paid for by Australians through higher levels of government debt. Coal and gas companies can afford it. They are earning billions off the back of Putin's invasion. They don't pay enough tax, they shift 96 per cent of their profits offshore, and they donate heavily to the major parties. That is why both the government and the opposition don't want to make them pay to clean up for the disaster that they're inflicting on the rest of us. The entire outlays of the Disaster Ready Fund hang off on how successful or unsuccessful the future fund is in the stock market. We should fund these investments in disaster prevention, but it should be done directly, not off the earnings or losses of a capital fund in any given year, and certainly not off the dividends of coal, oil and gas. We have concerns that the entire funding model of this bill is based around the future fund following Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan around the stock market paddock. Our climate resilience is hitched to the success or failure of global stock markets. Funding may go above or below the legislated $20 million per year, depending on how the stock market is travelling. And that is not a recipe for success. It is not a good way to fund uh, an, a fund like this. Stock markets are erratic, in fast decline at times. And if this happens, it's highly likely the future fund or the government will be wary about drawing down from the fund and committing even to the $200 million limit in this bill. This money should be provided as a matter of course to meet the necessity, not on the ebbs and flows of financial stocks and derivatives. We also have concern that this bill doesn't even compel any spending. This funding fund was established in 2019 by the Nationals by rebranding a $4 billion capital fund for education established by the Gillard government. However, from 2019 onwards, the Morrison government only made one payment of $200 million, while the earnings accrued $809 million since its inception, leaving a current balance of $4.6 billion. In other words, the fund has earned $600 million more uh, from the stock market than it's paid out to communities. That $600 million should be brought forward and spent on flood and fire-affected communities next financial year. So, in sum, we support the principle of this bill. The government has a duty to keep citizens and communities safe. We should be investing in de on developing climate, disa climate disaster resilience and preparedness. But this fund does not go far enough. Climate disasters are forecast to increase, and we can see them around us and around the planet. We need to ensure that we have the capacity to support communities by lifting the spending cap from 200 to 300 million. We also need to require that the disaster fund does not invest in fossil fuels. We cannot have a fund invested in the companies that are responsible for causing the very same climate disasters that the fund is set up to protect against. We urge the government to maintain the integrity of the intent of this legislation by supporting our amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President, uh, and I rise to speak on this bill 
Uh, it will benefit thousands of Australians across the country. It will create what Australia should have had years ago, a proper disaster ready fund. Uh, it recognises the reality that many Australians will be devastated and displaced by natural disasters such as fire, floods uh, and extreme weather, just as too many Australians uh, on the East Coast are right now, today. Uh, and these conditions, we know, will only get worse as the climate continues to change, because this government believes climate change is real. The previous government had nine years to prepare Australia for future extreme weather. Nine years. Uh, and even when they did try something, it just wasn't properly thought through. They established a $4 billion emergency response fund in 2019. Uh, and at the time, its stated purpose was to provide $150 million in recovery funding each year and $50 million in mitigation funding per year. In the three years the fund existed, it did not complete a single mitigation project or release a cent in funding recovery. Instead, it earned the previous government more than $800 million in interest, taking the total towards $5 billion, with nothing to show for it. Too often, they were there for the photo opportunity, but never there when the hard work had to be done. And in a country prone to nat uh, natural disasters, this attitude is truly unbelievable. In contrast, the Albanese government is getting on with the job of building a better, better Australia, um, building a country that's ready to face the future. Uh, and this bill will ensure that Australia is better prepared for future disasters. It will provide up to $200 million per year to invest in mitigation projects like flood levees, cyclone shelters, fire breaks and evacuation centres around Australia, as well as building natural disaster resilience. By preparing for natural disasters, we can protect lives and livelihoods and lower damage bills from floods, fires and cyclones. We can reduce the physical, economic and psychological impact of disasters for the Australian community. With a specific focus on disaster resilience, the Disaster Ready Fund will help prepare Australians as best we can for future catastrophic weather. It's a policy that we need for thousands of Australians across the country, uh, and it's a policy that's very close to my heart. Earlier this year, I had the privilege to visit communities in Mallacoota and East Gippsland, including community leaders from the Mallacoota and District Recovery Association, the Gunnar Kurnai Land and Waters Council, uh, and volunteers from the local country fire authority. The area was severely affected by the black summer bushfires and then by flooding. We all remember the harrowing scenes of devastation and loss in the aftermath of catastrophic bushfires and then floods. The scale of the devastation was almost unimaginable. From local, from local people, I heard what was important uh, and what they needed. Uh, and what they told me was that they needed to be part of the solution that rebuilding, recovery and resilience in the face of growing threats from natural disasters is best achieved when local people are put in charge of local solutions, including First Nations people, whose profound and deep understanding of the land and its challenges is invaluable to successful planning and management of disasters. The Mallacoota community has rallied magnificently to some really challenging times. Sadly, though, the circumstances that produced the Mallacoota fire and recent Gippsland floods are getting more common, as we're seeing today, with absolutely tragic consequences. Uh, in my state of Victoria last month was the busiest month on record, the busiest month on record for Victoria's State Emergency Service, with volunteers responding to a staggering 13,700 calls for assistance after the recent floods a situation reflected in communities across the country, even as we speak. This is our new reality. The Albanese government is delivering on our commitment to ensure Australia is better prepared for natural disasters in the future. The Disaster Ready Fund builds on other measures by this government to strengthen Australia's disaster management response, including increasing the capacity 
uh, and capability of our amazing volunteers, supporting up to 5,200 additional volunteers to join the existing disaster volunteer workforce by covering the costs associated with recruitment, deployment, equipment and training. We know we have a big job ahead of us and we are tackling the root cause of all of this, which is climate change. Uh, and we know governments, not only here but around the world, have to be part of the solution. Uh, and that's why this government is taking strong action and showing new and real leadership on the global stage when it comes to climate. This government is working hard to catch up on the nine wasted years of the previous government. We understand the urgency of the problem and the time for action is now. Uh, that's why we're working with all parts of the community, unions, businesses and community groups to move to a renewable future while also helping people through the disasters that we're facing today. Because the things that matter, climate, community and the future, are worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As I rise to speak to this bill, uh, Australian communities are again behind sandbags beneath flood water covered in mud. Uh, we heard from Senator Davey about her community in Daniloquin flooding, crops being ruined, livestock lost, and people displaced, and in tragic cases, lives being lost. Natural disasters are becoming more frequent and more severe across the world. With the natural extremes in our climate, our country is more exposed than most. And it's not like we haven't been warned. Uh, for decades, our scientists have been telling us that our climate is at risk. For decades, we've been told about what climate breakdown will, need, will mean for our future. We know that natural disasters will impact our lives and our environment more profoundly and more frequently unless we take urgent action. Today's children, those who, who come in and, and watch uh, this place up there on, on, their, on their school tours, will live through at least three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents. And you don't have to look far to see this trend. You know, turn on the evening news. We've had one of the worst bushfire seasons in our history just a couple of years ago, and now we're seeing some of the worst flooding across the country. These disasters are imposing huge social and economic costs. $24.5 billion was spent on disasters between 2005 and 2022. But the overwhelming majority, 98 per cent of that, was spent on recovery and relief with only 2 per cent on risk reduction. This is despite estimates from the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, APRA, that every dollar spent on disaster preparedness saves us $11 on disaster relief. It seems like a pretty good return on investment to me. And we've also heard from the Proactivity Commission and the Royal Commission to National Disaster Arrangements recommendations uh, that say we should be spending more on resilience um, and, and adaptation. Uh, we should be investing uh, far more uh, adapting to climate change and preparing for natural disasters. You know, we, I sit in this place and I hear a lot of uh, finger pointing ac across this, this chamber and I think it, it points to the, the political short-termism um, that needs to be overcome in developing policy solutions uh, for disaster preparedness that invest in, in the long term, that invest in our communities across the country. Clearly we, we see the political will when communities are confronted with natural disasters, when, when we see uh, communities, communities grappling to deal with their losing homes, losing, losing livestock, losing livelihoods. 
but this, this same uh, care and urgency is, is, is lacking or even missing when, when we're talking about preparedness and uh, ensuring that our communities are as resilient uh, as, as they can be, given that we know that more natural disasters are coming. This bill is a step in the right direction. Uh, I commend the government and in particular Minister Watt uh, for the change. Uh, this starts to shift the, pro the, the focus to preparedness and, and I commend Senator Sheldon for the work that he's been doing with flood affected uh, communities looking at how they prepare for the next flood because we know <laughs> that the next flood will come. Uh, it, it's, it's simply a matter of of time. We've heard earlier uh, Senator Walsh blame the coalition for not doing enough. Uh, that may well be the case, but both major parties have failed us when it comes to climate change. Uh, this has been something we've been warned about for decades, and we're now seeing the results of inaction. And I would urge people in this place to stop the finger pointing and begin to work on this issue. $200 million is, is, a, is a great start to begin uh, to prepare communities, but when you compare that to the $3.5 billion that APRA estimates we need to be spending uh, annually to effectively reduce the impact of natural disasters, we've got a long way to go. And I understand the argument that we are uh, in a tight financial situation. We do have a, a, a big debt and uh, clearly the government is, is trying to rein in spending. But at the same time, we're happy to give the fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel subsidies $10 billion plus and then we see more investment in you know, the middle arm petrochemical hub, $1.9 billion. Uh, it's, I guess, you know, our efforts to mitigate and adapt really pale uh, when, when we look at how much we're spending on perpetuating the very problem that we're trying to solve. And uh, the other Senator Pocock has, has rightly pointed out that our future fund is invested in industries that are causing the very problem that this part of the future fund is, is aimed at helping communities address. So we, we've clearly seen an underinvestment in disaster preparedness, and I think you know the, the flooding in central west New South Wales over the past fortnight is the most recent example. Uh, my office has heard from a number of those affected, including Sue. Uh, Sue owns the chemist in Molong, which was underwater and suffered extensive damage. She recounts the terror of a rapidly rising river in the middle of the night and the windows shattering as water came into her shop. But there's not a word of complaint or self-pity. She describes the strength of the community and the army of cleaners who pitched in to clean her shop and make sure that vulnerable people can still receive the medication they desperately need. There are hundreds of people like Sue across this great country they deserve the best solutions, not only after disaster strikes, but also beforehand to ensure their communities are better prepared when, da when these disasters inevitably come their way. Our obligation to support those worst affected by worsening natural disasters does not end at our geographical border. Uh, global warming is driving the increased severity of natural disasters around the world and we've seen flooding in Australia, Pakistan, uh, Nigeria, uh, we've seen record-breaking wildfires in Europe and we've seen the conditions set for huge hurricanes in North America. As a wealthy country, one of the wealthiest countries in the world and some of the highest per capita uh, emitters, we have a duty, a moral obligation, I would argue, to help those suffering on account of our contribution to heating this planet. Uh, I'd like to read a, uh, 
a brief um, statement from uh, Naki Yat Sam, a 10-year-old girl from Ghana. She told COP27 delegates last week about flooding where she lives in the capital city uh, of Accra. Uh, cars were underwater. People were paddling canoes where there had been streets. Thousands fled their homes. It was very scary for us. If it is going to get much worse, we fear how, how much our future is on the line. Decide now. If you are rich and powerful, to provide funds to help the ones who suffer the most the costs of climate disaster not caused by us. And having lived and, and been involved in uh, community development projects in Zimbabwe, in incredibly poor rural communities, that sentiment is shared. This is a problem that has not been caused by billions of people who share this planet with us. But it is all of our problem to bear, and I would argue that Australia needs to step up and show uh, more global leadership on this. Clearly, this fund is not dealing with that, but I, I think this is all uh, connected when we're talking about uh, disaster preparedness and response. The good news is that we have so many of the world's leading scientists and experts uh, in all of these fields to, to help us deal with this, to help us uh, better uh, both mitigate emissions and but prepare for the natural disasters that are that are coming our way. Uh, the ACT in particular has a lot to contribute in the disaster resilience field. Uh, last week I visit, visited the CSIRO's National Bushfire Behaviour Research Laboratory uh, just across the Malongolo uh, River at the base of Black Mountain and talked to scientists there who are working to better understand bushfire dynamics and running a whole range of experiments that they can't run in the field to, to better understand the, the likely movements of bushfires and inform uh, firefighter crews and, and um, emergency personnel on it, both how to extinguish, extinguish fires but also then how to prepare surrounding communities. Uh, the CSR are also doing work with the ANU's Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions on developing tech-based interventions targeting bushfires. They're doing some incredibly exciting stuff, like using drones to identify fires ignited by lightning strikes or, or from, from another source, and then using disposable GPS-guided water gliders to control remote uh, bush ignitions. And it's, it's our responsibility as a nation to invest in this science, to back these scientists with ideas that are going to help us deal with the kind of future we are uh, living in and are going to continue to, to, be, to be faced with. Uh, another amazing person at the CSIRO is, is Dr. Deborah O'Connell. She is building on the work of the great Dr. Brian Walker and his uh, amazing work in the field of uh, resilience uh, thinking and then also practice. He has been working on helping to further our understanding of how to deal with complex adaptive systems and how to best uh, be able to know when to intervene, how, how we can deal with them. And Dr. O'Connell is in that field and is an expert in systems leadership and helping people think through preparedness and responses to natural disasters. For too long, we've ignored scientists' warnings about climate change, and climate change is now here. Uh, it's crucial we listen to scientists now, both in terms of reducing our emissions as fast as we can. As a developed country, we have more of a moral obligation to do that fast. Uh, during the committee inquiry into this bill uh, and into the Emergency Management Fund in 2019, concerns about transparency were raised. Uh, the bill is unclear on whether there will be publicly available information about, hunting, uh, about how funding has been allocated or whether funding has been allocated at all. 
Uh, I welcome the government's commitment to set out guidelines on how projects will be funded. I will move amendments that promote greater transparency and address the risk that grants under the Disaster fund, uh, Relief Fund will be used for politics rather than for people. Again, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, the work of, uh, Dr. Um, of Senator Barbara Pocock, raising concerns about the way that the Future Fund is invested. I would urge the government to consider this. It, it is, to me, it does not align with the objectives of the Future Fund. And I welcome the, the government's decision to give greater focus to resilience in Australia. Uh, I call on the government to continue to invest more so we can better adapt to our changing climate, to invest in the clean industries of the future, not the uh, emissions-intensive polluting industries of the past. There is a lot more to do in this country and a lot more to do internationally. This is a massive challenge, but what an incredible opportunity for us in this place to be part of. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about one of the Albanese government's key election commitments, the Disaster Ready Fund, which is designed to help communities better prepare for the impact of natural hazards. We are increasingly reminded of the need to strengthen Australia's disaster management capacity. Communities are regularly hit hard by natural hazards, which went, then become humanitarian disasters. But with better advanced planning, we might be able to avoid or at least mitigate the disastrous outcomes. Disasters are neither natural nor inevitable. Last week, I visited Yugara, Parks and Forbes, in the New South Wales Central West, to hear from communities affected by the ongoing devastating floods there. Yugara is a small town with a population of 779 people that was absolutely smashed a week ago by what locals described as a tsunami of flood water. They were blindsided by the wave that roared through their town. One in five residents in Yugara were rescued by boat or helicopter after that tsunami hit last Monday, and sadly, of course, lives were lost. Just today, the Prime Minister, with the New South Wales Premier, visited Yugara to meet people affected by the crisis and to announce recovery grants of up to $50,000 for small businesses and not-for-profit organisations affected by the September-October flooding events in New South Wales. That is an important quick response aspect of this government's approach to dealing with the disaster. But a vital point was made to me in Yugara last Friday that reminds us why the resilience focus of the Disaster Ready Fund is just as important as the immediate recovery after a disaster. We need to build resilience ahead of time, not just to respond to natural hazards when they get out of hand and become disasters. In Yugara, last Friday, I spoke with a small businessman, owner Greg Austin, Augustin, who owns a small auto mechanic shop in the main street of the town. Greg, who is a local SES incident controller and has been with the SES alongside with his wife for decades, I asked if he ever experienced a disaster on the scale. He said, no flood like this. Greg's workshop was absolutely devastated by the wall of water that hit Yugara, and he said he was initially thinking of just walking away from the business. Such was the devastation. But he said he was already having second thoughts about that decision. He said, it depends on how the town goes and if they still need work done, well, I can still do it. With each day that passes, there is a growing sense of optimism that the people of Yugara will stick around and rebuild and businesses will open up again. Today's visit, visit by the Prime Minister to announce the $50,000 business grants is a step on the path to recovery. I met with Mark McMullen and Sandra Arnold, local emergency service officers from the Australian Red Cross, who had been first responders on the ground in Yugara. Mark told me, he said, 
We need to continue to build community, resilience through cross-training of services so we can be adapt to the changing circumstances. He was talking about improving the ways we respond to disasters by better coordinating our relief groups and working together. Sandra told me the importance of letting others know when you're safe in an emergency. The Red Cross service of register, find, reunite lets family, friends and emergency services know that you're safe in the event of an emergency. Sandra said during the summer bushfires of 2019-20, a staggering 71,000 people registered with the service and over 650 people were reunited thanks to it. And it was used by agencies to learn the whereabouts of people who had fled the fires and to follow up with them. And we know that natural hazards such as floods, bushfires and violent storms are becoming more frequent and more severe. But there is much we can individually do and collectively prevent them from turning into disasters. The Disaster Ready Fund seeks to curb the devastating impacts of natural hazards by investing in important disaster prevention projects. The Disaster Ready Fund will provide for up to $200 million per year for natural disaster resilience and risk reduction, reduction initiatives, as recommended by the Productivity Commission in 2015. Dedicating the Disaster Ready Fund to natural hazard risk reduction and resilience initiatives will provide a clearer distinction between funding sources for recovery and resilience and will enhance the focus on building resilience for future natural disasters. This will include investments in a broad range of infrastructure initiatives. And just two of those areas that can, they can be so-called grey, for example, grey infrastructure, human-made structures such as dams, seawalls, roads and water treatment plants. And they can be green-blue infrastructure, the use of vegetation, soils and natural processes. Both of these infrastructure approaches seek to mitigate the impacts of climate change and natural disasters on communities. These kind of activities help to deliver on the government's agenda for climate adaption by implementing projects that future-proof Australian communities against future disaster impacts. The bill will transform the former government's inadequate emergency response fund into a dedicated ongoing source of funding for natural disaster resilience and risk reduction initiatives. Over three years, their emergency response fund didn't complete a single mitigation project or release a cent in recovery funding, which at the same time earning the government, former government, over $800 million in interest. This left is dangerously unprepared, and the Albanese government won't repeat the mistake of any previous governments. But I also want to take the opportunity to also congratulate the opposition and those within the Senate. Whilst there are some amendments moved, the essence of this bill is being supported to the credit of the opposition as well. Because what's important about is not only holding responsible for decisions that we all make in this place, including those in the past, it's important that we are forward thinking how we move together on this very important uh, issue of dealing with these terrible disasters. By preparing natural disasters, we can protect lives and livelihoods and lower damage bills for floods, fires and cyclones. We are committed for better protecting towns like all of us here, like Yagara, for people like Greg, Sandra and Mark. We support the bill. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak to the Disaster Ready Bill uh, 2022. And, and while we're debating this bill, Communities across New South Wales, those in Victoria and South Australia, are experiencing record floods, with lives lost, properties destroyed, towns in shock after what's been a devastating 12 months. While we're here, major flooding is swelling and overflowing the Lachlan, the Murray, the Murrumbidgee rivers, amongst others. Residents in Forbes, Condoblin, Daniloquin, Yugowra, and, and just stopping on Yugowra thinking about that tsunami that just swept through that town last Monday and the damage and the devastation that was caused. As Senator Sheldon pointed out, I think 
one fifth of the town was rescued in boats. Um, just one town as the floodwaters wash down through the river systems. But we've seen flooding Burke, Walgett, Hay, Albury, Chuka, Mildura, Wentworth, town after town either flooded or watching, watching as those slow moving inundations pour across the west and southwest of New South Wales into Victoria, um, into South Australia. People have lost everything. And, and we know that this is the devastating impacts of worsening climate change. People who have lost everything deserve serious considered support. They deserve urgent support and they need a government that's going to address this problem head on. And whilst this bill does do some good work, it goes nowhere near enough. The government says that it's taking action on climate change. But we know, while we're debating this bill and talking about a $200 million annual measure, that governments across the country are handing out a staggering $11.6 billion a year in subsidies to fossil fuel companies. $11.6 billion, making the problem worse, making the next floods more severe. And the response is $200 million of additional public money to try and address a tiny amount of the damage. And to get $11.6 billion a year in context, that's $22,000 every minute of every day for the entire year. Just imagine if that money was instead invested in preventing, mitigating and adapting to climate change instead of making the problem worse. Um, and we know that this disaster ready fund um, will provide some $200 million a year. Re not new money, repurposed money. But to give some idea about what the cost of climate change is, let's look at what the Insurance Council of Australia says. They've calculated that the investment needed just to protect against coastal storm surges in this country over the next 50 years is some $30 billion. That's $600 million a year, this year, every year, for the next 50 years, just to deal with one of the natural perils we face from exacerbated climate change. And the response from the government is a $200 million a year in total of repackaged, rebadged monies. The Disaster Ready Fund is peanuts compared to the crisis we're facing. And it's floods today. Next month it'll be fires, droughts, storms, cyclones. And we need the kind of investment and join together policy that will keep Australians safe from coal and gas and insurance fuel, fueled and, 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 and climate fueled natural disasters. And, and again, to focus on my state, New South Wales. And we've seen the flooding in the north of the state, the, the, the savage flooding in Lismore. And I've been up there twice since the floods, and once in the very, very, very near aftermath of that, that devastating rain bomb that destroyed Lismore in February of this year. It's just hard to think that's just nine months ago. I went there, and the town looked like a mixture of a disaster scene and a film set. You could walk through the whole of the centre of Lismore, and they'd cleaned out the worst of the debris, but every shop was empty for block after block after block of a town that's been there well over a century and, and destroyed in a climate fuel um, rain bomb, the likes of which they'd never seen before. And I remember talking to one of the employees of the Koori Mail, and I just want to shout out to the work of the Koori Mail and the, the, the organising work of the First Nations community up there, who formed the hub of the community response when government wasn't anywhere to be found. They came together, like First Nations communities know how to do. They don't expect government to help. And they came together and they formed the hub, that amazing community hub and the disaster relief up there in Lismore. They stepped up when governments failed. But I remember speaking to one of those employees from Koori Mail, and he, he was in a, um, in, in a, in a, in a top-floor apartment, second-floor apartment, in, in, a, in an old sort of shop in the centre of, centre of Lismore. And they'd marked on the side of the wall where the, the early record flood in the 70s had been. And they knew that they could get above that and they'd be safe. But when this rain bomb hit, 
the waters kept rising and rising and rising and rising, and the 1970 flood level just got inundated. And then he put himself and his partner and his dog on a on a on a um, on a surfboard, on a surfboard, and they rose up inside their house as the floodwaters were rising in night in dark. And as they were rising up, they had to smash a hole through the ceiling and the roof to get into the um, roof cavity. And they pulled their dog up, and they're pulling their dog up, and they're on the rafters in the roof cavity, having smashed a hole in the roof, in the in the ceiling. And then they had to knock a hole through the the tin roof. Imagine the chaos and the panic, and that was that was repeated hundreds and thousands of times across this moor. They knocked a hole in the tin roof, and they were there on the roof, and they got rescued by a bloke on a jet ski. And you know, and thank God, they turned up. But where was the disaster relief? Where was the planning? And, and where was the acknowledgement that what we're doing with fossil fuels is creating that kind of problem for Lismore, towns and communities all across this country? So, yes, let's talk about the $200 million and let's say something has been done. But let's acknowledge the scale of the human suffering, the trauma that we're going to see from climate disaster after climate disaster. Let's be honest about it and have an honest, genuine response. And this bill does not get there, it doesn't tick the box of honest, gener gener honest genuine response. And you can go back to the Brisbane flooding. And again, it's hard to rem remember that was um, 2011, where the country had to pay, taxpayers had to pay through a flood recovery levy. And in the end, I think some $5.6 billion to try and recover just from that one flood in Brisbane. Now we're making our children pay again through increased government debt. All the while, coal and gas companies aren't paying. They're receiving $11.6 billion a year in collective subsidies. You couldn't make this stuff up. And Labor's climate test, I think one of the, the big climate tests we've seen in this parliament, came just yesterday. And they, they failed that test when they voted against the Greens' disallowance to stop the, the, what was, I thought, the Morrison governments, but it's now the Albanese Labor governments, $32 million loan to a gas company in Victoria to destroy a part of that coast, coastline. The Golden Beach ca gas project certainly fails Labor's own weak test on coal or gas projects, which apparently have to stack up financially and apparently environmentally, or how the hell a coal or gas project could ever stack up environmentally is, is a mystery to me. But they're meant to stack up financially before they receive any subsidies. The only way this project gets off the ground is if the Albanese government gives a cool, sweet, interest-free $32 million loan to create more gas extraction and make the problem worse and drive the floods worse. So yes, we've got the Prime Minister in Uganda. Good. Let's see him down at Golden, Golden Beach talking to traditional owners, explaining how making the problem worse with public money is good public policy. I'm yet to understand how that works. And Labor's first budget included that $1.9 billion investment, public money, an investment, I say in inverted commas, $1.9 billion subsidy to open up a gas export terminal and petrochemical precinct in Dar Darwin Harbour. And I note your work acting deputy president in opposing that work in opposing that ridiculous project working with traditional owners first nations uh, traditional owners there and i and i note that when you went to cop 27 recently that was the exact project that the world was saying stop don't do that but there they are the albanese labor government enabling gas to be fracked and exported out of the betaloo basin against traditional owners wishes and against the rhetoric they took to COP27 and the rhetoric we keep getting here in the chamber on climate action. So while the Australian Greens support the principle of recalibrating the emergency response funds allocations to pre-disaster preparedness, and I, and I do acknowledge the genuineness of Senator Sheldon and his work in trying to turn the beast around and get preparedness and mitigation and adaptation as public policy and get the funding we need. I acknowledge that. It's genuine work. It's hard work. Um, this bill does not come close to what's needed to prevent the coal and gas fuel natural disasters. And we're calling on the Albanese Labor government to end the handouts to coal and gas companies and instead make them pay, not taxpayers, make them pay for disaster preparedness and to rebuild and support devastated communities, since it's those fossil fuel companies that are creating the problem in the first place. Communities suffering the deadly impacts 
and they are deadly. And we've seen it just this week. The deadly impacts of climate change deserve so much more than what the Albanese government is offering them here. Together, if we work together in this place, we have a new parliament, a new chance, a new opportunity. And, and between Labor and the Greens, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a powerful opportunity here to come together, to keep coal and gas in the ground, to make the fossil fuel industry, not taxpayers, foot the bill for the damage it causes. But we can only do that if we focus on the needs of flood, fire and drought impacted communities instead of cashed up multinational fossil fuel owners. That's the test that matters. And that's the test that the Albanese government is failing with this bill. Thank you. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I'd like to thank those senators who've contributed to this debate so far. I remember travelling to Mackay with now Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in the middle of a Queensland summer earlier this year to announce that an Albanese Labor government would establish the Disaster Ready Fund. At the time, as a country, we were still facing the long recovery from Black Summer. We were still reeling from the lack of responsibility uh, the former coalition government took in preparing for what would become a seemingly endless bushfire season. We said back in January, when I was with the Prime Minister, that Australia was facing more intense, more frequent natural disasters due to climate change, and we needed to be much better prepared as a country than we had been left by the former government. But even then, back in January, we couldn't possibly have anticipated what was to come. In February-March this year, we saw floods swamp southeast Queensland, northern New South Wales and bushfires hit Western Australia, and it hasn't stopped since. Over the last 10 months, we've seen towns and regions across Australia battered by devastating, unprecedented and compounding floods. And over the last few weeks alone, we've continued to see those floods smash New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, parts of Queensland and increasingly South Australia. We've seen lives lost, homes destroyed and communities traumatised. As I say, we know we face more frequent and intense disasters due to climate change. And our government is acting on the root cause by reducing emissions. But we can also better protect communities from floods, fires and cyclones well into the future. Our government said that if we were elected, we would try to switch the focus from only being reactive to being much better prepared as a country, and this bill is a crucial part of that, of that change in approach. This bill will implement our election commitment and will replace the former government's failed emergency response fund. In the three years since that fund was established in 2019, uh, with, a four, uh, with what ended up being $4.8 billion in it, the fund did not build a single disaster mitigation project or release a cent in recovery funding. All it did was earn the former coalition government over $800 million in interest. This legislation will replace this failed fund with a dedicated, ongoing natural disaster resilience and risk reduction fund, the Disaster Ready Fund. The Disaster Ready Fund will provide up to $200 million a year, matched where possible by state, territory and local governments, to mitigate the devastating impacts of natural disasters by providing funding for disaster resilience and mitigation activities. Now we are finalising this commitment and delivering on it by writing the Disaster Ready Fund into law. Now, over the course of this debate, the opposition has made the point that we need to continue to fund disaster recovery, and we do. Funding for natural disaster recovery efforts will continue under the Albanese government with other dedicated Commonwealth programs, in particular the joint Commonwealth-State disaster recovery funding arrangements. Those recovery funds are flowing right now across those disaster-affected areas in Australia, and that will continue to occur regardless of what happens through this bill. But the crucial distinction that this bill provides for is that we will at last have a permanent, dedicated disaster mitigation fund at a federal level to back up uh, the recovery funding which we continue to provide. I want to thank the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration for reviewing this bill. The committee's report, which was published on 16 November, recommended that the bill be passed. I note that both the Coalition and Greens members made additional comments and recommendations for amendments to the bill. These have now been considered and addressed through the debate on amendments moved to the bill. 
The coalition also made an, a recommendation that guidelines be published that set out relevant eligibility criteria and assessment criteria, including wide consultation with key stakeholders on the allocation of funding from the Disaster Ready Fund. Uh, the government was already in the process of doing this, and so we therefore support this recommendation. I can advise that our new National Emergency Management Agency is currently developing Disaster Ready Fund guidelines in close consultation with stakeholders. These guidelines will detail the intent of the fund and set out the eligibility criteria for funding proposals, the application and assessment processes and mechanisms for monitoring, evaluation and learning. NEMA is developing these guidelines in consultation with a broad range of stakeholders, including Commonwealth, state and territory agencies, local governments, insurers and the private sector. The guidelines are expected to be published in early 2023, with projects to be funded and implemented as soon as possible from July 23 onwards. Again, I thank senators for their contributions and for their positive engagement on this bill. Australia has had a long and difficult three years when it comes to natural disasters facing fires, floods and cyclones. An Albanese government can now begin the work in earnest to protect our communities. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I now put the question that the bill be read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? No. Right. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Emergency Response Fund Act 2019 and for other purposes. To committee stage to uh, deal with the amendments. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Okay. Yeah, she's standing, so she has Senator call. Pocock. Um, I have an amendment. I want to move a motion. Um, I seek leave to move amendment numbers one to three on sheet 1703 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So I move the amendments. I foreshadowed the amendments in my speech, so I don't need to speak to them. Okay. Thank you. Call the minister. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the government does not support the amendments proposed by the Greens, and I might just quickly uh, run through why. Uh, one of the amendments uh, seeks to increase the annual uh, disbursement amount from what will be the Disaster Ready Fund from $200 million per year to $300 million per year. Um, and Senator Pocock, I can uh, inform you that uh, reason, fundamentally the reason for us opposing this amendment um, is to preserve the, if you like, the principle of the fund, so that it has enough money in it to be invested to keep generating the return that we would then be spending on disaster mitigation going forward. Uh, the Future Fund Management Agency has considered the proposal in your amendment and advised that it would likely deplete the fund. It would essentially be taking out too much every year from that principle to make sure that there were funds uh, left uh, to be invested. Uh, the bill's $200 million per year limit for resilience mitigation has been set for long-term sustainability of the fund, uh, making sure that we can deliver sufficient funding for disaster resilience while not overdrawing the fund. Um, none of us, I think, would want to get to a point that this fund is fully depleted and unable to invest in that disaster mitigation going forward, and $200 million a year is the amount that we're advised can be spent from the fund every year without depleting it. Aside from that, uh, that figure actually lines up uh, with what has been recommended for investment in disaster mitigation at the federal level by the Productivity Commission, 
uh, they delivered a report in 2015 which recommended that the Commonwealth invest up to $200 million per year on resilience projects to be matched by the states and territories, and that's what we're proposing to do here. Um, the amount also lines up with figures that the Insurance Council of Australia has called for uh, to be invested in mitigation, which of course, hopefully, uh, will provide some level of insurance relief to Australians as well. Um, this is far from the only investment that our government is making in disaster resilience. Um, so I appreciate your desire to see even greater investment in disaster mitigation. Our position is that we're keen to do that, but not necessarily only through this fund. So in addition to the funds that this bill will provide for, we've of course just recently committed $800 million uh, uh, with the New South Wales government to the New South Wales Resilient Homes Program for home buybacks, house raising and mitigation, $750 million with the Queensland government for a similar program in Queensland, uh, significant money for betterment funding of infrastructure to bring it to a higher standard uh, in both Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, the second proposal uh, put forward by Senator Pocock uh, in her amendments essentially uh, is around the investment strategy to be used by the F Future Fund. The government is not able to support this proposed amendment to introduce what would be a prohibition uh, on certain types of investments from the Future Fund. However, the Finance Minister will work with the Future Fund and the Department of Finance to explore options for investments within the Future Fund that better align with the government's commitment to net zero by 2050. The legislation governing the Commonwealth's investment funds requires the board to maximise returns over the long term, consistent with best practice for institutional investment. Uh, the board integrates environmental, social and governance considerations into its decision-making process by assessing the potential impacts of ESG matters on the risk and return of the portfolio. The board also exercises its ownership rights associated with investments according to the board's ESG policy, which considers a range of issues including climate change, human and labour rights, sustainable supply chains, corruption and bribery. Uh, so for those reasons, we will be opposing the amendments. <coughs> Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, the opposition will also be opposing these amendments, um, as pointed out by uh, the minister. Uh, one of the core um, issues that would make the success of, of this bill is the ability for the fund to generate returns. And I note that um, the government have made quite the story about the fact that uh, since its inception, the Emergency Response Fund has generated uh, $800 million odd of um, uh, returns on the initial investment, and they are returns that are now in the fund. They are not returns that have been squandered or used by uh, the former government in any way, shape or form, and they now underpin the ability for this fund to generate further returns going forward. And I, I really do want that notice, noted. Um, I, we also would not support anything that ties the hands of the Future Fund and its ability to invest following uh, best practice and their due diligence. So on that basis, we will not be supporting these amendments. Senator Pocock. If I may follow up with a question relating to this uh, amendment to the minister, uh, I'm interested to understand the, the, the government's thinking and the direction that you intend to go when weighing up uh, the future fund, as, as you put it, maximising returns versus them currently investing in industries that are uh, adding to climate change, which we are seeking in this piece of legislation to, to mitigate and, and adapt to. Uh, how, how are you weighing that, that up? Uh, do you not see something like a future fund uh, having a requirement to, to invest in companies and industries that are congruent, uh, that align with a, a, a future? that? You know, Australians can be excited about, and I, I think young people uh, can, uh, um, can kind of look us look us in the eye and, and know that we're we're um, uh, we're, we're doing what's required. Minister, um, thanks, Senator Pocock, and thank you for your uh, 
constructive engagement on this bill more generally. Um, the, as I say, I mean, as I was saying in my speech, I'm not sure if you were here for that part of it. Of course, our government is taking serious action on climate change and the root causes of it, uh, being carbon emissions. Uh, and I think you supported the legislation that we put through the parliament around increasing uh, Australia's emission reduction targets. Uh, that's what we really need to do to bring down those emissions. And of course, we're taking action on a global stage by being an active participant in negotiations around these issues internationally. Uh, when it comes to these investments, as I said, the finance minister is intending to work with the Future Fund and the Department of Finance to explore what options there are for investments with the Future Fund that better align with the government's commitment to net zero by 2050. So I don't, I'm not in a position as that's not obviously not my role as the finance minister, but I'm not in a position to give you a lot more detail at this point in time about exactly where that's heading. Uh, but that certainly signals to me, signals to me an intention from the government to consider these issues. Senator Pocock. Um, two questions for the minister. Thank you um, for that clarification. But I wonder if you could. You've used the language of alignment um, with the government's values in the direction that you will now give to the future fund. Um, can you explore a little further what lies underneath that in terms of alignment? Is that an instruction to not uh, invest in uh, climate um, destroying f uh, fossil fuels? What will that instruction say about fossil fuels? That's my first question. Would you like the second one now, or shall I wait for that? Okay. Um, my second question is: um, the PBO says that th uh, that um, at three billion dollars um, in the fund, it will the way a drawdown of three hundred million a year will permit the fund to last until twenty forty seven, according to the PBO. Um, when do you want to exhaust the fund? Which year would you th would you think, on your projections, that keeping it 200 million a year drawdown, what year would you be exhausting the fund, uh, as currently proposed in the bill? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. Uh, in relation to your first question, I probably can't give too much more detail than what I've already said today, which is that this is something that is being explored by the, the finance minister. Uh, in discussions with the Future Fund as to what the investment strategy of the Future Fund is. Uh, I'm sure that Senator Gallagher would be happy to talk with you a bit further if you'd, if you'd like to have some more detail about that. Uh, but clearly, um, you know, by me saying that we intend to uh, better align the investment options with the government's commitment to net zero by 2050, this is clearly something that the Finance Minister is giving some thought to. Um, for your second question, I must admit I haven't seen that PBO research um, that you're citing there. And uh, what we're relying on, as I said earlier, uh, is the advice from the Future Fund, uh, which is that really we can only have a maximum of $200 million per year uh, to ensure that we don't run down the principal of this fund uh, at any point. And uh, I'm, I stand to be corrected by the, the advisers uh, who are here. Uh, but my understanding is that we don't see the fund being fully depleted by, by setting a $200 million mark. Um, obviously, the amount that the fund earns every year will differ depending on investment returns in the market. And even in the time I was the shadow minister, I remember there were some years that generated a very big return and some less. But if you like, the $200 million figure is essentially an averaging out. And I don't mean that precisely, I'm just talking generally, um, that that is an average amount, if you like, that we could spend from this fund while maintaining that principle at around the $4 billion mark so that we can keep investing it uh, and, and generate the kind of returns that we can then spend every single year. Is that right? Senator Brockman. Uh, and as I haven't, um, thank you, Chair, but as I haven't um, heard the entire debate, I'm happy to move to a division on this amendment. If you would prefer, I'll seek your guidance. I have a more general question for the minister. You can, Senator, you can ask a general question now. Minister, I'm, I'm, um, and I'll take you back um, to my time as policy director with the Pastoralists and Graziers Association. One of the difficulties Western Australia had uh, with the exceptional circumstances legislation in agricultural support is that the particular circumstances of West Australia 
uh, in terms of population and uh, uh, geographical uh, the, the, the geographical spread of population in Western Australia was quite different to the eastern states. And I'd ask, have you considered how disbursements from this fund will cater for the particular requirements of the jurisdiction of Western Australia, uh, given that whilst we are relatively small in terms of population, we are a significant contributor uh, both in terms of the economic uh, uh, output of Australia and the economic exports from Australia. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Brockman. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard uh, the part of the debate where I was mentioning that we're currently in the process of developing the guidelines for how this fund will be used, the types of things that will be able to be used for, where it would be spent. Um, I, I would not envisage that we would um, go forward with a specific allocation by state or territory, um, and I don't think that was done under the former scheme uh, by the former government. Um, but you know, I would certainly expect uh, that all states and territories would share in the benefit of these funds. I think it's pretty commonly known that there are some parts of the country that are more disaster prone than others, so it may well end up being that there is a bit of a weightage towards those, but none of those decisions have been made at this point in time. And I'd be more than happy for um, if you'd like to participate in the consultation about those guidelines to include you with that. Except that some parts of Australia are, are more population heavy and, and more uh, perhaps um, you know, in terms of the, the particular needs of individuals, communities within our community, within the Australian society. However, uh, I'm wondering if those guidelines would you envisage taking in economic impacts as well as purely human impacts? Uh, Senator Brockman, if I could just ask in future if you could just wait for the call, please. Minister. Thank you, Dep Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm sure the former President of the Senate respects your upholding of the, uh, the standing orders and processes here. Um, as I say, Senator Brockman, we're still working through what these guidelines would involve, but I think it's a fair point that you make that we need to be thinking not just about human impact but about economic impact. I had some meetings today with some groups about the impacts on supply chains that we see from natural disasters um, and the economic impact that that can have. So, uh, I, I think it would be reasonable to expect that there'd be a broad range of factors uh, that would be taken into account in determining what gets funded and what doesn't. But again, I'd be happy to, to take any thoughts that you've got as we're preparing these guidelines. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Just a follow-up question to that. Um, given that uh, the provisions of this bill sort of commence from 1 July 2023, what do you envisage as the timeline to see draft guidelines, finalisation of the guidelines? Because uh, that, that deadline is going to be upon us before we even realise it. Minister. The, um, as I say, um, Senator Davey, there is a consultation process underway at the moment, and again, more than happy to have uh, our agency brief you on that, on, on where they're up to, um, and, and to take your thoughts on that. Uh, I, would, I would hazard a guess that we'd be looking at early 2023 by the time the guidelines are finalised. Um, given that money is available under this fund from the 1st of July next year, uh, I'd be quite keen to start an application process in the first half of next year so that we can start then funding projects as early as possible once that financial year starts. So yeah, I'd be looking at early, early 2023 for finalisation of the guidelines. Excuse me. Senator Brockman. Thank you. Um, I mean, just by way of example, I mean, the, the port of Port Hedland um, is obviously a significant economic driver, both for the economy of Western Australia, but also the economy of Australia. And so uh, if, if there was some resilience measures that could be put in place uh, in terms of natural disasters in that port, then I would hope that they would also be considered, uh, even though the population of that area is very small. So I'll take, I'll take that more of a comment and I will absolutely take you up on your offer. 
uh, for a further briefing and consultation on the matter. Uh, just to move back to Senator Pocock, Barbara Pocock's um, question about um, the, the, um, the investment strategy uh, of the, the future fund. So are you proposing an extension of investment restrictions as part of the finance minister's consultation with the future fund? Minister. Um, again, Senator Brockman, not being the finance minister, I'm not really in a position to, to say anything more other than what I've advised, which is that we, the finance minister, will be working with the future fund uh, to explore options for investments within the future fund that do better align with the government's commitment to net zero by 2050. Senator Brockman. I paused. So, Minister, do you envisage that future fund investment in gas projects may be part of that? Minister? Uh, I can't add anything further to what I've said. But I don't, I don't think that anyone should be um, uh, ruling things in or out. I don't think that anyone should be taking what I'm saying as anything other than the finance minister exploring options. No decisions have been made about what types of investments would occur and which ones wouldn't. Um, but clearly the finance minister is intending to have this matter discussed with the, uh, the future fund in the at some point in the future. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, minister, I firstly, obviously, as a former emergency management minister, um, want to congratulate the Labor government on continuing um, an investment fund that will ensure that our nation can invest in mitigation projects on the ground in local communities to really flip uh, the traditional model in this country of droughts and flooding rains. Uh, where we spend 97 per cent of our money on fixing up uh, floods and, and bushfires and cyclonic activity and only 3 per cent in actually preparing for the future. And it's one of the great um, I think, legacies of the coalition government that we took the brave step of setting up uh, this fund and um, obviously setting aside um, portions. Uh, annually to actually be um, supporting state and local governments to uh, mitigate against uh, future disasters. I had the great pleasure, obviously, of uh, speaking at the Financial uh, Reviews Infrastructure Summit this morning and caught up with the Lismore Mayor, Steve Craig, who had also been speaking at this summit about the importance of uh, exactly these uh, type of projects and thanking me for our government and, and thankfully your government's uh, similar commitment following ours um, to provide the Northern Rivers in New South Wales uh, every support to ensure that uh, their community can prevent, build the types of infrastructure on the ground in that community that will ensure that um, what happened in the Northern Rivers and particularly to the city of Lismore uh, won't happen again. Uh, but, Minister, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, my first is obviously how um, this money has been raised. I had the opportunity to speak at the Australian Local Government's um, roads uh, seminar down in Hobart a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of local mayors, and I'm sure they've all contacted you and your office, um, about the torrential rains, the flooding that we're uh, going through at the moment, but obviously the ongoing La Nina situation has wrought havoc on rural and regional roads. We've got the New South Wales regional uh, councils have come out saying it's a crisis. The Victorian regional councils have all similarly come out saying it's a crisis. Um, some are looking to the DRFA arrangements to really fund that recovery process. Um, others are looking at similar times in our history when we've had to go to the infrastructure portfolio to obviously fund the particular and specific needs of such unique um, situations that we're finding ourselves in the moment uh, with the, the flooding impact on particularly regional roads. Uh, would you be able to give us an understanding of is it going to be DRFA? Is it this particular um, funding pool that will be able to be accessed or is indeed it a matter for infrastructure ministers, state and federal to come to an agreement on? Minister. 
Um, thanks, Senator McKenzie. Uh, and uh, I well remember our many discussions about um, these funds in past estimates hearings and, and other occasions. Um, you're right, and, I, and in fact, I've made this point uh, in the Senate just this week that one of the major consequences of the flooding that we're seeing at the moment is the massive damage to roads and infrastructure around a lot of rural and regional Australia. Um, I've, I've seen those roads myself. I've driven on those roads myself. Um, and, and you probably have as well, whether we're talking about roads that are cut off or bridges that are suffering from erosion or potholes, rail impacts as well. There's massive impacts out there and it's going to be a very costly bill. Um, I've had a number of discussions with mayors myself already as I've travelled around the country into these flood areas and it's pretty much the number one issue they're raising with me. So um, at this point in time, um, our intention is certainly to, to fund uh, those sorts of repairs th uh, through the DRFA arrangements, as your government often did in these situations. Um, uh, it is obviously in some parts of the country still we're still at a relatively early stage of assessing the the exact impacts of these floods, uh, and there are some parts of the country where we, we still have floodwaters in place at the moment, and we may well be seeing more. Um, I know for a fact that there are states, state governments and local governments who have already begun the work of repairs to infrastructure in some parts of the country. In other parts of the country that hasn't been possible yet because of the conditions. Um, but but I've, I've personally told a number of mayors that they can absolutely rely on the federal government to deliver uh, funding for those repairs and infrastructure in the way that your government did uh, as well through those DRFA arrangements. Uh, if, if, if something additional to that is necessary through the general infrastructure program, then of course we'd consider that. Uh, but at this point in time, what we're really trying to do is make those DRFA arrangements work. I should say as well um, that even in the short time we've been in office, we've announced substantial amounts of funding for betterment uh, of roads and infrastructure. Uh, that's something that mayors have been speaking to me about for many, many years, back to my days in the Queensland government. Um, uh, that we need to be not that we need to be building back back, up, back better, not just repairing things to the standard they were. Um, so we've done a lot of that already. I, uh, certainly in New South Wales, I feel like we may have committed to a similar program in Queensland as well. Um, and uh, and where there's an opportunity to do that around the current floods, we'd look at doing that as well. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, thanks, Minister. Uh, that's of great relief. I, um, you know. Just last week, had a hook up with uh, my Wang Wangaratta, um, Tawong, Wodonga, and uh, Indigo mayors, who, you know, just had a rough guesstimate, and these were not severely impacted councils, such as um, further upstream and downstream of, of the Murray and uh, into Western New South Wales, as impacted as um, Jamie Chaffey, Mayor Jamie Chaffey's um, shire, etc. But they did talk about, you know. At a minimum, five to seven million dollars a pop for bridges that were out that were going to impede not just social connectivity but obviously significant economic activity. And uh, there was a real concern, I guess, that the money um, that the state government had put on the, the table just really, when you shared it around, wasn't actually going to cut the mustard. So that's, that'll be great relief. You mentioned building back better under the DRFA. And I know when we were in government we started the review of the DRFA arrangements uh, to you know, actually have that sort of much more forward-looking and future-proofing, shall we say, arrangements with state governments. Has the, have the regulatory uh, guidelines and frameworks within the DRFA itself been changed so that state governments will be applying for Build Back Better on assessments, or is that still work that is under discussion with states? Minister? Um, the short answer is that the work is that is still under discussion with states and local governments. Uh, I am aware that your government, I think, commenced two reviews of the DRFA. Um, neither of which were completed by the time of the election. Um, so that is work that we've picked up, and, and to be honest, we, we have decided to broaden that further, and we're in discussions with the states and, and territories about that at the moment. Having said that, where there are opportunities to streamline payments uh, while we're doing that broader review, we're taking those opportunities, and we've made some changes to that effect already, not so much in the infrastructure space, but in terms of payments to individuals and small businesses and, and other groups, uh, I, I think primary producers as well. Um, but that, that review uh, I expect to be kicking off before too long, 
Um, and, uh, and certainly, as I say, we, we, we would like to think um, that building resilience into the system would be an outcome of that review. And it sounds like it's something that you've, you've been a fan of as well. <clears throat> Senator McKenzie. Thank you. Um, so my question probably goes back to um, how can we actually be building back better in this round of DRFA, given that work is still yet to be completed? Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but under the current guidelines, we can only build back to spec um, rather than actually the build back better piece. So I, I just want clarity around that, please. Minister. The, um, uh, you're right that um, the general um, way that the DRFA works is to repair infrastructure back to its um, pre-disaster standard, but as I'm sure you would recall, the DRFA also does allow for betterment funding, um, if you like, as a separate stream of funding. Um, so I, I, my recollection is that it's category B and D of the DRFA that allow for betterment funding to be provided, and that's the way that we have provided that betterment funding to New South Wales. And as I think I said, I think it was Queensland was the other state we've done it for since taking office. So there is still the ability to do betterment programs, but they have to be, if you like, separate to the usual repair programs. And so, so we we may well end up doing similar things for these floods. Um, but as I say, it's still fairly early days in actually assessing the scale of the damage right across the number of different states that it's impacting on. <clears throat> Senator McKenzie. I did come in for two questions, but um, thank you, Minister, for your openness. Um, I guess uh, looking at Victoria, um, I know in the Western District um, a local member there had a farmer that has a photo of somebody with a sinkhole in his local road up to his hip. Um, we've got the Rother Glen situation of our local roads, and um, you know, no matter where we go uh, across regional Victoria, whether they've been flood impacted or indeed just uh, subjected to the torrential rains over probably the last 12 to 18 months, there's significant degradation of our local roads. Um, has the Victorian government requested the betterment stream? Um, as has Queensland and New South Wales for these rain events and roads. Minister, um, I would have to take on notice whether that request has come in, come in um, to see whether anything has come into our agency uh, or my office. I know that our officials at NEMA, the new agency, have been in regular discussion with Victor the Victorian government about repairs to infrastructure. I've had conversations myself with the Victorian Emergency Management Minister about this, this issue and that there's going to be a need for some significant funding. Uh, and we've talked about the potential for betterment uh, as well. Um, as I say, one of the issues, well, one of the issues is that Victoria is in caretaker at the moment, which you would recall um, uh, makes these discussions a little bit more difficult um, uh, than ordinarily. And also, um, as I say, I know that some repairs have already started work in Victoria for roads and infrastructure, but there's still a huge number of assessments going on because of the scale of the damage. You're right, there are, there are definitely sinkholes out there that exist. And as I say, even on Sunday when I was in Yagara, I, I saw those potholes across the roads there. Um, but equally, there have been a lot that have been fixed due to the hard work of local and state governments and many others as well. Senator McKenzie. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree, Minister. And um, it's my um, understanding from communities in Victoria that your forward-leaning um, posturing, uh, I guess, as a federal government with that jurisdiction would be much appreciated. Uh, there seem to be, as there has been with other jurisdictions, as the DRFA arrangements have become more sophisticated over time and now um, the emergencies these communities have faced over time has become more complex and more critical. Um, some state governments are better than others at actually understanding their responsibilities under the DRFA arrangements to actually access the critical funds that we have available at a federal level. And we saw that obviously with New South Wales uh, in the Northern Rivers situation where there was confusion about who was doing what. And, and that's obviously been ironed out, which is um, a great thanks. And uh, I would appreciate you leaning um, very forwardly into the Victorian 
um, jurisdiction to assist them. Queensland is very highly developed. Unfortunately, Queensland is one of those jurisdictions that uh, experiences more than its fair share of natural disasters, and, but as a result has a very highly developed um, and professional response to, to those and a very um, nuanced understanding of the opportunities available between um, state and federal governments. I just wanted to finally um, address an issue that was raised with me by um, ALGA, by local governments more broadly, with the changes that the government's bringing in um, to um, the Emergency Response Fund. Have you changed the name? Yeah. There we go. Um, but let's just, for my sake, let's call it the Emergency Response Fund. But um, a concern, I guess, from local governments who have a long pipeline already of local projects that they need, they already know they need to deliver to mitigate against future disasters, whether they be flood levies, whether they be seawalls, um, whether they be um, you know, any hard infrastructure um, to actually protect uh, a future, for their communities from a future disaster. Um, there is a concern that this money will be set aside for mitigation projects, um, which are often hard for local governments to actually source that funding from state governments. Um, and there's a concern that they will be going towards that pipeline of infrastructure projects that already exist across the country with local governments uh, in conjunction with state governments and won't be going to social services or um, charities, etc., that it will actually be in that hard, often unsexy infrastructure projects that actually do the heavy lifting during natural disasters. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, can, just before responding to your uh, question, Senator McKenzie, um, I, I would say that your, your questions have obviously been about Victoria, but I've had similar discussions with emergency management ministers in a number of states now about repairs to infrastructure, betterment opportunities, not just Victoria. And as I say, we have approved funding for betterment in definitely New South Wales and I'm pretty sure Queensland as well. Um, but that's in relation to events that took place several months ago. So um, no, no criticism should be uh, taken of the Victorian or any state government about what's happening right now. Um, as you would know, sometimes those betterment discussions happen a little bit further along af uh, after the immediate event. Um, if I, th I think I understand your question to mean will we, will we use the, what will be the Disaster Ready Fund um, to invest in physical infrastructure? Um, and I would certainly expect that a sizeable portion would be used for that purpose. Um, but we're in the pro you may not have heard me say we're in the process of consulting on guidelines for the fund now. Um, and I've invited the shadow minister and Senator Brockman, and I'd be happy to invite you to be part of those discussions uh, about what, what we should use these funds for. Um, the examples I've always given in the public about, this, about, how, about how this fund would be used have tended to be physical infrastructure, flood levies, drainage improvements, cyclone shelters, things like that. Um, but that doesn't rule out potentially using them for social, social services and community resilience and those kind of things as well. Um, you, you would know, um, I'm sure, that there are many communities out there, including local governments, that want to prepare community resilience plans, uh, and that's a really worthwhile thing to do. So we're waiting until we have that consultation occur um, to finalise exactly how it could be spent, but I would certainly uh, expect to see a substantial portion of this used to clear the long backlog of local government mitigation projects that exist. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Final question, uh, Minister, on the back of that, because there is grave concern um, in the local government community. Can I have your guarantee that you will deeply consult with ALGA um, on where they see the best spend for this money? It is incredibly difficult for local councils to get the type of money um, they need to build these sorts of projects, and it's been expressed to me that that is a great concern from them that this bill will change um, how that money is actually spent um, on that community resilience piece instead of actually the types of infrastructure projects we need to stop the need for um, potentially. Uh, those future um, resilience projects in communities. Um, so I understand it to say 
that it is not the government's intention for 100 per cent of this, not the fund, but the, um, the funds to be used from the fund, shall we say, 100 per cent of it to be used to address the local government um, infrastructure pipeline that already exists in this country against natural disasters? Minister. Well, I think it is worth pointing out, Senator McKenzie, that had the Emergency Response Fund been used more by the former government, we may not have had quite as long a backlog of local government mitigation projects. Um, but we are where we are and we do have that backlog. Um, and uh, for starters, local governments are being consulted and heavily consulted about how these funds should be used. If ALGA haven't been consulted so far, then they are absolutely on the list uh, and, and will be consulted. Um, I should say that the discussions and, and consultation we undertook with ALGA, with state-based local government associations and individual state governments were one of the reasons we actually committed to, to create this fund, because the feedback we were getting was that we weren't seeing the level of federal investment in disaster mitigation at a local level that we needed to see. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we've decided to go down this path and set the fund up this way. So they will be certainly consulted if they haven't been already. Um, and uh, I would expect um, that we would see um, not only a substantial amount of this funding used to assist local governments build those projects that are needed. Um, uh, I, I would certainly expect to see that. We have, I've said already that, where possible, we want to see our funds matched by state, territory and local governments. I always say where possible because we recognise there are some extremely remote local governments, for, exe for example, that might only have a couple of hundred ratepayers but have a lot of uh, disaster resilience needs. And there might be exceptions in certain cases, but, um, but we want to work with local governments and we recognise they play an important role here. Uh, I might go to, I'll go to Senator Pocock and then Senator Davey. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Minister, for your earlier offer of a briefing and discussion with the Minister of Finance. I'd be delighted to take that up. Just have one question. Um, you indicated that uh, you don't support the amendment we've proposed for a, a larger drawdown annually. Um, we're suggesting $300 million. Um, so my question is, what's the purpose of having a fund last beyond a period in which we are theoretically at net zero when temperatures are rising right now and natural disasters are getting worse right now? Isn't it sensible to be spending now for preparation um, rather than holding on to the funds uh, for later? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. Uh, I've been reminded that there the legislation provides for a review of the annual disbursement level in five years' time, um, so there, there would be an opportunity to have a look at it at that point in time. Um, but um, I mean, I would like to see this fund last in perpetuity, uh, beyond 2047, beyond 2050. Um, I think that we need to always be investing more as a country in disaster resilience. Uh, and you know, should the fund end up due to very high investment returns, earning a much higher principal, it may be possible to increase the annual disbursement amount down the track. But the advice that we've received so far is that if we want to be able to continue generating roughly $200 million a year in investment returns that can be used for this purpose, then, we, then that is the limit of what we can be spending from the fund every year. If we were to go to $300 million in the way that you've proposed, that would gradually er erode the principle of the fund, which would mean that we wouldn't be generating the kind of investment returns we need every year to be able to keep going at the $200 million level, let alone $300 million. Oh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. I, uh, with your indulgence, please, Minister, I um, want to bring you back to a couple of issues that you um, raised when you were responding to Senator McKenzie. Um, the first was about the um, existing disaster recovery funding arrangements the, and the uh, response, uh, the investment in response that the government is doing. And as I said in my speech, I, I credit your government for taking the off-the-shelf arrangements that you inherited and utilising them. And, um, and having learnt from past um, experiences and, 
and it is rolling out. I just have a, a, a question that was put to me today. There was an announcement put out by yourself and the Premier for South Australia about uh, the funding for flood response um, preemptively of the flood peaks hitting South Australia, whereas some uh, local government areas in New South Wales are still waiting to find out whether they are eligible for disaster recovery payments, for example. So um, I'm interested to understand from you how uh, we can preemptively declare disaster recovery payments for South Australia while um, local government areas in New South Wales and indeed in Victoria, although they, a lot of them have been brought on board now, uh, have had to wait for the flood peaks to pass for assessments to be made. That's my first question. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Davey. The announcement we made today for uh, disaster assistance for South Australia is actually for nine local government areas that are already experiencing some level of flooding along the river, so they're not preemptive. I know the state opposition in South Australia has called for preemptive action here, and you might want to chat with them about why they think that should happen. Um, but in, in fact, the, the LGAs that are eligible for funding are already experiencing a level of flooding in South Australia. Of course, every indication is that that flooding is going to get worse. Um, whether it be in those LGAs or others, and as that, funding, as that flooding occurs, we would inevitably end up extending uh, the LGAs that receive that assistance. Um, but if, if you uh, have examples of LGAs in, in New South Wales or any other state um, where flooding is occurring and people aren't currently getting disaster assistance, I'm very happy to for, I invite you to provide that and we can take it up. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate your offer, and I will certainly take that up. And I also acknowledge the work that your office has um, provided in uh, keeping my office informed as, as your shadow. Um, the only other thing I want to question you about is, in your speech on this debate, um, you said that the Disaster Ready Fund going forward uh, that I heard matched by the states. So, have you got an intergovernmental agreement with the states already about their matching funding for mitigation processes, or is that a work in progress? Minister, um, that is a work in progress. What I, what I have said is that, where possible, we want to see that funding matched by state, territory, and local governments. Um, as I say, we're working through the guidelines at the moment about how that will work. Um, so, yeah, it's a work in progress. And thank you for prompting me, uh, Senator Davey, uh, around the incredible work of my office. Um, some of whom are in the chamber here today. Um, I think you. You have some appreciation of the amount of work that is involved in dealing with disasters on such a wide scale, and my office and my agency have been working incredibly long hours uh, on this, uh, not just in relation to the, the current floods, but really since we took office, so through July as well. So I want to put on record my gratitude to them as well. They're a great team. Senator Brockman. Um, uh, Minister, I, I just want to go back to the investment strategy. So, and, and I admit I didn't hear the early conversation. Are you proposing a, a different investment strategy for this particular fund as to the future fund, or are you just operating under the future fund's investment strategy? Minister. Um, this fund, if you like, is a subset of the future fund. And so um, whatever, uh, how, whatever investment strategy applies to the future fund, in effect, applies to this subset of the, of the future fund as well. My recollection is that there's uh, uh, more than one what I call sub-funds of the future fund, but there is one overarching investment stra strategy that applies across the board. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Minister. And, and my recollection, I admit it's for a while since I looked at this, but my recollection is the only, um, the only uh, uh, veto, the only bar within the future fund at the moment is investments in tobacco. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but are you flagging a further restriction on investments of the future fund, particularly into gas? Minister. Um, I've been informed that in addition to the ban on investments in tobacco, there's also a ban uh, for weapons 
uh, or armaments. So I'm not exactly sure how, how the, what, what particular use word is in the investment mandate. Um, but I've already answered your question ab about gas, Senator Brockman, uh, and all I can do is keep repeating what I said earlier, which is that the finance minister will work with the future fund to explore options for investments within the future fund that better align with the government's commitment to net zero by 2050. Senator, Senator Brockman. So you are considering a ban on investments in gas? Minister. No, they're your words, Senator Brockman. Um, and if you would like to twist what I'm saying, then that's a matter for you. Senator McKim. Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator Watt, would you be able to inform the Senate, and I'd, I'd understand if you needed to take this on notice, uh, the date on which the decision was made by the Future Fund to not invest into weapons manufacturers? Minister. Okay. I might need to take it on notice, uh, Senator McKimmon. It may be that I slightly misheard the earlier advice. Um, it, it sounds like the prohibition is in relation to weapons that are banned by treaties, including nuclear weapons, landmines. But uh, why don't I get you the precise details so that I don't mislead the Senate? Senator Brockman. Minister, so you are considering expanding from tobacco and nuclear weapons to gas and coal? Minister. Senator Brockman, I've answered the question probably about six times from you and about ten times from other senators and keep repeating the same advice. Um, it's a matter for you if you want to twist what I'm saying to say that we are considering certain things. What I have said is that we will consider, we're will we considering options for investments that better align with our commitment to net zero by 2050. I'm in the hands of the chamber. If there's no further um, uh, contributions, the question before the chair is that amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 1703 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Ahem. Those of that opinion say aye in relation to supporting amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 1703 moved by the Australian Greens. Aye. Right. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Aye. Uh, division required. Uh, ring, the, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that amendments one to three on sheet 1703, moved by the Australian Greens, be moved. Uh, be moved. Uh, I be agreed to. Uh, the ayes will move to the right of the chair. The, the noes to the left. I point Senator McKim Teller for the ayes and Senator Scar Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. I'll call Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move the amendment circulated in my name. Uh, you, you don't need leave, but you are moving that amendment? Yes, please. Okay. You have the call, Senator Pocock. Thank you. I... Where are we? Sorry. It's amendment uh, one on sheet 1734. Thank you, Chair. I move Amendment 1 on Sheet 1734. Okay. Um, Minister? Uh, the Government will be supporting this amendment. We thank Senator Pocock and his office for their contribution. If there are no further contributions, uh, the question before the Chair is that Amendment, that amendment uh, 1 on Sheet 1734, moved by Senator David Pocock, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I um, move the amendment in the name of Senator Hume, opposition amendment on sheet 1726. 
Uh, this amendment gives effect to the recommendation included in the Senate Legislation Committee's Coalition Senators' additional comments uh, that Division 1, Part 5 of the bill be amended to require the full advice of the Future Fund Board to be tabled with a legislative instrument that adjusts the maximum annual disbursement. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Minister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Again, we'll be supporting this amendment. We welcome the increased transparency uh, that it uh, underpins. If there are no further contributions, the question before the Chair is that Amendment 1 on Sheet 1726 are moved by the opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The, the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Now, I get my... uh, the committee has considered the Emergency Fund Amendment Disaster Ready Fund Bill 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister, I move that the report be adopted. The question before the chair is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question before the chair is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. An act to amend the Emergency Response Fund Act 2019 and for other purposes. Government Business Order for Day No. 5, Treasury Laws Amendment, Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Excellent. I think Senator Smith is uh, speaking to this, and if everybody's leaving the chamber, which is a hint, could you please leave quietly while Senator Dean Smith commences his remarks? Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. The opposition will not be supporting this bill. The coalition's opposition to this bill is not about electric vehicles. It is, in, it is about, instead, financial responsibility. It is about the sustainability of the federal budget. The Independent Parliamentary Budget Office has said this bill will cost billions of dollars over the next decade. It will cost $200 million order, over order the next four please. years alone. The Coalition does not oppose the increasing role of electric vehicles in our transport sector, but this bill fails to demonstrate value for the Australian taxpayers, and supporting electric vehicles does not make us any less committed to responsible financial stewardship. What is not clear is what this bill will deliver for emissions reduction. The government cannot say what it will deliver to the EV market. The Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries recently released data showing that the sales of pure battery EVs represented the highest market share ever recorded. We expect this trend to continue as it has in comparable advanced economies around the world. With demand increasing, it is not clear that this legislation will deliver value for money for Australian taxpayers. That certainly was not the clear evidence the Senate committee heard during its inquiry into this legislation. It's worth noting the Institute of Public Accountants have said that this measure, and I quote, will have a negligible impact on reducing Australia's carbon emission, carbon emission from the transport sector. It went on to say, and again I quote, there are other measures which would have a far greater short-term benefit to the environment than this measure. Professor Miranda Stewart, director of the tax group at the University of Melbourne Law School and fellow at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy, has said, and again I quote, given its fiscal cost, unequal benefit and uncertainty about the electric car market and the best policy to transition Australia, and that the policy, again I quote, will deliver the subsidy to a rather narrow class of employee beneficiaries and provides the largest benefit to the highest income earners. It's also worth noting that in evidence to the Senate committee, Uniting Care, a large fleet user, had this to say. As its 
as, as it is currently modelled, the bill, we're not certain it would necessarily change anything. It's worth in repeating. Uniting Care, in evidence to the Senate, Ec Senate Economics Committee, said, as it is currently modelled, the bill, we're not certain it would necessarily change anything. Further, Treasury and the Department of Climate Department of Climate Change's evidence to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee shows the impact of this policy on emissions reduction has not been quantified. Mm -hmm. This is not tax reform, as it was erroneously labelled by the Federal Treasurer. It is simply more structural spending with little or no economic return. This is typical of what we saw in the budget earlier this month. More baked-in spending for less benefit. There are more sensible alternatives to these quick knee-jerk tax changes that have been prepared without consultation, as this particular initiative has. The government could invest in practical measures to drive EV infrastructure investment and to deliver real cost of living relief for many more Australians. This is the kind of infrastructure Australia does need. Instead, the government is spending $2.2 billion on Dan Andrews, or Premier Dan Andrews, pet project the suburban rail loop. The Victorian Auditor General has said that Premier Andrews' Labor government, and I quote, did not demonstrate the economic rationale for the entire project, and they have told us that they have no plans to do so. The coalition believes that this is not a powerful demonstration of quality spending of Australian taxpayers' money. In government, by contrast, the coalition's future fuels and vehicle strategy was part of our plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Senator Smith, it being uh, 9.30, you are interrupted. The Senate stands adjourned until 9am tomorrow morning.